framed. The Sava board hung in midair, a bridge across an endless divide. On one side of this line lay the demon web pits, a vast plain of tortured rock under a purplish black sky. An enormous black spider with red eyes dominated this landscape, the goddess Loth, in one of her eight aspects. Sticky white webs stretched from her body to points near and far within her realm. They zigzagged back and forth between the spires of black rock that twisted toward the sky and filled the many jagged craters that pocked the ground. Tiny bulges pulsed through these hollow webs, creatures, mortal and otherwise, who had found their way into her realm, either through death or deliberate folly. Muffled screams and moans came from within, bleeding out into the sulfurous air. On the other side of the divide stood a forest, Ilestray's realm. A wind carried a whisper of song through tall trees, rustling branches heavy with moonstones. Half of the fruit-like orbs retained their original coloration, milky white with glints of shifting blue. The rest had darkened to a shadow black that drank in the moonlight dappling the forest. All lent a sweet perfume to the air. Under these branches stood the goddess herself, a tall, lithe figure with coal-black skin and moon-pale hair that hung to her ankles. Once she had walked proudly naked through her realm, but now she wore a loose black shirt and trousers that hid her feminine curves. A mask, black, but glinting with moonlight as her breath stirred it, hid her face from the eyes down. Ilustre's twin swords hung beside her hips, suspended by song and magic. As the goddess contemplated the Sava board, she played with an assassin's dagger, absently twirling the blade by its strangle cord. Spotting something, she stiffened. What is it, Lulf? Another of your distractions? Lulf paused in her web spinning, tore her abdomen free of the sticky strands and scurried closer. Faint wails poured from the severed strands of silk that fluttered in her wake. She lowered her head until her palps brushed the board. I see nothing amiss. Alistair flipped the dagger and caught it by the hilt. She pointed the weapon at the Saba board. There. Ah! Loth spider mouth smiled. On the board stood hundreds of thousands of playing pieces. Slaves, priestesses, wizards, and warriors stood alone or in clusters on lines that radiated from the players' respective houses. At the spot Ilustre pointed to, a spot uncomfortably near the heart of her house, the board had grown spongy. One of her priestess pieces was slowly sinking into the spot. Already it was ankle deep. Both chuckled. Looks like you're going to lose more than one piece. Other purplish red stains appeared on the board, all of them close to Ilustre's house. They bulged. Figures rose from them, priest pieces that had not been in play before. All had the faces of drow, but with bodies like blobs of hardened wax. Anger blazed red in Ilustre's eyes. Ganador, she growled, and his fanatics. The swords at her hips thrummed their displeasure. She pointed her dagger accusingly at Lolf. Leave was neither asked nor given for another to enter our game. Do not accuse me of cheating, daughter, Lolf replied. The Ancient One heeds no mistress. Ganador was old even before Eo's time. The God of Slime comes and goes as he will. I neither command nor compel him. You drove him from the abyss once before. And like a boil, he rises once more. Perhaps this time you'll lance him for me. Ilustre fumed. She had no doubt that Lolf was behind this. Even as she watched, 
several of her other pieces sank knee-deep in the spongy board. These spots of corruption, as dark as bruises on fruit, were spreading, joining together. If left unchecked, they would completely encircle Alistair's house, cutting off a large number of her pieces from the rest of the board. Lolf must have maneuvered Ganador into choosing this moment to strike. But why? Alistra scanned the Saba board, searching for the answer. Then she saw it. The move Lolf must have hoped she wouldn't spot. Alistra reached for her strongest priestess piece, the one that held the curved sword. When she saw Lolf flinch, she knew she'd made the right choice. She moved the piece forward along a path that allowed it to spiral into the very heart of Lolf's house. The move wasn't an attack on Lolf's mother piece, but it accomplished the next best thing. It blocked the mother piece completely, preventing it from moving. Unless Lolf found a way to take the priestess, her mother piece would be held out of play. Taking out the priestess piece Eilistre had just moved, however, didn't seem likely. It was in an unassailable position, protected on all sides. Alistair leaned back, satisfied. Your move. Lolf's palps twitched. Her abdomen pulsed restlessly, and the webs of her realm quivered in response. She studied the board with her unblinking eyes. At last, she rocked back on her eight legs, resting her bulbous abdomen on the ground. Perhaps luck will favor me, she said. She shifted into her drow aspect and reached for the dice. They were as they had been since Eilistre had made her throw, earlier in the game. Two octahedrons of translucent moonstone, each with a spider trapped deep within. Seven sides bore numbers. The eighth, a full moon symbol representing the numeral one. One circle was the solid white of a full moon, the other dark with only a new moon sliver of white on one side. One throw per game, Lolf said. I'll take it now. I thought you preferred to weave your own destiny. That I do, daughter, Lolf said in a silken voice. She rattled the dice in cupped hands. Alistre waited, tense and silent. If Lolf threw double ones, Alistre would be forced to sacrifice one of her pieces. She knew which one Lolf would choose, the priestess that threatened Lolf's mother piece. Yet there was little cause to worry. The odds of both dice landing circle uppermost were 63 to 1, an unlikely throw. Except that Alistre herself had accomplished it earlier in the game forcing Lolf to sacrifice her champion, Selvatarm. And now it was Lolf's turn to try. Alistre nodded at the dice Lolf rattled between her slim black hands. No tricks, she warned. If I see any web sticking to those dice, I'll demand a re-roll. Lolf arched a perfect white eyebrow. She wore the face of Danafe her chosen, the female she had consumed upon ending her silence. Her features were beautiful, the lips seductive, the cheekbones high, the eyes a delicate hue. Yet her expression was as cold as winter ice. No webs, Lolf promised. Then she threw. The dice clattered onto the board between the pieces. One die rolled to a stop immediately, full moon symbol uppermost. The second came to rest against one of Lolf's priestess pieces. The die lay edge uppermost, balanced halfway between the eight and the one. The die is cocked, Alistre said. The roll is... The spider inside it twitched. The die toppled, landing moon uppermost. The new moon... Slowly, its stain spread throughout the dye, rendering it as black as the Spider Queen's heart. 
You cheat, Alistair cried. Of course, Loth said with a smile. Alistair turned her face skyward. Ao, I require a witness, Lord of all, and your judgment. Loth has broken the rules and must forfeit the game. Ao's reply came not in words or gestures, but as a sudden knowing. The dice he revealed had always been loaded. Moonlight had tipped the balance the first time. Loth had arranged this a form of cheating, it was true, but the first result had been in Eilistre's favor. The second die roll would also stand. Ao had spoken. Eilistre stared at the empty place on the Sava board where the Spider Queen's champion had once stood. You wanted Selvatarm to die. You arranged it. Loth gave a lazy shrug. Of course. And now it's your turn to lose a piece of my choosing. No, Alistair whispered. A tear squeezed from eyes that had turned a dull yellow. It trickled down the goddess's face and was absorbed by Ferron's mask. Yes, Loth answered. Smiling cruelly, she extended a web-laced hand to point at a priestess piece. That one. I demand her sacrifice. Now. Chapter One The Month of Chess The Year of the Cauldron, 1378 D.R. Talar slipped silently into the blood-warm river and clung to a gnarled tree root, so the sluggish current wouldn't carry her away. The river slid smoothly over her skin without impediment, upon acceptance in the Velkine Velve. She had shaved her body from scalp to ankle. There would be no incriminating flashes of white to give her away. Floating on her back, she pulled a tangle of dead creeper vines across her naked body to conceal herself. She stared up at the sky, awash with the light of thousands of stars, and listened to the rustling of the night's predators and the startled screeches of their prey. The world above was a noisy place compared to the cool silence of the underdark. But even over this restlessness, she could hear the soft murmur of voices. The wild elf and the female Tlar had been sent to kill. She let go of the root. The current caught her. As she drifted toward the voices, concealed under the tangle of vines, she adjusted the grip of her fingers on her spike spiders, two walnut-sized metal throwing balls filled with poison and studded with hollow metal needles. A prick from either would numb her hands. Used against someone who hadn't built up an immunity to their poison, they would render the entire body as rigid as petrified wood. Through the veil of creeper vine, Tlar observed her target. A drow female standing on the riverbank turned sideways to the water, her attention focused on the strange-looking male who squatted at her feet. The female was about Tlar's size, but there the resemblance ended. The priestess had long, bone-white hair, wound in a tight coil and bound by a black web lace hair net at the back of her head. Black gloves embroidered in a white spiderweb design covered her hands and arms up to the elbow. She wore a thin silk robe, cinched at the waist by a belt from which hung a ceremonial dagger and whip. The whip's three snake heads twisted beside her hip, forked tongues tasting the air, alert for danger. Talar's target was a noble of House Mizrenturl. Talar knew her slightly. She had once been of that house, and had even played with Nefei on occasion when both had been girls. Games like Stalking Spider and Flay the Slave. But Tlar had given up all other allegiances the day she was shorn. From her second decade of life, she had served Loth alone. And Loth had decreed that Nefei must die. Tlar hadn't asked why. 
To have done so would have been insolence bordering on suicide. But she'd heard the whispers. That Nefei, who had only recently joined the Temple of the Black Mother, served Loth only superficially. That her true devotions lay elsewhere, with Veron, it was rumored. Though a female being accepted into the masked lord's faith was about as likely as the moon turning into a spider and scuttling away from the sky. Still, Nefe had done something to incur Loth's wrath. Something that had prompted the Valsherist to set Tlar on the hunt. And what a long chase it had been. Golly Dearth lay more than four hundred leagues from here, as the spiders crawled. What had drawn Nefei to the world above and prompted her to seek the company of such a strange-looking male? The wild elf was heavily built, almost as muscled as a drow female. He had duskier skin than most surface elves. Yellow paint ringed his eyes and his hair hung in tiny braids, each tipped with a tuft of downy white feathers. His only clothing was a bag-like loincloth that accentuated his genitals. From its string ties hung a dart pouch. He squatted before the priestess, arms resting on his knees, holding a blowpipe, and spoke in a high-pitched, melodic voice that reminded Tlar of the chirping of a cave cricket. The priestess answered him in the same language. Tlar gave a silent mental command. Her earlobe tickled as the spider-shaped black opal on her earring stirred to life. She tilted her head slightly, encouraging the spider to crawl into her ear, and waited as it spun a web that thrummed like a second eardrum in time with the voices. Then she listened. Lead me to it, the priestess said. The male shook his head. They will kill you. Strangers are not even permitted within the forest, let alone at the Yath Zalahan. The word had the cadence of high drow. Tlar's spider earring translated it as Temple of First Learning. Yet I am here, within the misty veil. Yes. The priestess leaned closer to him. And you will lead me to the temple. The male sighed. Yes, he whispered. He gave her a tortured look of equal parts anguish and anticipation, as if she had promised him something, something he would pay dearly for. Tlar drifted even with the spot where Nefei stood. In another moment or two, the current would carry her past. She exhaled and sank beneath the surface, letting the tangle of creeper vine drift on alone. She kicked, sending herself shoreward, then twisted so that her feet touched bottom. She burst out of the water hands first, and in the same motion hurled the spike spiders. One struck the male square in the forehead. He immediately stiffened and toppled sideways. The second sailed toward the priestess. Before it struck, one of Nefei's whip vipers reared. It snapped the spike spider out of the air and swallowed it. The whip viper thrashed wildly as the spike spider jammed in its throat. The other two snakeheads hissed in fury. Nefei whirled. The holy disc hanging from her neck whipped around like a pendulum. She shouted a prayer and wove her hands together, glaring at Thlar through the tangle of her fingers. Thlar felt the spell brush against her body. It pulled at her abdomen, bloating it unnaturally. It teased two strands of flesh from her left side, attempting to twist them, together with her left arm and leg, into thin insectoid legs. Her mind was yanked toward the priestess. Web-sticky fingers plucked at her thoughts, trying to weave them to Nefei's will. Tlar fought back with all her will. With a jolt, her body returned to normal. She leaped from the water. In mid-leap, she used the drowsrus within her to pass into invisibility. 
a mid-air tumble and a kick off a tree trunk placed her where the priestess wouldn't expect her. She jabbed stiffened fingers into the priestess's upper left abdomen, into the vital spot over the blood sack. Her other hand punched into Nefei's throat. The priestess gagged and buckled at the knees, unable to breathe and bleeding within. She grasped her holy symbol and tried to flutter her fingers in a silent prayer. But Tlar spun and slammed a heel into Nefei's temple. The priestess collapsed, unconscious. One of the whip's heads lashed out. Tlar leaped back. The snake's poison-filled fangs snapped at air. Tlar stepped carefully around the whip and crouched behind the priestess. She pressed hard against the neck where the blood flowed and choked off the pulse. Nefei's legs kicked once and then her body relaxed. She was dead. Loth Plumala, Tlar whispered, giving the ritual thanks for a successful kill. Jal Ultranan Za Zundas. Two of the whip's snake heads spat furiously at her. The third had stiffened. Two of the snake's spider spines had pierced its scaly skin from within and were protruding out of its body. Salar picked up the wild elf's blowpipe and used it to nudge the whip aside. Later, after she collected her gear, she would bag the whip and carry it back to Gwalidurth as proof of her kill, together with Nefei's holy symbol. She slipped the pendant off the dead female and hung it around her own neck. Then she turned her attention to the wild elf. His body remained stiff but his hands trembled and his eyelids fluttered. He was stronger than Tlar had expected. The poison would relinquish its hold on him soon. Tlar knelt beside him and placed her hands on his throat, then hesitated. She knew she should kill him now, finish the job. But curiosity gnawed at her. She yearned to know what had brought Nefei to this place. What was so valuable to the priestess up here on the surface? A temple, the wild elf had said. Instead of tightening her grip, Tlar released the wild elf's throat. She wouldn't kill him, yet. She would force him to show her this temple first. She knew this might mean uncovering secrets the Valsharis would prefer remained buried. But if that meant Tlar's death upon her return to Gollydurth, so be it. She would go to the altar willingly, certain in the knowledge she had served Loth well. She plucked the spike spider from the wild elf's forehead. She removed the pouch from his string belt, sniffed the darts. They were poisoned, and set them aside. Then she drew Nefei's spider pommel dagger and used it to cut strips from the priestess's silk robe. She used these to bind the wild elf's wrists behind his back and to hobble his ankles. She wadded more silk into his mouth and tied this makeshift gag tightly in place. Then she waited. From time to time she slapped him. When he had last flinched, she grabbed him by the hair. Blink twice if you understand me, she said. She spoke in high drow. The earring only allowed her to understand the wild elf's language, not to speak it. The wild elf glared. The whites of his eyes had a yellowish tinge, signifying a malaise deeper than just the poison, one that had been affecting his vitals for some time. She rolled him over, inspecting his body. She found what she'd been looking for on his left thigh and calf. A series of small, raised red lumps. Spider bites. She touched one of them and found it felt hot. Without healing, he would be dead by the time the sun rose. Jalar pointed at the priestess. She promised to cure you, didn't she? She touched the platinum disc that hung against her bare chest, fingers caressing the embossed spider, then pointed at the bites. 
Would you like me to cure you? The wild elf stared at her. He couldn't speak while gagged, but Talar caught the slight widening of his pupils. He understood her meaning, if not the words themselves. He believed she could cure him. He obviously hadn't dealt with the drow before now. He grunted something from behind the gag and jerked his head in a nod. She yanked him to his feet. Yath Zalahan, she ordered, giving him a rough shove. He stumbled away from the river, into the forest. She followed. They walked for some time, the wild elf forced by his hobble to take short, shuffling steps. With his arms bound behind him, he fell frequently. Tlar yanked him back to his feet each time and forced him on. The moon rose, round and full, throwing the forest into stark patches of light and shadow. Talar squinted against the glare and carefully noted the direction they traveled. She would need to find her way back, later, to the cleft near the river that led back to the Underdark. Fortunately, this region of the world above had many landmarks. They passed a number of mounded hills, each capped by a thick tangle of trees and vines, and chunks of weathered stone half buried in the ground. Talar clambered over a fallen obsidian column, carved in the shape of a person with four arms folded across their chest. Whether it was meant to represent male or female, Talar couldn't tell. There were no obvious genitalia. Moonlight threw the glyph carved into its forehead into shadow. Talar was no scholar. She couldn't read the glyph itself, but she recognized it as an archaic form of Espruar. She glanced around at the hills and realized they were the ruins of ancient structures. So perversely fertile was the world above that soil and vegetation had completely hidden the tumbled buildings under a thick, loamy skin. The wild elf halted before one of the hills and gestured by jerking his head in that direction. One of the trees sprouting from the hill had fallen leaving a hole in the mound that revealed the masonry beneath. Flar peered into the hole and saw a glint of metal, an adamantine door. Its hinges had torn free of the crumbling stone, allowing the door to fall inward. Now the metal formed a natural ramp into the darkness at the mound's hollow center. The wild elf glanced back at her, obviously reluctant to venture into it. Tlar shook her head. She snapped a kick at the back of his legs, knocking him to his knees and pointed. Inside! The wild elf glared at her, but complied. He wormed his way forward on his belly into the hole. Tlar crouched and followed cautiously, the fae's dagger in hand. She smelled damp earth and spider musk. A cobweb brushed her face, but the attack she had anticipated didn't come. Though webs were everywhere, the inside of the ancient building did not contain a spider. There was enough room inside to stand. Talar looked around. The black marble floor had a bowl-shaped depression at its center. A tracery of white veins threaded through the marble, hair-thin lines reminiscent of a tangled web. The walls were carved, three of them in glyphs she couldn't read that ran in narrow rows from ceiling to floor. The fourth wall bore a mural topped by a glyph. Tlar did recognize. Roshni, Lolth's original name. This was clearly an ancient temple. Tlar fell to one knee and turned her head, exposing her neck. Dark mother of all drow, your servant offers herself. This ritual performed, she rose and studied the mural. It depicted an enormous spider with a drow face superimposed upon its abdomen. Eight drow arms radiated from its body. Each ended in a hand with eight fingers. Lines extended from each hand, 
linking the central figure to four pairs of smaller spiders, each with a face on its abdomen. The faces of the first pair were masked, while the second pair had gaunt, almost skeletal features and hollow eyes. The third pair had faces like melted wax, sagging and distorted, while the fourth pair had mouths open and spider arms lifted, as if they were singing the larger spider's praises. The eight lesser spiders dangled from the central figure's finger webs like newly hatched spiderlings twisting in the wind. The imagery was like nothing Tlar had ever seen before. It felt old, archaic, not quite right, yet strangely compelling, and Lolth had woven a path for her to this place. Why? Using the phase dagger, she pricked each of her fingers. She pressed her fingertips against the abdomen of the large spider, leaving small dots of blood. Hear me, dark mother. Show me your will. She heard a muffled voice behind her. The wild elf trying to say something against his gag. She turned and saw a fist-sized spider descending from the ceiling on a thread of silk. The spider was night black with a red hourglass on its abdomen. As it descended, purple fairy fire blossomed in a flickering halo around its body. The wild elf threw himself to the side, rolling away from it. Lolf had made herself known. Flar strode to the wild elf and caught him by the hair, dragging him to the bowl-shaped depression. The spider halted in its descent, twisting around on its thread, just over Tlar's head. Watching. Tlar held up Nefei's dagger and kissed the blade. Then she yanked the wild elf's head back, bending his body in an arc that exposed his throat. He screamed. A wild wail that forced itself past the gag. He fought Tlar with all his strength, trying to hurl himself backward to tear free and escape. But her grip was relentless. She touched her dagger to his throat. She pricked it, making a puncture that barely broke the skin. Accept this sacrifice, dark mother, she intoned. She jabbed again a little deeper this time. His muffled wail grew shriller. He fought with the frenzy of a trapped animal, but Lars grip remained as strong as adamantine. The wild elf twisted around and kicked her legs. She neatly sidestepped the thrashing limbs. Taste his fear. Another thrust, a little deeper. Feast upon him. Blood trickled down his throat. She stabbed a fourth time. Feast upon his blood. Another thrust. Consume him. She stabbed again. Rend his soul. She thrust again, deep enough this time to pierce the windpipe. His breathing grew rapid with panic. Blood bubbled in a froth from the wound. Take him! On her eighth and final thrust, the blade plunged to the hilt. She yanked it free, releasing a hot spray of blood. She jerked his head to the side, letting blood splash the mural. Then she forced the weakly squirming sacrifice down into the depression in the floor. The wild elf died then, and blood stopped pulsing from the wound. Tlar lifted him by the ankles and waited as he bled out. The bowl-shaped depression filled with blood. She cast the corpse aside and kissed the blood-slick dagger a second time, tasting his blood. Then she watched as the purple-limbed spider resumed its descent. It plunged into the pool of blood. Fairy fire rippled upon the surface of the bright red pool, turning it the color of an old bruise. Then the blood drained away. The depression in the floor was as it had been before the sacrifice, empty and waiting. Flar heard the sound of stone grating on stone, coming from the direction of the mural. She whirled, 
dagger still in hand. Loth's abdomen was sinking into the wall. Abruptly it fell away, crashing to the floor of whatever chamber lay beyond this one, and sending up a cloud of stale dust. For several moments, there was silence. Then Tlaw heard a scrabbling sound. She braced herself, preparing for whatever the goddess was about to hurl at her. Loth was fond of testing her supplicants, and failure usually meant death. A voice, as dry as ancient leather, creaked out of the opening a female voice, pitched too low for Tlar to make out most of the words. One came through clearly, however. The name of the goddess, Loth. Spider Queen, Talar cried exultantly. I am your willing servant. Something moved in the space beyond the mural, something large and dark, forcing itself into the hole. Talar's sacrifice had opened. It squeezed through head first, then halted, its shoulders too broad to pass. A bestial face, more demon than drow, stared out at Tlar and snarled. Blood trickled out of the opening and puddled at the base of the wall. The opening suddenly widened, then contracted, forcing the demonic creature through. It landed on the ground, gasping. The demon drow was twice as large as Tlar was tall, and female with eight spider legs protruding from her chest. Her hair was a matted tangle that looked like old spider silk. Under each of her eyes was a hairy bulge from which a fang-tipped jaw curved, the points meeting above the mouth. The jaws gnashed as she lay on the floor, moaning. Flar was certain the demon drow was Loth's, though she'd never seen anything like her. What are you? she asked. One of Loth's handmaidens? The demon drow looked up. Loth's handmaiden? She croaked. The word wrenched itself from her mouth. Her wild cackle filled the hollow temple and sent a thrill down Tlar's spine. The laugh was chaos itself, uncontrolled and as dangerous as a rockfall. Then the demon drow began to sing. The song was harsh, as if the creature's throat was tight and parched. Yet the notes filled the temple with magic that plucked at the spider webs and made them vibrate like the strings of a lyre. Talar could feel it within her own body. A thrumming surge of power. The demon drow had been withered and gaunt when she fell out of the hole in the wall but she rose to her feet, plumped and visibly stronger. When her song ended, she stood solid and strong. She stared down at Tlar. What month is it? What year? Tlar met the demon drow's gaze unflinchingly. Lolf hated weakness, and so did the demons that served her. The month of chess in the year of the cauldron, 1378 by the reckoning of the world above. The demon drow shook her head. Five months. She stared down at her hands and arms, then abruptly clenched her fists. Who are you? Tlar bowed. Tlar Mizrantural of the Velkine Velv, assassin of the Temple of the Black Mother. The demon drow looked down at her, an expression of open amusement on her face. Assassin? she said. Were you sent to kill me? Indeed, no, I serve Loth. That's fortunate. The demon drow's voice dropped to a harsh whisper, and she leaned closer, leering. No mortal can kill me, though many have tried. She reared back and shouted, The void itself has no effect on me. Talar was starting to suspect that this was something much more powerful than a yakwol, some new form of demon that Loth herself had spawned. 
By what name should I address you, mistress? The demon drow was silent for several moments. Her spider jaws gnashed. At last she answered, The Lady Pentinent. It sounded like a title a powerful being might use. Are you a demon lord? The Lady Pentinent snapped out a laugh. Her eyes looked wild. More than that, much more. She waved a misshapen hand at the mural on the wall. I even have my own temple. Tlar nodded, her chest tight with excitement. Had she just played midwife to some ancient and long-forgotten deity? She kept her face expressionless, despite the surge of emotion that left her near giddy. The Spider Queen must have been watching when Nefei died, and again when Talar offered up her sacrifice. Loth was known for her caprice. It would not be unheard of for the goddess to reward a mere assassin with power that would make a priestess weep. The services of a demigod's avatar, for example. Your song, Talar said. I felt its power. Lulth's dark chorus? Bekeshel? Tlar hadn't heard the word before, but to admit that would be to show weakness. And deity spawned of chaos and blood despised the weak. She nodded and spoke boldly. I want to learn it. Teach me. The lady penitent cocked her head. For a moment, her expression seemed melancholic, almost mortal. You remind me of someone, a young female heir to the throne of House Malarn. She asked the same thing once. What happened to her? Talar asked. The lady penitent bared jaggered teeth. She died. Talar refused to be cowed. She was unworthy then. Yes, the lady penitent said in a harsh whisper. She was weak. Her lips twisted into a grimace. Talar stood firm before the Lady Pentinent. In me, you will find strength and determination. I journeyed all the way from Gollydurth to do my Valsheris' bidding. Gollydurth? The city with as many sects as an egg sack has hatchlings? Flar felt a sliver of apprehension. The deity was challenging her, testing her faith. Fortunately, Talar's commitment was strong. The Temple of the Black Mother was one of the youngest in the city. It had splintered away from the Yorn Yathrins a mere six decades ago and had yet to rise to prominence. But rise to prominence it would, especially under the tutelage of a demigod's avatar. The priestesses of the Black Mother are fervent in their devotions, she assured the Lady Pentinent. They will serve you well. The Avatar lifted an eyebrow. Will they? A dark chuckle rose from her throat like a bubble of blood. Golly, Dearth, she whispered, her eyes hungry. Talar nodded her head in a bow. What is your pleasure, Lady Pentinent? Shall I return to Golly Dearth and announce your birth? The Lady Pentinent smiled, a feral gleam in her eye. Yes, do that. Chapter 2 The Month of Flame Rule The Year of the Lost Keep, 1379 D.R. Liliana leaned on the railing of the bridge that spanned the Sargoth, watching as the three fisher folk below hauled on the line that would bring in their net. Over the rush of the underground river, she heard voices from the Cavern of Song, the faithful, singing Ilustre's praises, though most of the voices were female, a few held a low timber. Even after three and a half years, it still seemed odd to hear male voices echoing through the caverns of the promenade. A shaft of moonlight sprang into being a short distance away, 
slanting down to the river. It was as if a window had opened in the rock overhead, allowing light to shine in from the world above, light that overpowered the shimmer of fair's rest that permeated the cavern walls. The moonbeam was magical, a manifestation of Eilistre's song, a reminder that the goddess was watching over her faithful in this, her holiest of shrines. The moonbeam played briefly over the river, making the water's ripples sparkle. The fisher folk tucked the line under their arms and made the sign of the goddess, touching forefinger to forefinger and thumb to thumb to form a full moon circle. Only when the moonbeam disappeared did they resume hauling in the net. The line suddenly pulled taut, drops of water flicking from it. The three pulled harder on it, but the net didn't budge. It appeared to have snagged. Likely it had caught on the jumble of masonry on the river bottom, the remains of the original bridge. One of the fisher folk was a drow male, the second a human, female with skin so pale it seemed ghostly in the darkened cavern. The third was a muscular half-orc. He bared tusk-like teeth in a grimace and pulled as hard as he could, but the net refused to come unstuck. Jub, Liliana called down to him. If you keep pulling like that, you'll tear the net. The half-orc gave one last grunting pull and sprawled backward on top of the other two fisher folk as the tension left the line. A portion of the net rose from the river, dripping and filled with wriggling white blind fish. So did something else. Large and metal and rusted, it creaked as it moved. It looked like an enormous hook, thick as a heavy tree branch and tipped with a barbed point. The base of the hook now bent, was attached to something deeper in the river that was too large and heavy to move. Liliana belonged to the third of the temple's watches. Her patrol didn't begin until moonset, but she was a protector, entrusted with one of the temple's legendary singing swords. Anything this unusual warranted her immediate inspection, on duty or off. She strode along the river bank to the spot where the three lay worshippers stood. She nodded at them and touched the ceremonial dagger that hung against her chest. Then she sang a prayer, one that began softly, but that rose steadily to a crescendo with the power of a waterfall. At its conclusion, she chopped a hand through the air like a sword blade slicing down. Forced apart by her magic, the river split in a V-shaped trough that extended almost to its center. The depression widened, forcing the water back on either side. The remainder of the river rushed on swifter than before, compensating in speed for the narrowed space. The gap in the river revealed an enormous mass of rusted iron, large enough to fill a small room. It lay tipped sideways, on the river smoothed blocks of stone from the original bridge. It was the statue of an enormous scorpion. Its legs twisted beneath it, and one pincer claw splayed out to the side. Its barbed tail had snagged the net. The human stared at it through dark-lensed goggles that allowed her to see in the underdark. What is it? She asked. A statue from the first bridge? Liliana shook her head. She'd been assigned to the promenade little more than a year and a half ago, but she'd made it her business to learn all she could about the temple since then. In the earliest days of the promenade, when the first bridge was in ruins and the river impassable, a scorpion-shaped construct had been sighted, on occasion, in the caverns that opened onto the eastern banks of the Sargoth. When the protectors extended their patrols into the caverns to the southeast a few years ago, they'd expected to run into it. But the construct had seemingly disappeared. It had, they surmised, either wandered away into some deeper corner of Undermountain, 
or been summoned home by its maker. It's a wizard's construct, Liliana answered. Deadly when active, but this one looks frozen with rust. The human and the drow male both took a nervous step back. Jub merely grunted. He clambered down into the trough in the magic parted river and yanked on the net, trying to free it. Linefish scattered from it and landed gasping on the slick rock. Jub put a foot on one of the construct's legs and boosted himself higher, trying to unhook the net from the barbed tail. Rust flaked away under his boots. Don't get so close to it, Jub, the human called, stepping forward. Be careful, Jub laughed. It's not gonna come alive. Even if it does, there's a protector here. Liliana smiled. Three and a half years ago, at the time of the Selvatarklin attack, Jub had been reduced to a few scattered body parts by a dragolich. The priestesses had recovered what remained and resurrected him. He didn't fear anything any more. Not after he'd danced briefly with the goddess. Jub climbed higher, balanced with one foot on the scorpion's back and the other on the base of its tail. He wrenched at the net. The barbed tip bent with a loud creak. Then it snapped off, sending Jub tumbling backward in a tangle of net and wriggling blind fish. He scrambled to his feet and held up the net triumphantly. There. All it took was a little muscle and... Quiet, Liliana barked. Jub looked puzzled. What? Listen, that crackling sound. Jub cocked his head. He dropped the net and used his hands. I don't hear anything. Liliana hesitated. Had she actually heard something or was that just the rush of the river? Then a white-hot spark streaked out of the hollow stump, where the tail barb had been. She smelled the sharp tang of lightning-burned air. Jub! She shouted. Get away from the construct! It's animating! She drew her sword and motioned the other two lay worshippers back. Then she leaped down into the hollow in the river. She motioned Jub behind her and braced herself, sword raised. Ready. The singing sword sharply peeled, eager for battle. More sparks erupted from the tail. Liliana heard a scratching sound, like claws scrabbling against metal. It started inside the head of the construct and worked its way down through the abdomen. Liliana began a hymn of protection. But before she could complete the verse, a smaller construct this one made of gold and shaped like a crab, appeared at the broken end of the tail. It teetered a moment, like a plate on a blade's edge, then fell with a clang onto the riverbed. Liliana immediately changed her prayer to one that would disable the construct, but the crab was too quick for her. It scurried sideways and disappeared into the wall of suspended water. What was that? Jub asked. The scorpion's brain? Good guess, Liliana said, impressed. For someone who was only half drow, Jub was pretty bright. There, the drow male shouted. It's climbing out of the river. Liliana scrambled up the bank and looked where he was pointing. The gold crab was scuttling sideways across a cavern fronting onto the river. A cavern that opened onto a twisting maze of passages that held the ruins of a drow city. Liliana ran for the bridge. Stay there, she shouted over her shoulder. Don't try to follow. That last had been for Jub's benefit. The half-orc wasn't even armed, save for his fishing knife. If the construct was on its way back to its wizard master and Jub followed, he'd only get himself killed. Again. Right, 
he called back. No favors, got it. Liliana didn't have time to wonder what he'd meant. She hurried into the cavern on the opposite side of the bridge, past its trio of columns, and on into the maze of twisting corridors. As she ran, she cast a sending. She tried to remember the name of the young night shadow who was patrolling that cavern. She could picture him clearly in her mind. He was as light-footed as a dancer with straight-cut bangs above intense red eyes, a recent convert who worshipped the masked lady and wore a sword-shaped pendant in addition to his black mask. Suddenly the name came to her. Naxal, she shouted. Alistair's magic filled her. His mind touched hers. Alert. Questioning. A construct is coming your way. A plate-sized gold crab. Halt it, but don't destroy it. Kyle will want to examine it. His reply was tense, excited. I see it. Liliana ran on, turning right, then left, then right again. She passed the first of the tunnels that led back to the Sargoth, back to the cavern the crab had scurried into after climbing out of the river. This first tunnel followed a laborious winding path, but there was a shorter route just ahead. She turned into this second tunnel and at last reached the cavern that overlooked the river. It was empty. She stood, panting, looking around for the night shadow. Which way had he gone? Three different corridors led from this cavern to the maze of corridors beyond. She bent to inspect the floor, hoping the crab might have left a dribble of water that would show her which corridor it had entered. Naxal emerged from the third tunnel, startling her. Dark Lady, he panted. My apologies, the construct escaped. He met her eye unflinchingly as he delivered the bad news. For someone who'd left Arendellin behind only a year ago, who would still have the matron mothers and their ways fresh in his mind, Naxal was refreshingly bold. Where did you last see it? Show me. Naxal spun and pointed. This way. He led her down a corridor that dead ended and pointed at the blank wall. There. Liliana examined the stone. It was utterly smooth worn down by the oozes and slimes that had slithered through this area for centuries, prior to Kyole and her companions cleansing this place. There were no crevices into which the crab construct could have scuttled, no cracks in the floor or chimneys in the ceiling. Are you certain it didn't double back, get past you? I'm certain it ran to this spot and vanished. A portal, Liliana concluded. Naxal nodded. Must be. Liliana sang a prayer and passed her free hand over the wall. She didn't expect her hymn to reveal anything. Three and a half years ago, after the Selvatarklin attack on the promenade, these passageways had been carefully examined by priestesses more experienced in portal magic than she. The corridors had also been examined by mundane means. The promenade's lay worshippers included several rogues who were adept at detecting hidden doors and passages. Even so, the construct had to have gone somewhere. A flicker of fair's rest blossomed on the wall next to Naxal, momentarily washing his face with a faint blue glow. He was a handsome male young enough to be Liliana's son, and in his physical prime. Later, when things were quieter, she just might take him. With his permission, of course, she reminded herself. Since her redemption, she'd played by Alistair's rules. Dark Lady, Naxal asked, should I return to my post? Not yet. Liliana sheathed her sword. She wanted to check the corridor one last time, 
to gather as much information as she could before reporting to the battle mistress. And call me Liliana. She squatted to inspect the floor. As she ran her fingers across it, she felt a slight tugging. It was almost as if the floor were a lodestone, exerting a pull upon the ring she wore. Yet neither ring should have been drawn to a lodestone. Her shield ring was platinum, and the one next to it, the ring that allowed her to levitate, was gold, just like the construct. The pull suddenly intensified. Her hand jerked downward and touched the floor. She saw Naxal stagger sideways and felt her stomach lurch. A glow surrounded them. A golden circle in the floor centered on the spot where Liliana crouched. Mother's blood, Liliana swore. She leaped to her feet and drew her sword. They were no longer in the corridor. The portal had activated, sending them somewhere else. A roughly oval cavern about a hundred paces wide, with a ceiling so low, Liliana could have reached up and touched it. A multitude of hair-thin crevices crisscrossed the floor, walls, and ceiling, giving them the appearance of old, cracked pottery. The stone glistened slightly in spots, as if wet, probably condensation. It felt hot and moist in here. Liliana could see three exits, all of them natural tunnels. Two led off into darkness. From the third came a dull red glow. Warmth flowed out of it, stirring the air and filling the cavern with the smell of molten stone. Defensive stance, Liliana signed with her free hand. Naxal swiftly repositioned himself, his back to hers. He held his magical dagger by the point, ready for a throw. She heard him whisper a prayer of protection. Each scanned the area, their free hand held out where the other could see it in peripheral vision. Liliana's sword hummed softly, anticipating danger. No threats spotted, Naxal signed. No immediate threats, Liliana agreed. Nor was there any sign of the construct. There were, however, half a dozen large jumbles of iron that might once have been other constructs, lying in rusting heaps on the floor. Do you know this place? Naxal asked. No. The gold circle started to fade. Liliana squatted and touched her ring to the floor. Nothing happened. The golden glow disappeared. It looked as though they weren't getting out of here via the portal. Fortunately, they had another way out. A prayer that would return them to the spot on the surface that Liliana had designated as her sanctuary. But she didn't want to invoke that magic yet. She wanted to learn more about where the portal had sent them. She decided to send a brief message to the battle mistress before moving out. Rila, she sent. There's a new portal in a dead end between three pillars and Dragon Throne Cavern. I accidentally activated it. Can you scry me? She waited. No reply came. The portal had either sent them to another plane, unlikely, this certainly felt like part of the Underdark, or this place was somehow warded to prevent magical communication. Something dripped from the ceiling onto her shoulder. A moment later, she felt dampness as it soaked through her chainmail, into the padded tunic she wore underneath. Then a burning as it reached her skin. Acid. She heard Naxal suck air through clenched teeth. A drop must have struck him as well. She sprang away from the spot, and Naxal did likewise. They looked up. Acid-slicked strands of what looked like gray mucus were oozing from one of the cracks in the ceiling, directly over the spot where they'd just been standing. The strands twitched slightly, like worms, 
elongating even as Liliana watched. Grey ooze, she signed. A quick glance around confirmed her fear. The stuff was weeping from several other spots in the ceiling. In some places, acid fell in a steady dribble. In others, it dripped. A drop of it landed on her hand, stinging it. She pointed at one of the darkened tunnels. Check it, see if it's safe. Order given, she sprinted for the other dark tunnel and peered inside. The cracks in its floor, walls, and ceiling extended as far as she could see. Ooze seeped through the ceiling here, too. Naxal turned away from his tunnel. No good! More ooze! Leliana hesitated. She glanced at the third exit. Was it wishful thinking, or was the floor in front of it slightly less slick? She flicked a hand. That way! If they didn't find a safe spot soon, she'd be forced to teleport them out of here. She had to run nearly doubled over to avoid the strands of ooze hanging from the ceiling. Acid splattered her back, dribbled in between the links in her mail, and burned its way to her skin. Other drops struck the back of her head. Naxal slipped on the acid-slick floor, nearly falling. Liliana grabbed his arm and dragged him into the tunnel. A few paces in, the acid dribble stopped, though the stone here was also cracked. The gray ooze didn't seem to like the dry heat. The farther up the tunnel they ran, the drier the floor got. At last, Liliana called a halt. She gritted her teeth at the hot flares of pain in her back, shoulders, scalp, and hands. It was as if a dozen wasps were stinging her all at once, and those had just been drips. Once that ooze forced its way fully through the cracks in the cavern ceiling, there would be no going back. Naxal's free hand strayed to his shoulder, fingers gingerly touching an acid burn in his leather armor. He winced. Have you been taught the healer's prayer? Liliana asked softly. Naxal nodded. A lesser version of it. Use it. Together they sang their prayers, softly, their voices mere whispers in the darkness. When they were done, Naxal sighed deeply and flexed his shoulder, stretching the healed skin. What are the battle mistress's orders? Rila didn't answer my sending. Looks like we're on our own. Naxo glanced back the way they'd come. I think I know where we are. Oh? Does the name Trobriand mean anything to you? Liliana shook her head. He was an apprentice of Halister, the wizard who used magic to carve out much of Undermountain. Him I've heard of. Liliana said in a wry voice. Among the drow, Halister was a name often followed by an oath. Centuries ago, long before Kyole had founded the promenade, the mad mage and his followers had waged war upon the drow of Undermountain, slaughtering hundreds, if not thousands. Halister had harassed the drow with his spells through the long century since. When the mad mage had died four years ago, Kyole had led the priestesses of the promenade in a song of rejoicing. I've been thinking about the construct we followed here, Naxo continued. Trobriand was known as the Metal Mage. He was famous for his constructs. The portal may have deposited us in one of his sanctums. That would explain why the crab made for it. How do you know so much about ancient wizards? Naxal's eyes crinkled. My father was a sorcerer, an alchemist. I was training as his apprentice before I joined the masked lady's dance. Leliana's eyebrows rose. Naxal was a boy of hidden talents. Do you know any spells? Only a couple of cantrips and not terribly useful ones. 
I can inscribe objects with an indelible house glyph and... His fingers twitched, and his voice suddenly shifted to a point behind her. I can shift sounds. Not bad, Liliana said. So why did you give up wizardry? His expression flattened. I got tired of the beatings. A silent understanding passed between them. Liliana had been raised in Menzo Berenson, the daughter of a noble house. She too had learned early on that prestige and punishment walked hand in hand. Her back was clear now, but for years she'd worn the scars of her mother's lash. When she'd borne a daughter of her own, Liliana vowed to give her a better life. She wrenched her mind back to the present. Expensive to build constructs out of gold, she commented. Practical, Naxal countered. Gold resists acid. That's one of the ways you can distinguish it from the coarser metals. The only thing that will dissolve it is aqua regia. Trobriand obviously intended that the crab survive the oozes once it had used the portal. Liliana glanced up the tunnel to the dull red glow. Let's see what lies ahead, she decided. I'll lead. You watch my back. Keep close in case I need to sing us out of here. They made their way down the tunnel. Here and there, Liliana could see a momentary flicker of the fair's rest that had spread far and wide when the crones worked their fell magic with the void stone. Its light was drowned out, however, by the red glow from up ahead. The farther they went, the brighter the glow became. The air grew hotter and drier. Liliana breathed wearily, alert for the first signs of lightheadedness. If there was lava ahead, as she suspected, the air in the tunnel could prove poisonous. She glanced back at Naxal and saw sweat beating his brow and trickling down his temples. His hair and clothes were damp, as were hers. They came to a place where the passage bent sharply. Liliana motioned for Naxal to halt and peered around the corner. The tunnel beyond it was bisected by a deep crevice in the floor that glowed with an eye-searing red light. Heat made the air above the crevice shimmer. Liliana sniffed and caught the whiff of sulfur she'd been expecting. Somewhere deep in that crack, lava flowed. The gap was too wide to jump. She decided they'd risked enough for one day. Time to get out of here and report what they'd discovered. Touch my back, she whispered to Naxal. We're leaving. He did so, and she sang a hymn of return. But the sudden lurch of slipping sideways through the dimensions didn't come. The prayer should have conveyed them both to the Misty Forest Shrine, her designated sanctuary. It didn't. Naxal waited. His eyes held a silent question. Liliana shook her head. Trobriand must have warded his sanctum against teleportation. I'll try something else. Keep watch. She stepped away from Naxal, sheathed her sword, and hummed a wordless prayer. With one hand touching her holy symbol, she turned slowly. Which way? she asked silently. Which way is the promenade? She concentrated on its most prominent feature, the statue of Ilustre that had been erected at the site of Kyle's victory over Ganador. The magic took hold, halting her. Her extended hand jerked straight up. By all that dances, she exclaimed, the promenade is directly above us. Liliana nodded to herself. That explained how the tunnel ahead had cracked open deep enough to reach lava. Both it and the other, smaller cracks, must have resulted from the powerful earthquake that had rocked Under Mountain four years ago, a few months before the Selvatarkland attack on the promenade. 
If Eilistray's statue was above this spot, the rubble-filled shaft leading to the pit of Ganador would be somewhere nearby. It, too, would have been affected by the earthquake. The walls of the shaft must have cracked open wide enough for the gray ooze to slither out. Liliana whispered her thanks to Eilistray for setting her feet on this dance. She and Naxal had gathered important information this day, information the High Priestess would want to hear. The oozes Kyole and her companions had driven from Undermountain and sealed in the pit centuries ago were once again on the loose. Liliana lowered her hand. The good news was that she and Naxal were still somewhere within Undermountain. Assuming this cavern system wasn't completely isolated, a dead end, they might yet be able to find their way back to the promenade. She prayed again. I'll astray, she whispered. Show me the path. Lead me back to the promenade. She felt a sense of rightness coming from the direction they'd been headed, a sense of wrongness behind her. She led Naxal around the corner, closer to the lava-filled crack. The way back lies on the other side of that gap. Can you climb past it? Naxal moved ahead to inspect the wall. He whispered a prayer that would protect him from the hot stone and jammed his fingers into a crack in the wall. He braced his foot on a slight ledge and eased himself up. The ledge immediately crumbled and his fingers slipped out. He moved to a second spot and tried again, but with the same result. He turned and shook his head. We can't climb past it. The stone isn't strong enough. Liliana held up her hand and indicated her gold ring. We'll use levitation magic to get across. I'll go first, then throw my ring to you. He nodded. Liliana sang a hymn that would shield her from the worst of the heat. She ran forward and activated the ring just before reaching the crevice. She drifted over the gap, supported by the ring's magic. Heat rose in waves enveloping her body. She glanced down and saw glowing lava deep in the crevice. A puddle of something golden floated atop it. She thrust a hand against the ceiling, halting herself, and peered down through the shimmering heat waves. She'd been right. That was the construct. Before she could push herself onward, a wave of dizziness swept over her. It was as if she'd just spun wildly in place. But I didn't, she said aloud. I was the glow, red lava, gas, flow, dizzy down. She drifted downward, away from the ceiling. Naxal flicked a sign in silent speech. Liliana couldn't make sense of it. Liliana, he shouted aloud. Your sword! Liliana frowned. Why was the lip of the crevice rising up to hide Naxal, and why was he shouting about swords? There was nothing here to fight. She shook her head violently, trying to clear it. The sudden movement spun her in place, which only made her dizzier. Up float dizzy, I think I'm... The ring responded to her command, lifting her out of the crevice until her head and shoulders pressed against the ceiling. Despite her protective spell, the stone felt hot. She shoved herself away and drifted down again. No, that wasn't right either. She tried to catch the lip of the crevice, but couldn't reach it. She caught a glimpse of gold on her finger. Oh, yes, her ring. Levitate up. The words, however, came out all wrong. Floating chimney down. She descended. Down, no, up. She rose. Her head cracked the ceiling. Mistress, Naxal shouted. Naxal sounded. What was the word? Worried, Liliana shouted, laughing with delight at having gotten the word correct. It was hot, 
bobbing around above the crevice. Really hot. Sweat trickled down her face. A tiny corner of her mind shouted that she should be doing something before her protective spell ran out. That thought was lost in the swirl of confusion that jumbled her thoughts like... Like... Naxal ran forward to the edge of the crevice and leaned over it, one hand extended. Did he want her to give him something? He made urgent gestures that reminded her of Jub pulling on his net. Hand over hand over hand over hand, Liliana sang. She knew she was babbling, knew she should sing a prayer or something. A bubble of glowing lava rose in the crevice. It oozed upward until it was no more than a pace below her boots. Ooze. The word was important. Liliana gritted her teeth and fought the confusion that bubbled through her mind. She managed to coordinate her motions enough to thrust out a hand, and she felt Naxal grasp it. He pulled her up and out, tried and failed to force her feet to the floor then gave up and fumbled at her hand. What was he doing? Trying to steal her ring? The lava reached the top of the crevice and started to flow out of it, onto the floor. We've got to hurry, he said in an urgent voice. Go back the way we came. The lava's rising. He forced her hand around the hilt of her sword and yanked the weapon from its scabbard. The sword peeled. The magical confusion fell away. That's not lava, Leliana shouted as realization dawned. It's an ooze filled with molten fire and capable of enchantments. She negated the ring's magic and found her feet. She was furious with herself. If she'd been holding her singing sword when she crossed the crevice, this never would have happened. How do we fight it? Naxal asked. Let me handle it. Keep behind me. As Naxal danced back, the ooze cast an enchantment. Leliana felt it as a wave of exhaustion. Just as her eyes closed, the singing sword peeled loud and long, jolting her awake. She heard a sigh behind her, then a thump. Naxal collapsing on the floor. She glanced back, praying he was still alive. There was no time to check, however. The ooze surged out of the crevice in slow, rippling waves. It was enormous, twice as wide as Liliana was tall. It moved across the floor like molten iron, folding upon itself in wrinkles as it flowed forward. Its skin was a thick, clear membrane, cracked in places. Liquid fire dribbled from the cracks. She lifted her sword. You don't frighten me, she said aloud. The ooze was a mindless thing and wouldn't understand, but saying it helped steady her. The ooze bulged, forming an appendage. Liliana chanted a prayer and released her sword. Born by magic, it flew at the ooze and slashed at the expanding bulge. Magical steel met glowing fire and sliced neatly through it. The creature blazed like a bellows-driven fire as a portion of its limb fell away. Molten fire flowed from the wound, puddling on the cavern floor. Even protected by her spell, Liliana felt its heat as her chainmail warmed to an almost unbearable temperature. Sweat trickled down her body in rivulets and into her eyes. Her singing sword glowed with heat. She was glad she wasn't holding it. The creature flicked its severed appendage. Tiny drops of molten fire flew through the air, splattering Liliana. She gasped as they stung her arms and face. Like the acid burns, these she could heal with Ilustre's blessing. Eventually. For now, she'd have to ignore the pain as best she could. Then the ooze bulged in a second attack. Liliana ducked just in time. Her sword parried, lopping off the second appendage, but not quickly enough. It slapped against Naxal's prone form, even as her sword severed it. 
Naxal awoke, screaming. Liliana swore. She pressed home the fight, menacing the ooze with her sword. As it drew back, she glanced anxiously at the screaming Naxal. What she saw made her shudder. Splatters of molten rock streaked his chest where the ooze had struck him and were burning through his leather armor. Despite his magical protection, the molten rock had already charred deep ruts in the armor and was burning down into his skin. Hang on, Naxal, she cried. Just a few moments more. Liliana thrust at the ooze with her sword, worrying the creature and forcing it back to the crevice. Molten fire dribbled from each puncture. Her Pawafwi had been smoldering since the droplets of lava had struck it. Now the fabric ignited. Cursing, she slapped out the tiny flames. Then she smiled as an idea struck her. Keeping the ooze at a distance with her animated sword, she yanked off her smoldering Pawafwi. She rushed the ooze, gritting out a prayer and hurled the Pawafwi onto it. As the garment landed on the ooze and burst into flame, she completed her spell. I, Lestray, aid me. Lend these flames the moon's chill light. The flames dancing across the burning Pawafwi turned from fire red to ice blue. The bitterly cold flames burned into the creature, punching a cold, dark hole in it. The ooze shrank back on itself and withdrew into the crevice. The blue flames flickered out. The ooze rallied, rising again. This time Liliana shucked off her chain mail and cast it aside. She yanked her padded tunic over her head, hurled it onto the ooze and repeated her prayer. Cracks radiated outward across the body of the ooze as the ice flames burned into it. The ooze tried to extend an appendage, but its skin cracked apart, and the limb fell to the floor. It shattered, with the chunks dulling like nearly extinguished coals. One more time, that would finish it. Naxal was no longer screaming. Liliana yanked off her shirt and hurled it onto the ooze. Eyeless stray. She shouted as her hand swept down for the third time. The flames burning the shirt turned from red to blue, and the ooze roared in anguish. Then it exploded. Chunks of cooling ooze flew off in all directions. One slammed into Leliana's shoulder, knocking her off her feet. Pain flared in her elbows as she struck the floor. She rolled over as the smell of scorched hair filled her nostrils. And something more. Burning flesh. Naxal groaned, low and deep. She scrambled to his side. He lay face down. Liliana rolled him over, tore open his armor, and examined his chest. The burns there were so deep, his flesh had been charred black. He'd need restorative magic to heal them. She tore his smoldering mask from his face and cast it aside. As she did this, she felt heat radiating from his face. It seemed to be flowing out of his nostrils and mouth. Something was happening to him. Something odd. Even those parts of his body that hadn't been directly struck by the creature were affected. Something pulsed under his skin leaving tiny blisters that formed a tracery across his skin, like veins. Those were his veins. They were glowing, hot as fire. Terrified, Liliana began a healing prayer. Before she could finish it, Naxal's veins erupted. Liquid fire oozed from the furrows, charring the surrounding flesh. More liquid fire oozed from his nostrils. A faint sizzling noise filled the air. Naxal's eyes, cooking in their sockets. I, Lestray, aid him! Liliana cried. 
one hand on Naxal's forehead, the other extended to the place where the moon would be in the realms above. Twined light and shadow swept down into the cavern, into Liliana, and on into Naxal. Alistair's healing energy played about the body of the grievously wounded night shadow like a sparkle of ice in the moonlight, halting the burning within. As his body cooled, his veins lost their fiery glow. The trickles of liquid fire coming from his nostrils crusted over and fell away, and the burns in his body closed over. He was left, however, with terrible scars and eyes that could no longer see. That was something Liliana couldn't repair here. It would have to wait until they got back to the temple. Thank you, he gasped. Don't thank me, Liliana told him, wishing she could have intervened sooner, before he'd lost his eyes. It's Eilistre who saved your life. She touched his arm. Can you stand? I think so. She helped him to his feet. He was remarkably steady, considering what he'd just been through. He moved with a certainty that suggested he'd been trained in blind fighting. He cocked his head, listening as Liliana retrieved her singing sword. It lay next to the ooze's crusted remains. Even through the leather-wrapped hilt, the weapon felt hot. She noted the warp the creature's heat had left in the blade. It would no longer fit in her scabbard. What now? Naxal asked. We press on, Liliana told him. She described for him what he couldn't see. The ooze retreated back into the crevice before it died, and it formed a natural bridge across the gap. As soon as it's cool enough, we can cross. He nodded and touched his face. My mask? Burned. His hand fell away. He turned his head, but she saw his stricken look just the same. She took his hand and placed it on her shoulder. We need to get moving, she said softly. Get back to the promenade and report what we've seen down here. The oozes, Naxal said grimly. Gonadars, minions, they're escaping from the pit. Leliana shuddered. Let's pray the Ancient One isn't next. Chapter 3 Cavatina made her way through the hall of the priestesses, a cavern filled with a soft blue-white light emanating from lichens on its ceiling and walls. Glow balls, off-white hemispheres that waxed and waned with the moon's cycles, studded the buildings. The combined illumination made the cavern as bright as a moonlit night in the world above. The buildings she passed, originally part of a netherese outpost in the Underdark, had lain buried in rubble for seventeen centuries before Kyole and her companions excavated them and made them part of the promenade. Constructed in terraced layers like a series of blocks stacked largest to smallest, the buildings were four stories high. Much of their original decoration had been smashed when the magic supporting the ceiling had dissipated at the time of Netheril's fall. But here and there, Cavatina saw the grooves of what had once been a fluted column, or fragments of the friezes that had once adorned every wall. Nearly two and a half decades of labor by Eilistre's faithful had restored the buildings to a usable state, here and elsewhere in the promenade. Now each bore the goddess's symbol above its front door, a silver long sword, set point upright against the circle of a full moon, hallowed with streaks of white. Priestesses and lay worshippers alike strode the streets, the former on their way to services in the Cavern of Song, the latter hurrying about their errands. Most of the priestesses were drow, 
only a handful were drawn from the elven races of the world above. But the lay worshippers came from a multitude of races. Many had been rescued from the holds of slave ships, or from the flesh markets of Skullport. Each had turned in gratitude to the Dark Maiden's faith. The other priestesses saluted Cavatina, while the lay worshippers bowed low. Odd whispers followed in her wake. Cavatina spotted a familiar face, Meryl, Kyole's halfling cook. The little female with the mop of tangled gray hair padded along on bare feet to the high priestess's house, a basket tucked under one arm. Cavatina altered course so their paths would cross. Meryl's wrinkled face creased in a grin as she spotted the dark song knight. Hello, Cavatina, it's been a while. Cavatina arched an eyebrow. Cavatina? she echoed. Not most esteemed dark song knight, slayer of Selvatarm, she continued in a teasing voice. Meryl laughed and waved a hand. Yes, yes, that too. It's just hard to remember sometimes. I still see when I look at you. The babe gentle danced within her arms, though she craned her neck, looking up. You get taller and skinnier each time I see you. You're thin as a sword blade. You really should eat more. Cavatina smiled. Though the halfling was a mere lay worshipper, Meryl never, ever used formal titles. She even addressed Lady Kyole by her first name. So what brings you to the promenade? Meryl continued. Slain any demons lately? How are things in the Chondlewood? Are the elves still prevailing? Cavatina held up her hands, as if overwhelmed by the barrage of questions. Meryl seldom asked only one. Her tongue ran faster than her feet, more often than not. Rila's summons, three yaklols, good and yes. Meryl's head bobbed in a series of nods. She shifted her basket, and Cavatina heard metal clink inside it. Don't tell me you're stealing the silverware again, Cavatina teased. The jibe wouldn't sting Meryl, who prided herself on her stout-hearted loyalty. She'd been Kyole's cook for decades and personally tasted every ingredient for poison before using it. A simple prayer of detection would have accomplished the same result, but Meryl insisted on putting her life on the line. If poison took her, she said, she'd go to Alistair's realm happy and content, and with a full stomach. Meryl feigned shock. Me? She blurted indignantly. I never, ever would contemplate such a thing. Not in a hundred lifetimes, a thousand. Yes, it's true, that was the gleam of silver you saw. She cracked the lid of the basket, giving Cavatina a peek. But I'm taking these vials from the Hall of Healing to the High House, as you could plainly have seen from the direction I was headed. With a flourish, she snapped the lid shut. Now Cavatina was supposed to apologize. That was the way the game was played. But her brief glimpse inside the basket puzzled her. Those vials were used to hold one thing only. Is that holy water? Meryl nodded. Cavatina should have cracked another joke. To ask, perhaps, if Meryl's kitchen was infested with undead mice but her customary bluntness kicked in at last. What does a cook need with holy water? There for Kyle lay. She told me to make sure there's an ample supply on hand when she gets back from her inspection tour of the shrines. She's used up all she had. Why doesn't she bless her own water? I've no idea, but I'd recommend against asking her. kyle has been awfully short-tempered lately. A ten day ago, she got angry with Horaldin. I could hear her yelling at him, even from the kitchen. She told him to follow her orders or else. 
and yesterday she shouted at me for scalding the soup. The halfling made a face. I never scald my soup. That's not like her. No, Merrill shrugged. She's got a lot on her mind, I suppose. The halfling crooked a finger, beckoning Cavatina closer. Her voice dropped to a husky whisper. Yesterday, just before Kyle left, someone turned a blind fish into a golden crab. According to what I heard, the protector who set out after it was eaten by a scorpion. It's all nonsense, of course. That statue was so rusted it couldn't possibly have swallowed anyone. And Liliana will show up eventually. But worrisome nonsense just the same. I see. It was no use asking Merrill to clarify this garbled tale. The halfling tended to jumble everything together and was forever seasoning the resulting hash with a hefty dash of imagination. Rila would clarify whatever Merrill was trying to tell her. She would also shed light, no doubt, on why the high priestess didn't bless her own water, if indeed Merrill had gotten that part right. I'd best be on my way. Cavatina said. The battle mistress is expecting me. Merrill nodded. She shifted the basket into the crook of her arm. I'll estray's blessings, she said, touching thumbs and forefingers. Dance in moonlight and joyous song. Cavatina touched her breastplate, her fingers resting lightly on its embossed moon and sword. Joyous song. She watched as the cook entered a side door and disappeared into the high priestess's house, then sighed and shook her head. She was just turning to go when the door opened again. Merrill, leaving, the basket still under her arm. Something about the way the halfling exited struck Cavatina as odd, though it took a moment to figure out what it was. Merrill had stepped outside, glanced around, and drawn back slightly, as if fearful. Cavatina glanced behind herself. Whatever had startled Merrill must have been right behind her, judging by the timing of the reaction. Yet Cavatina saw nothing amiss. She walked to the cook. What is it, Merrill? Is something wrong? Merrill didn't reply. Without so much as a glance in Cavatina's direction, she hurried away. Cavatina followed. Merrill? The halfling sped up. Merrill! Cavatina shouted. Wait, I just want to ask you something. Merrill broke into a run. Several paces behind, Cavatina ran after the halfling, her sense of unease strong. Merrill had been holding the basket a moment ago. Now it had vanished. Merrill ran with a peculiar lopping gait, a jiggly step wobble step. Cavatina sang a prayer. She expected to uncover a spy, a denizen of Skullport, or, at worst, one of Loth's priestesses. What her spell revealed shocked her. The creature cloaking itself in Merrill's image was squat and hairless, with rubbery gray skin, beady red eyes above a drool-slack mouth, and arms so long the knuckles dragged on the ground. A dretch, a demonic creature of the abyss, and it had come from Kyule's residence. The dretch bolted into the corridor leading to the Hall of Healing. Cavatina drew her sword and sprinted in after it. Stop that halfling, she shouted. That's not Merrill, it's a demon. Her sword peeled out its own alarm. Other priestesses took up the chase, sprinting into the tunnel behind Cavatina. One blew her hunting horn. The blare filled the corridor, drowning out the hymn that wafted down a side tunnel from the Cavern of Song. And circle it, Cavatina shouted over her shoulder. 
double back through the cavern of song and upriver through the northern tunnel. Box it in. Priestesses and lay worshippers scrambled to obey. Cavatina ran on, singing a sending. As the battle mistress's mind touched hers, Cavatina shouted a warning to Rila. Not in words. She needed her breath for running. But with a mental shout. A dretch disguised as Meryl is heading for the empty arches. It came from the high house. Search it for demons. See if Meryl lives. Rila's reply came a heartbeat after her oath. Wrath and blood, I'll send protectors to the high house and meet you at the hall of empty arches. Cavatina rounded a corner. There should have been a guard just ahead to ensure unwanted visitors to the hall of empty arches didn't wander into the priestess's quarters. Yet there was no guard in sight. She caught a whiff of something that smelled like rotten eggs and saw a cloud of yellow-tinged fog in the room beyond. The guard, an ordinary foot soldier, armed with mace and shield, came staggering out of it, retching. Dark lady, she gasped. I couldn't stop. Whatever she'd been trying to say was lost as she doubled over and vomited. One hand flailed behind her. That way, she signed. Cavatina shouted a song of dispelling that tore the noxious fog to shreds. She ran into the hall, alert for the slightest sound. She could see only a fraction of the room. Floor-to-ceiling stone partitions lined up down the middle of the chamber like pews in a temple, blocked most of it from sight. She heard the peal of an unsheathed singing sword from the far side of the room followed by the battle mistress's shout. Cavatina, I'm in position, northeast corner. Southwest corner, Cavatina shouted back. Priestesses crowded behind her. At least one was a protector, and Cavatina could hear the battle song of a singing sword harmonizing with her own weapon. It turned out to be Chisra. She greeted Cavatina with a terse nod. Cavatina ordered Chisra and four other priestesses into the room. They formed up, weapons ready. Then at her signal strode from one side of the room to the other, each moving between two partition walls. With their swords sweeping the air in front of them, they sang prayers that would strip the dretch of any concealments. When they reached the far side of the hall, they sang out in unison. All clear! Cavatina, Rila called from the far corner of the room. Could the dretch have turned aside and entered the cavern of song? No, Cavatina shouted back. I sang a true seeing. It definitely came this way. The gray-faced guard, at last in control of her stomach, nodded in rueful agreement. Cavatina ordered the nearest priestess to stand guard, in case the dretch doubled back. Then she hurried to the far corner of the room. The battle mistress stood at the room's second exit, a distant look in her pale gray eyes, her lips moving soundlessly. She was obviously listening and replying to a report from a searcher elsewhere in the temple. Rila was large, even for a female, her broad shoulders and lighter skin were a legacy of her human father. She was an unusual choice for battle mistress, but these were unusual times. Although she carried her sword, she was without belt or scabbard, and unarmored. She obviously hadn't had time to don her chainmail before responding to Cavatina's urgent sending. Rila nodded in agreement with whatever she'd just heard, then turned to Cavatina. There's no sign of the dretch in the Hall of Healing, nor in the Cavern of Song. It doesn't seem to have made it past this point. Another of the portals must have become active. The real question is how it got into the promenade in the first place, Cavatina said. 
How did it get past our wards? Rila stared at Cavatina. You're the expert in hunting demons. You tell me. Cavatina had a bad feeling about this. The dretch's sudden appearance was all too reminiscent of the Selvatartlin onslaught of three and a half years ago, and their trick of using ensorcelled gems to jump to the promenade. She wondered if another attack were imminent. She glanced at the closest partition wall. Like the others, it was carved in low relief with the likeness of two archways. Decorative arches only, since the middle of each was solid stone. There were eight in total. Each had once been a portal. But the magic that had sustained them had faltered centuries ago, when Netherel fell. Only one of the arches was still active, and then sporadically. Once it sputtered to life, it might remain open for the space of a heartbeat, or for more than a month. It led to the hall of empty arches from a deeper level of Undermountain that was once part of a dwarven mithral mine, predating even Netheril. The occasional adventurer blundered through this portal, usually badly battered and in need of healing by the time it opened. Kyole had thus decreed that it not be sealed. Those who agreed to abide by the rules of song and sword were offered healing in the nearby hall. Those who didn't were either blindfolded and removed from the promenade, or, if they proved hostile, were put to the sword. Rila motioned for Cavatina to follow, then sang a hymn. She walked slowly through the room, her free hand briefly passing across the front of each of the arches. Dead. Nothing. Still dead. Cavatina followed, sword at the ready. Rila passed her hand across the face of the portal that joined the ancient mine tunnel to the hall of empty arches. She shook her head. It's not active at the moment. One arch remained to be checked, the one next to it. Rila halted in front of this arch, holding her palm above it for several moments, concentrating. Her eyebrows rose. This one's active, in one direction only, away from here. Cavatina leaned forward expectantly. Her sword hummed. A moment more, and the hunt would resume. Where does it lead? Nowhere and everywhere. Rila lowered her hand. My prayer revealed a maze of tunnels that were constantly shifting, opening to infinity, then closing in again. I think it may lead to the deep caverns. She stared at the blank stone within the arch. If the dretch went through here, it will be impossible to track. I can do it, Cavatina assured her. The dretch must be captured and questioned. We need to learn who summoned it and what they hoped to accomplish. Rila blocked her way. Not so fast. It could take you a lifetime to track it down in there, and we need you here. I can find my way back from any... You're staying here in the promenade. That's an order. Cavatina was about to protest, but something about the look in Rila's eyes halted her. The battle mistress nodded at the arch. The dretch didn't get in this way. That's a one-way portal. She turned. How else might it have gotten into the promenade? Cavatina fumed, but answered the question. Dretches are weak. This one wouldn't have been able to breach the promenade's defenses on its own. The dretch must have been summoned here, summoned by someone already inside the promenade. Rila gave a tight nod. She'd already realized this much. Or perhaps it came here by means of a wish spell, Cavatina concluded. 
still thinking of the Selvatarklin, who had carried teleportation gems into the promenade nearly four years ago. Rila's expression was grave. I've ordered a full sweep of the temple from the high house on down. Remind them to report any suspicious-looking gems. Already done. Have the protectors located Meryl yet? Yes, praise Eilistre. She's unharmed. Cavatina sheathed her sword. Since you won't let me pursue the dretch, you might as well tell me why you summoned me to the promenade. Did you have a premonition that a demon would show up here? Yes, I did. Rila's sending came a heartbeat later. I need to talk to you about Lady Kyole. That's why I sent for you. Something's wrong with her. Cavatina felt her eyes widen slightly. She opened her mouth to ask a question and shut it again. She suddenly realized the dretch might be a symptom of a larger problem. It should have been impossible for it to enter the high house. Kyole's personal wards should have banished any creature of the abyss back to the place it came from the instant it tried to enter her residence, especially a minor demon like a dretch. If something was interfering with Kyole's ability to ward herself from a comparatively weak foe, Rila had every right to be worried. Kavatina nodded slightly, her eyes on the other priestesses. Rila obviously hadn't shared her concerns with them. Is something eclipsing Lady Kyole's magic? Is that why the dretch... Later. In private. Rila turned to Chisra. Guard this portal. Don't let anything or anyone near it. If we manage to flush another demon out of hiding, it may head this way. It may disguise itself as the dretch did. The protector nodded grimly. Keep watch on each of the other portals as well, Rila continued. Even the inactive ones. We can't be certain of the status of any of them anymore. Give each guard a scroll that will enable her to seal the portal if necessary. Orders given, Rila asked Cavatina to follow her. They made their way to the battle mistress's residence, not pausing until they reached a sitting room furnished with three crescent-shaped benches that surrounded a scrying font. Tapestries on the walls showed ebon-skinned priestesses on the hunt, swords and horns in hand. Rila's empty scabbard lay on a bench next to her loot. Cavatina spoke first. What's wrong with Lady Kyole? Rila turned sharply and raised a finger to her lips. No names, she signed. The battle mistress obviously didn't want Kyole's eavesdropping on whatever it was she was about to say. Very well, Cavatina would play along. For now. Battle mistress, I report as summoned. You said you wanted my assistance in organizing the patrols of the promenade. I'm happy to advise you on how the protectors can best be. That's enough. Rila interrupted. If she was listening, she'll have stopped by now. She sheathed her sword and continued to the scrying font. She stared into the alabaster bowl, moved her lips in a silent message, and passed a hand just above the surface of the water. Cavatina struggled to hold her tongue. Her impulse was to tell Rila she was being unnecessarily cautious. People spoke Kyole's name so frequently that it must have sounded like overlapping echoes to the high priestess. Listening in on everything that followed, and trying to pick out the important nuggets from the endless drone of casual conversation, would have been a full-time task. What's more, Cavatina had never known Kyole to answer by accident when her name was uttered. The high priestess only answered those who intended to call her. Cavatina edged closer to the font and took a look. The scrying was focused on Kyole 
who walked through a forest with half a dozen lesser priestesses in tow. Kaiole stood, head and shoulders above the rest, a majestic figure with her silver robes and ankle-length white hair. The sight of her filled Cavatina with reverential awe. Kaiole had founded the promenade, had lifted the warship of Ilistre from an obscure sect to a force to be reckoned with. She'd made the faith what it was today. Every drow who had been raised from the Underdark over the past six centuries owed their redemption to her. Even though Cavatina had slain the demigod Selvatarm, she didn't rank nearly as high in the faith as Kaiole. Kaiole was speaking to the lesser priestesses, but her words were too soft for Cavatina to make out. She held the crescent blade in her hand and emphasized a remark by using it to point at something out of range of the scrying font. There was a time, not so long ago, when the sight of the crescent blade in the high priestess's hands would have filled Cavatina with jealousy. Now it was just another weapon, albeit a powerful one, and sorcelled with magic that had enabled Cavatina to kill a demigod. What you have to say must be disconcerting, indeed, if you don't want her to hear it. Rila passed a hand over the font, ending the scrying. She sat on one of the benches. I've been speaking with one of the seven sisters, she began. They're all Silverhand. She paid me a visit recently, expressing concerns about her sister. Cavatina nodded. Go on. Lady Silverhand pointed out something I'd noticed myself. A cut on the high priestess's wrist. Which wrist? The right one. Rila touched her own wrist. Just here. Cavatina shivered slightly, as if a chill breeze had just blown through the room. That happened a year and a half ago, just before our attack on the Acropolis of... She faltered as the name that had been on the tip of her tongue an instant ago suddenly escaped her. Of the Death Goddess, she said at last. I was there when the High Priestess cut herself. She was in the middle of an attunement, dancing with the Crescent Blade. She faltered in her dance. Not something she'd ordinarily do. No. Rila shifted the loot so that Cavatina had room to sit down. The fingers with the picks rested briefly on the neck of the instrument, as if yearning to pluck its strings. Then, Rila removed her finger picks and set them aside. Lady Silverhand mentioned something else, something she'd noticed about the crescent blade more specifically about her sister's reluctance to let anyone else touch it. Each time Lady Silverhand asks to examine the sword, the High Priestess refuses. She claims her bond with it will be broken if anyone else handles it. That explanation rings hollow, Cavatina said. The only time you can't let go of an attuned weapon be it magical or mundane, is during the actual attunement itself. The ensorcelments on the Crescent Blade are extremely powerful, but the same rules would apply. I suspected as much. You're overlooking one possible motivation, Cavatina continued. Pride. The High Priestess has decreed that she will be the one to kill Loth when that time comes. If she hands over the crescent blade to anyone else, especially long enough for a magical study to be made of it, she might miss her chance at glory. There. It was said. Not so long ago, Cavatina might have spoken the words with bitterness, but the boil of anger and jealousy that had festered inside her for years had been lanced by her redemption. Now she spoke calmly and with detachment. Even so, she said a silent prayer of contrition, asking Ilustre to forgive her for casting doubt on the High Priestess's character. 
Rila met Cavatina's eyes. We both know that's not the reason. Cavatina nodded. What then? You carried the crescent blade, fought with it, did it ever communicate with you? You're asking me if it's an intelligent weapon. The answer is yes, the crescent blade spoke to me. Did it ever say anything odd? What do you mean? Did it ever urge you to do something rash, to take on opponents you couldn't or shouldn't fight? Cavatina laughed. I wanted to kill Selvatarn, believe me. Then she shook her head. On the other hand, the weapon did seem proud, boastful. It talked as if it had killed Selvatarm all on its own. Rila stared directly into Cavatina's eyes. Did it compel you to kill Selvatarm? No, it wasn't like that, not at all. Did you feel any sort of compulsion while holding the crescent blade? No, well, yes, actually, but not until after I'd returned to the promenade when the High Priestess commanded me to give the Crescent Blade to her. I didn't want to let go of it. But you gave it to her. Cavatina bristled. It sounded like an accusation. She ordered me to. Rila sighed. I didn't call you here to try and find fault with you. I summoned you to the promenade because I'm worried. I think the Crescent Blade may be the cause of our High Priestess's recent outbursts. Her orders have been rather abrupt lately, and she's been less than forthcoming about the rationale behind them. She is the High Priestess, Cavatina countered. Eilistrae's chosen. As such, she's not bound to answer to anyone but the goddess for her decisions. She gives orders and it is our duty to obey. Are they her orders? Rila asked. Cavatina tensed. Are you implying what I think you are? The crescent blade never leaves her hand, even when it's sheathed. Her hand rests on its hilt. Are you telling me you think the crescent blade is controlling the high priestess? I don't want to speculate. I want to know. Rila rose to her feet and paced in a restless circle around the benches. Describe for me the temple you recovered the crescent blade from, the one in the demon web pits. Cavatina did. Rila listened, interjecting a question here and there. Was the temple truly sacred ground? My divinations revealed that it was. And the sword within it? Cavatina swallowed. Hard. Though she'd felt the Crescent Blade's holiness with a certainty as strong as song when she had first entered the temple, a seed of doubt had been planted the instant she read the inscription on the mended blade. Yet, despite the broken inscription, the Crescent Blade hadn't failed her. It had severed Selvatarm's neck, exactly as it had been forged to do. Of course, that was what Lolf had intended, all along. Halistra had admitted as much. And it had been Halistra who had led Cavatina to that temple. Halistra, the traitor. She'd pretended she was acting of her own volition, that she was seeking redemption. But she'd been the Spider Queen's foil all along, little better than a web-snared fly. My divination revealed nothing amiss with the crescent blade, Cavatina answered at last. Rila waited. But, she prompted, but now I'm not so sure. It was true. Until this moment, Cavatina had thought sacrificing Selvatarm was the extent of the Spider Queen's plot. But now she wondered if Lolth's schemes went even deeper than that. Soon after Cavatina had claimed the Crescent Blade, it had spoken to her. 
You're not the one, it had said. Had Loth anticipated that Kaiole would eventually claim the weapon for herself? Was the reforged crescent blade part of some trap that even now was springing shut? Was the weapon somehow goading Kaiole toward a battle she would lose? A battle in which the crescent blade would fail her? Until today, Cavatina's faith in Kaiole's mastery of magic had been unshakable. But now doubt crowded close. Halastro was the key to all of this. Cavatina was certain of it. Cavatina's thoughts kept circling back to the last time she'd seen Halastra. Where the fallen priestess was now was anyone's guess. After delivering Cavatina into the hands of the Baylor Wendanai, Halastra had disappeared. She'd been spotted, briefly by Karas and Liliana, during the battle atop the Acropolis. Then she'd vanished again. Had she returned to Wendanai? If so, she'd have found nothing but a corpse. Wendanai had died on Cavatina's sword, albeit without the usual explosive aftermath. His body had remained intact after his death, as if its animating force had gone somewhere else. Suddenly, Cavatina realized where it might have gone. Into the Crescent Blade. That would explain how a dretch had wound up inside the high house. When Denai could have summoned it, right under Kaiole's nose, from within the crescent blade, just before the high priestess departed on her inspection tour. It also explained the holy water Merrill had been carrying. Kaiole herself must have suspected something was wrong with the weapon. She was trying to banish the demon, without... Cavatina suspected. Much success. Carefully, never once mentioning Kaiole by name, Cavatina outlined her fears. She concluded with a recap of the conversation she'd had with the halfling just before the dretch made its appearance. Rila's lips tightened. What can we do? If it's only the sword that's possessed, we can banish the demon back to the abyss. If the possession has gone further... Cavatina took a deep breath. Rila's eyes widened. Ilustrates grant it's not as bad as that. An exorcism is something best dealt with here, where Ilustrates' presence is strongest, Cavatina said. But it will need sufficient preparation. How long will it be before the High Priestess returns? A ten-day, at least. Cavatina nodded. All arrangements will have to be made in secret. If a demon has taken control of the High Priestess, we won't want to tip our hand. Rila's face was grey with strain. This shouldn't go beyond the walls of this room. It could cause a crisis of faith, one that could cost us dearly. Agreed. Cavatina said. She stared grimly at the font. There's one thing I don't understand. Why would Ilustre have permitted something evil to fall into the hands of her chosen? She wouldn't have, Rila said firmly. Unless... She turned away, but not before Cavatina saw the pained look in her eyes. What? Say what you're thinking. There are whispers about what happened when the realms of Ilustre and Veron were joined. If they're true, it might not have been Ilustre who guided the crescent blade into the high priestess's hands. Cavatina shivered. Her mouth felt as dry as chalk. To hear such blasphemy, and from the promenade's battle mistress, it was unthinkable. Rila gave a chuckle that sounded forced. Those rumors are nonsense, of course. The Dark Maiden simply shifted the tempo of her dance. She had to, in order to bring the night shadows into the fold. Alistre still rules by song and sword. Veron is dead. By song and sword, Cavatina echoed. 
touching the hilt of her weapon. The sword let out a low, soothing hum from deep within its scabbard. It didn't help. Cavatina still felt as off-balance as a dancer with one leg. If her guess was right, if the demon Wendanai now inhabited the crescent blade, and he in turn was corrupting Kyole, the promenade was in grave danger. She held out her hands. Sing with me. Rila clasped Cavatina's arms, like partners in a frozen dance. They bowed their heads. Together, they prayed. Haraldin stopped in front of a door and glanced up and down the corridor. Though singing wafted from elsewhere in the promenade, this corridor was empty for the moment. He opened the door, stepped through swiftly, and motioned for Cavatina to follow. He shut the door behind them. This corridor was short, no more than a dozen paces long. It ended in a little-used door of solid black obsidian. The druid grasped the adamantine deadbolt at the side of the door and tugged, but the deadbolt didn't move. He nodded as if he'd been expecting this. Cavatina glanced over his shoulder. There was no lock visible. If the door was locked, it was held shut by magic. Haraldin touched his fingertips to the door's glassy surface, closed his eyes, and whispered. Cavatina tapped one foot impatiently. She'd sought out Haraldin, intending to get him to repeat, word for word, his argument with Kyole, in order to see if the high priestess had said anything telling. Instead of answering her questions directly, Haraldin had insisted on going somewhere private where they could talk. Now they were creeping about the promenade like rogues with looted valuables in their pockets. Cavatina was starting to suspect it wasn't merely a quest for privacy that had caused Haraldin to lead her this way. Haraldin, please, can't you just tell me what prompted your argument with... Haraldin's eyes sprang open. Shh! Don't say her name! She'll hear you! Cavatina took a deep breath. I wasn't about to do that. I was the one who reminded you not to speak her name aloud, remember? I just hope she's not scrying us, Haraldin said. That, Cavatina could agree with. Even though Kyole wouldn't return to the promenade for several days, after her inspection tour of the outlying shrines was complete, it wouldn't hurt to be careful. No matter where Kyole went, she kept a scrying font close at hand. The thought was even more disturbing when Cavatina admitted to herself that the high priestess was carrying around a sword that could contain a hidden demon. Haraldin had closed his eyes again and resumed his divination. Sweat beaded his temples. A wash of fair's rest played briefly on the wall beside him giving an eerie bluish tint to his already sallow skin. The druid was a moon elf, and thus immune to the fair's rest, else his divination might have been interrupted. His wavy black hair hung in a root-like tangle to his waist, and his fingers were as slender as spider legs. Not a pleasant combination when you came right down to it. But the druid was utterly loyal to the temple, despite his continued reverence for the Leaf Lord. As Haraldin so elegantly put it, Alistray was the fruit of Arvindor, and Rillafane the guardian of the tree from which she had fallen. Alistray planted seeds of hope in the Underdark, and by the Leaf Lord's decree, Haraldin's destiny was to help nurture them. The door's been magically sealed, he told Cavatina, by... Her. Why would she do that? To prevent me from showing you what's on the other side of it. Cavatina's skin prickled with anticipation. She rested a hand on her sword hilt. Can you open the door? Not by normal means. Only the most powerful spellcaster could undo her magic. But there is another way. 
Haraldin held his hands in front of him, pressing them together back to back. He whispered a moment and forced his hands apart. A hole appeared in the middle of the door and gradually widened, as if the obsidian had become as soft as clay, and invisible hands were parting it. When the gap was wide enough, Haraldin eased a leg through the hole, ducked, and stepped through the door. Cavatina followed. The room beyond was oddly shaped, square but with one corner that had been cut off diagonally by a wall similar, in its zigzag shape, to a folding screen. In the center of the zigzag wall was another obsidian door, the room's second exit. This odd configuration gave the room eight walls, a significant number. The drow who had inhabited the caverns on the far side of the Sargoth nearly a thousand years ago had once maintained a temple to the Spider Queen here. The temple had been obliterated when Ganador's cultists summoned the Ancient One's minions to the city, an act that had been the city's downfall. Centuries of visitations by oozes and slimes had worn down the altar and statue that once stood here. Kyole and her companions had finished the job, smashing what remained to dust and scouring the murals from the walls with holy water. Now all that remained was an empty room. The former temple could have been a convenient shortcut from the western end of the bridge, located just a few paces beyond the second door. But the priestesses who patrolled the promenade avoided this place. Cavatina could see why. Even though the room was bare and empty, being in it set her on edge. Now that she lingered in it, she realized the reason why. In all of the promenade, this was the one spot where silence ruled. Everywhere else, the hymn that constantly flowed out of the cavern of song could be heard, if only as a murmur. But in this tainted place, Cavatina couldn't even hear the rush of water from the nearby river. What is it you wanted to show me? she asked. Haraldin moved to the corner where the two longest walls met. This. He pointed at a glyph that had been painted on the walls, straddling the corner. The high priestess ordered me to paint it here. Ordered? Was that what your argument was about? Haraldin folded his arms across his chest and nodded. Large as a shield, the glyph was one she didn't recognize. It looked a little like the protective enchantments elsewhere in the promenade, but those were silvery red in color and dusted with powdered diamond and opal, while this one had been painted on the walls in shimmering streaks of powdered pearl, held in place by a clear glue that smelled faintly of honey. What is it? she asked. An enchantment designed to attract those who worship Gondor. The high priestess said it was a trap that would lure any cultists who venture upriver from Skullport into a room where they might easily be slain. Cavatina nodded. That seemed logical enough, and it had a precedent. Ten years ago, Gondor's cultists had laid siege to the promenade for three long months. The attack had come from upriver, from the caverns to the northeast, closer to the Hall of Healing. The oozes the cultists commanded had been held at bay. Not a single room or corridor of the temple had been overrun. Yet this likely wouldn't deter them from trying again. If they were preparing for another attack on the promenade, it made sense to set a trap for any spies they might send. Those attempting to infiltrate the temple would likely make their approach via the river that connected the promenade to the other parts of the Undermountain. But why place the enchantment here? It would make more sense to position it either at the northernmost cavern that opened onto the river, or the southernmost. Or both, not midway between the two, close to vulnerable areas of the promenade. 
and why, having ordered the enchantment to be put in place, seal the room off so no one could reach it. Cavatina walked to the second door and tested its deadbolt. Like the first, it was immovable, sealed by magic. You disagreed with the glyph's placement, Cavatina said. Heraldin nodded. That too. Cavatina turned. What else? The high priestess ordered me to say nothing of what I'd inscribed here, to tell no one, neither the lay worshippers nor the priestesses, nor the protectors, nor even Battle Mistress Rila. The very people who would need to be aware of something that might draw Ganador's cultists to this area, in order that they could be captured or eliminated. Exactly, Cavatina frowned. How did she explain the need for secrecy? She didn't. It seemed to me she couldn't, and that this frustrated her. When I pressed her, it turned into an argument. Do you have any idea why she chose this spot? Cast a divination, search for magic. Cavatina did. To her magically enhanced vision, the stone wall became as insubstantial as mist. Her body started to tingle. It felt as if something were trying to draw her into the wall, or rather, beyond the wall. Startled, she stepped back. What is it? An illusionary wall? You can't inscribe a glyph on an illusion. The walls are real enough. He wrapped his knuckles against the spot she'd just been viewing, hard enough to make a knocking sound. At least to me they are, but there's a portal here, one that can only be used by drow. How did you figure that out? Sometime after the High Priestess dismissed me, when I was certain she'd be gone, I returned and communed with the walls. They described a hole that would take drow elsewhere. That was clue enough. Cavatina frowned. I've patrolled every cavern, hallway, and chamber of the promenade, including this one. There wasn't a portal here before. No. The High Priestess must have opened it. I wonder why. Heraldin shook his head. I have no idea. I was hoping you might know, and that you'd tell me. He hesitated. A pained look in his eyes. Tell me what it all means. Cavatina hesitated, trying to decide how much she should say. Heraldin was worthy of her trust. He'd gone against the direct orders of the High Priestess by showing her this. He deserved a partial answer at least. Something's clouding the High Priestess's judgment. That's why the battle mistress summoned me to the promenade. We think... She swallowed hard. Should she be saying this? The answer to that question was clearly no, but Cavatina was inclined to listen to her gut. She might be drow, but she'd been born and raised in the world above. She hadn't been weaned on secrecy and subterfuge, but on blunt honesty. We think it may be demonic and that powerful magic will be needed to remedy the situation. When the time comes to act, we may need your help. Raldin nodded. I see. Thank you. It's the crescent blade, isn't it? Cavatina nodded. If it was obvious even to the druid, it wasn't going to stay a secret very long. Say nothing of this. We don't want to start any rumors. It would... Yes, I see that too. He glanced at the hole he'd made in the middle of the obsidian door. We should be getting back before anyone notices what we've done. I need to smooth the door over and hide any trace we've come this way. You go, Cavatina said. She nodded at the wall. I need to see where this portal leads. Wouldn't you rather I wait for you? No. Go to Rila and tell her about this. Tell her where I've gone, and that I'll report back the moment I discover anything. 
If I seal the door, how will you escape this room? Cavatina smiled. Alistair's blessing will see me safely home. Haraldin nodded at last. May she guide your steps, he intoned. He hurried across the room and squeezed through the hole in the door. Cavatina heard him repeat his spell, and the door sealed itself shut. Cavatina prayed. Alistair, she sang softly. Is this the path you wish me to follow? A moment later, the goddess's reply came. Not in words, but in a gentle yet firm tug on Cavatina's hand, like a partner inviting her to dance. Cavatina drew her singing sword, took a deep breath, and stepped through the portal. Chapter Four. Carland adjusted the hang of his pawafui and gave himself a final inspection. Directing the palm-sized mirror in its orbit with one finger, he checked to make sure his shoulder-length hair was tucked into the clip at the back of his neck, and that the hood of his pawafui draped neatly over his shoulders. The pawafui, made from the blue-black fur of a displacer beast, shimmered slightly. Hinting at the magic it contained, atop it, hanging by a silver chain, was a pendant made from a clear crystal. A flick of his hand brought the mirror up to eye level. He peered into it as he inserted an earring into his pierced lobe. Carved from the egg tooth of an unhatched spider, the earring was assurance against assassination attempts. Not that anyone was likely to try poisoning him in the middle of a formal meeting, but it never hurt to be prepared. In the mirror, his forehead appeared unadorned, yet the selukira he'd wrested from Kronpahar's door was there. Its constant pressure was similar to the pressing of a cool thumb against his skin. As a precaution, he kept the lore stone invisible. None but a Malarn could utilize its magic. Anyone else who tried to wear it would wind up a feeble wit. But there might always be someone foolish or desperate enough to try. Much had changed in the seven years since the fall of Chednasad. He'd come a long way indeed from his days of grubbing in the ruins of that fallen city, little better than the slave of a rival house. Carland was master of his own school of wizardry now, a school just one short step away from being sanctioned as Shamith's eleventh official college. He truly made a new home for himself in this city of wizards. The only reminder of his former life was the house insignia he wore on his left wrist. Carved into the worn leather band's adamantine oval was House Malarn's symbol, a glyph. Shaped like a stick figure person, arms bent and one leg raised, the symbol of the dancing goddess, Ilustre, the goddess Carland had pledged himself to. Inspection complete, he tucked the mirror into the breast pocket of his shirt. He slowly turned to go, savoring his surroundings. The private study was filled with expensive furniture. All of it studded with chips of beljural that twinkled with green light. A scroll shelf stood against one wall. Its diamond-shaped niches filled floor to ceiling with texts both arcane and mundane. On the opposite wall, dark fire flames danced like crackling shadows inside the hearth. The study was warm, filled with wealth, and entirely Carlin's own. A level of luxury. He hadn't experienced for years, all thanks to the kira on his forehead. As he departed, he reset the door's lock with a whispered word. He doubted anyone would recognize the abjuration any time soon. The word was from the original language of the Dark Elves, a language much changed since the descent. Like the other spells Carland had learned since opening Kronpahar's door. The abjuration was not written in any spellbook; it was contained solely within the kira, 
alongside the memories of those who had worn the lore stone before him. As Carlin strode down the corridor, students bowed. He gave each the briefest of nods. He'd deliberately delayed his departure, intending to teleport into the stone stave just to prove that he could, despite the fair's rest that now surrounded the city. Voices murmured inside one of the lecture halls. He glanced into it as he passed, and what he saw made him halt abruptly. Zarifar, one of his five apprentices, was staring at a pentagram that had been painted on the floor with dribbled candle wax. His right forefinger jerked back and forth as he traced its outline in the air. With his head bowed, face obscured by a fuzz of tightly kinked white hair, the tall, thin drow seemed oblivious to his inattentive students. He made no move to discipline them as they chatted and chuckled amongst themselves, completely ignoring their would-be instructor. A moment more, and the half a dozen students probably would have something to whisper at. Zarifar might be a brilliant geometer mage, but he was more likely to summon a monstrosity that would devour him than one that would obey him, or recite the spell backward and send himself straight to the abyss. Using his master ring, Carlin linked minds with his apprentice. As he'd expected, Zarifar's thoughts were deep in the pattern. He was imagining pentagrams within pentagrams while calculating the golden ratio of each in turn. Zarifar, where is Piri? He's supposed to be teaching this lesson. Zarifar startled, as if someone had just poked the tip of a dagger into his back. Two of the students snickered. Their faces paled to gray as Carlin strode into the room. Master Malarn, they gasped each falling to one knee. Colin ignored them. A worse punishment than reprimanding them, since it left them tensely anticipating what might come next. And when? Where is Piri, Zarifar? Oh, yes. Zarifar blinked like a surface elf coming out of reverie. Down at the cage, I think, he said. He asked me to fill in for him until he got back. Colin frowned. If Peary wanted spell components, he should have sent a student to fetch them. That he'd gone himself hinted that whatever he was purchasing was something others weren't meant to learn about. The timing of the trip to the Breeders' Guild was equally suspicious. Peary knew Carland was about to appear before the Conclave. There was no better moment for treachery. Carland's jaw clenched. This wasn't Peary's first betrayal. Colin had already been forced, once before, to punish him as a result of his disloyalty. Akira had later restored the apprentice to life in order for the spell that had stripped the death goddess of her name to be cast. Colin had wanted to dispense with the apprentice afterward, but the ancestors inside the Kira had suggested an alternative. They'd promised to strip Peary of those memories that made him dangerous and disloyal, while leaving the bulk of his magical learning intact. Until this moment, Carland had believed they'd delivered on their promise. The mind-stripped Peary had been both compliant and seemingly trustworthy. Now Carland wasn't so sure. This lesson is over, he announced, waving a hand above the floor. The pentagram disappeared in a puff of smoke, leaving the smell of melted candle wax behind. Go! The students scurried from the room. Colin closed his eyes and activated his master ring a second time. Peary came instantly into view. The apprentice hadn't bothered to remove his ring. He'd probably assumed Colin would be much too busy to scry him. Peary stood next to a narrow column of stone. One of the posts in the shimmering walls of force that caged the deep spawn, the Breeders Guild tended. His face and hands glinted with an oily, greenish tinge. The quasi demon. Stretched, skin thin, that he'd bonded with years ago. His hair stood up in stiff spikes, 
white and hard as bone. He held a wand in one hand and stood back to back with another of Carlin's apprentices. Eldrin, son of Master Seldzar, the master who would be nominating Carlin's school for admission to the conclave in just a few moments' time. Eldrin also held a wand in his hand. Mother's blood, Carlin swore. They're dueling. Little wonder his apprentices had chosen this moment for their duel. Carlin had expressly forbidden mage duels in an effort to preserve the fragile harmony within his school. More often than not, duels led to serious injury, sometimes death. The injury or death of a student or teacher was something most masters took in their stride. They encouraged backstabbing and betrayal among their apprentices, believing that it flensed the meat from the bone, allowing only the best to survive. Carlin held a different view. Any student accepted into his school was warned that any debilitating attack or suspicious death would be traced to its root. And then that student would be expelled. The same rules applied to the five apprentices who served as the school's teachers. Carlin glanced at the water clock in the corner of the lecture hall. He was supposed to be appearing before the conclave just a few moments from now. He tapped his foot impatiently, inclined to leave bad enough alone, until he noticed the femur that lay on the ground between the two apprentices as a dividing line. This was no mere grudge match. It was a duel to the death. Eldrin had a determined look on his face, but his tight grip on the wand betrayed his tension. He was a mere boy, a half-drow with ash-gray skin. He wore his usual spider silk shirt and ornately embroidered puafui, but his waist-length hair was unbound. He'd either been tricked or goaded into leaving behind the contingency clip that could save him from whatever Peary's wand hurled at him. The timing was too coincidental. The absence of seconds and a jabuk duello to oversee the duel was equally telling. Someone must have manipulated Peary or Eldrin into this. Someone powerful enough to have ensured that Master Seldzar wouldn't divine, ahead of time, that his son was about to enter into a potentially fatal duel. If Eldrin died, however, no, when Eldrin died, Seldzar would learn of it immediately. Whoever had maneuvered the two apprentices into this would certainly see to that. Once alerted to his son's death, it would take the master diviner less time to learn the circumstances than it took most males to draw breath. Then Carlin's school would suffer the consequences. Contrary to all that was natural, Seldzar actually cared for his son. He'd blame Carlin for the boy's death, and would point accusingly to Carlin's stubborn insistence on keeping the demon-skinned Peary at his school. Seldzar would likely revoke his nomination. Carlin told himself not to panic. Eldrin was a less experienced wizard than Peary, but he might just get a lucky shot in with his wand after the pair raised defenses. The water clock dripped. Carland was due before the conclave this very moment. He'd have to leave his apprentices to their duel and hope that Eldrin won. Just as he was about to end his scrying, however, Peary sneaked a glance down at his belt. Carland couldn't see anything on the belt but an empty wand scabbard. But he'd learned long ago not to trust his eyes alone. He yanked the master ring off his finger and held it just behind the gem on his pendant, peering through both at the same time. The images he was seeing shrank, now filling the center of the ring rather than looming large within Carlin's mind. He couldn't make out details, but fortunately, the object revealed by the gem's magic was large, a thin iron hoop hanging from Peary's belt. Holland recognized it at once as half of a ring gate. The gem also revealed a quasi-demon, cloaked by invisibility, that hovered in the air near the spot Eldrin would wind up in after marching ten paces. 
its wings fluttering, a malicious smile on its green-skinned face. The Quasite held the second ring gate in one warty hand. It was instantly clear to Carland what Peary planned. The demon-skinned apprentice was going to use the ring gates to attack Eldrin from behind. Ten paces, Peary said over his shoulder. Then turn, cast a single spell, and fire. Agreed? Eldrin nodded. Agreed. Carland gritted his teeth as he pushed the master ring back into place on his finger. Peary had left out one word from the ritual agreement. It should have been cast a single defensive spell. Eldrin had just agreed to a change in the rules that would cost him the initiative. Carland had to do something, and quickly. But what? Shamath's laws dictated that no outside party could influence the outcome of a duel. Those who interfered in a lethal duel could be put to death themselves. But perhaps Carland could get away with merely delaying the duel. Peary's foot lifted slightly. Ten? With a thought, Carland activated his ring. Both apprentices froze in place, each with his right foot slightly lifted from the floor. The water clock dripped. Now Carland was late. He teleported. He'd planned to make a formal entrance, but there was no time for that now. Instead, he teleported directly to the heart of the stone stave, to a spot just inside the great double doors of the conclave's meeting chamber. Unfortunately, someone was coming through the doors. The edge of a drift disc crashed into Carlin's back, sending him staggering. He caught himself on the railing that enclosed the speaker's sphere and saw to his dismay that several of the conclave were frowning at him. Without apologizing for his tardiness or awkward entrance, any excuse he might give would be exploited as a weakness, he bowed to the speaker's sphere, a ball of quicksilver suspended by magic at the center of the circular hall. He snuck a glance at the drift disc as he rose. On it was a female he didn't recognize. She was bald and well-muscled, not seated cross-legged, on the drift disc as was normal, but crouched on it like a spider waiting to spring. She wore a black, short-sleeved, skin-tight tunic that hugged her torso and thighs and ended at her knees. Not a single weapon or magical item was visible on her. Even so, she exuded an aura of danger. One of the masters must have invited her to the conclave. She would never have gotten past its guards and wards otherwise. Carland wondered what her business here could possibly be. He hoped it could wait until after the vote. Master Selzar waved a hand at Carland. Masters of the Conclave, I present Carland Millarn. The Master of Divination beckoned Carland to stand next to his podium. Carland strode smoothly to that spot. Selzar smiled benevolently at Carlin through the crystals orbiting his head, but at the same time his nostrils flared slightly, a reprimand for Carlin's tardiness. In this hall, where all displays of emotion were tightly constrained, it spoke louder than a shout. Aloud, Selzar said, As you all know, the reason we have convened is to discuss the promotion of an eleventh school to the rank of college and the addition of another master to our conclave. As I gave notice in my sending, it now pleases me to nominate Master Carlin's School of Ancient Arcana for elevation to college. I second the nomination, Master Yolren said from across the room. So far, so good. The master of the College of Conjuration and Summoning had made good on his promise, and he had good reason to. In return for second speaking Carlin's nomination, the awarenesses inside the Kira on Carlin's forehead would assist Yulren with an ongoing problem. The fair's rest that surrounded the city. 
It hampered divination and prevented mages from teleporting in and out of the city, something that had caused no end of embarrassment to Yorin's school. Yorin might have the appearance of a slothful indulger, with his heavy jowls and soft, corpulent frame, but the mind behind those heavy-lidded eyes was as sharp as a dagger. He knew which side of the Sava board to play if he wanted to restore his college to its former standing. As the female on the drift disc moved to the podium occupied by Master Guldor, Carland quickly scried his two apprentices. Piri and Eldrin were just as he'd left them, frozen back to back. He was thankful that the cage occupied an infrequently visited corner of Shamath. With luck, the Conclave's debate would be brief. The vote would carry, and Carland would be able to teleport away before anyone noticed what he'd done to the duelists. With even more luck, he might talk his apprentices out of killing each other. As the drift disc sighed to a stop beside the master of the College of Mages, Guldor touched the gold ball that hovered in the air in front of him. The speaker's sphere assumed the likeness of his face. A chin as pointed as his ears, and eyes that matched the slant of eyebrows that extended to meet the hair at his temples. I too have a school I wish to nominate this day, Guldor said, his voice seeming to come from the animated quicksilver head. Carland swore silently. Seldzar had warned him to expect opposition from the College of Mages, but not this. Things weren't going to go as quickly as Carland had hoped, not if the Conclave had two nominations to consider. I present to the Conclave Tlar Mizrintel, Guldor continued. I nominate her school of Bekeshel magic for elevation to college. Carlin's breath caught in his throat. Years of practice at stifling his reactions allowed him to hide any further reaction. The Bekeshel tradition was extremely rare, with only a handful of practitioners. His sister, Halistra, had been one of them. He took another look at the female on the drift disc. Had Halistra known her? The more he looked at Tlar Mizrintel, however, the more he doubted it. Had someone so distinctive visited Chednasad, Carland would have remembered her. What's this school of Bekestal magic? Master Antatlab asked, mispronouncing the name. His deep bass rumble reverberated through the floor, up into the soles of Carland's boots. Even without the benefit of the speaker's sphere augmentation, it had that effect. The face of the Master of Elemental Magic was as square as a granite block, and just as deeply pitted. I've never heard of such a school before. Nor have I, said the much quieter voice of Master Seldzar. You should pay more attention to Cavern Clack, another of the masters said. This past month, the mage halls have been buzzing with rumors that a new school had been founded. Everyone was trying to guess what it might specialize in. The speaker's fear shifted back to Master Guldor's sharp, angled face. The school of Bekeshel magic is based on an ancient bardic tradition. Bardic magic! Master Antetlab exploded, pounding his fist on the golden ball in front of his podium. The quicksilver face quivered as if an earthquake were surging through it. This is a conclave of mages, not minstrels. Our constitution only prohibits clerical magic, Master Guldor countered. It is silent when it comes to the bard's arts. And why? Because the mages who founded the conclave recognized that bardic magic is a brother to sorcery. Both arts draw their power from the same source the practitioner's own heart and will. Carland cleared his throat softly in an attempt to get Master Seldzar's attention. According to the rules of the conclave, Carland was forbidden to speak unless directed to. If only he could speak, he could end this right now, 
by pointing out the one thing the masters didn't realize. While it was true that Bekeshel was a bardic tradition, it was one that could only be practiced by someone who had taken a particular goddess as her patron deity. Lolf. On the surface, Goldor's nomination of Tlar Mizrintrol's school looked like nothing more than a means of countering Seldzar's play for an allied eleventh master on the conclave. Yet, Carland knew it had to have deeper roots than that. Goldor Zvir shared a house name with the priestess who headed up what remained of Loth's temple in Shamath. And there were rumors the ties were knotted even tighter than that. Stria Val Sheris, Zavir, smoldered like a coal under the heels of the wizards who had ground out her rule in Shamath. Tlar Mizrintorl's school was likely the high priestess's attempt to burn the conclave from within. If Carland could only catch Master Seldzar's attention, Tlar's school would have as much hope of being accepted into the conclave as a boy did of becoming matron mother of a noble house. A few quick flicks of Carlin's fingers would do the trick. Carlin cleared his throat a second time. Seldzar still didn't acknowledge him. Another of the masters was speaking. Guldor does have a point. The speaker's sphere bore a female face now. That of Master Felindira, a breathtaking beauty with long-lashed eyes and luxurious hair that swept back from a peak on her forehead. What the Master of Illusion and Phantasm really looked like was anyone's guess. Bards are very similar to sorcerers. Ah, so Felindira was allied with Guldor. Seldzar had wondered if she might be. There were rumors she worshipped the Spider Queen in secret. Ant at Lab threw up his hands, not even bothering to touch his golden ball. So are shadow mages, and you fought their admission to the conclave dagger and nail. Felindira rolled her eyes. The school of shadow magic was merely a cloak for Veron's clerics. Everyone knew it. Everyone but you. Carland cast a cantrip that plucked at Seldzar's embroidered sleeve, but the master of divination paid it no heed. Seldzar reached for the golden ball in front of his podium. As he touched it, the quicksilver face widened, and its eyes darted back and forth in time with Seldzar's own. Even at this critical juncture, his attention was at least partially on his scrying crystals. This conclave was convened to consider the nomination of the School of Ancient Arcana, a nomination that has already been second-spoken, he said with a nod at Master Yulrin. Since no second has spoken for the so-called school Guldor has nominated, I suggest we focus on the task at hand and not be distracted by frivolous. I second the nomination of the School of Bekeshul Magic. The sphere's features shifted, adopting the face of the only other female among the ten masters. Sir Drira Helviren, master of the College of Alteration, stared at Seldzar and arched an eyebrow, as if daring him to protest her second. The speaker's sphere shifted to a gaunt male face with hungry eyes. The nomination has been second spoken. It said in a paper-thin whisper that filled the chamber. The voice of Tzibrak, master of the College of Necromancy. The vampire drow's real face was little more than a shadow, lost in the hood of his bone-white robe. Two nominations stand. Let the debate begin. One by one, the masters stated their arguments and counter-arguments. Wearily, they fenced back and forth. Carland could imagine the unspoken calculations that must be whirling through their heads. Support one nomination, both, what was to be gained and lost by building or breaking alliances. Was it better to speak first or hold back until others declared themselves? With this second, more complicated nomination to consider, 
the debate might go on for a full cycle, or more. Carlin snuck another look at his apprentices. They were still frozen in place next to the shimmering wall of force. Behind it, one of the tentacled deep spawn the Breeders' Guild raised stared hungrily out at the tool duelist. Then Carland noticed something that chilled his gut like ice water. A crack had just appeared in the wall of force, next to the duelists. A crack that was widening. There could be only one explanation for the rupture in what was otherwise a carefully tended wall. Someone must have spotted the two frozen duelists and decided to weaken Carlin's school by ensuring the accidental deaths of two of its apprentices. Carlin couldn't wait for the debate to end. The second nomination had to be made null and void now. He gripped the railing in front of him and took a deep breath. The moment there was a gap in the debate, he spoke. I realize none but a master is permitted to speak, but there's something you must hear, he said in a loud, clear voice. But Keshel magic is... Suddenly, Carland couldn't move. A sphere of glass surrounded by solid stone enclosed him. A magical imprisonment. The favorite tactic, it was rumored of Master Massage, who supposedly was in full support of Carlin's nomination. Carland hadn't felt the Master of Aberration touch him, hadn't felt anyone touch him for that matter, yet the spell had been cast anyway. Carland was trapped like a fly in amber. He couldn't cast spells, couldn't escape. He might never see Shamath again, let alone realize his dream of being elevated to the Conclave. He realized he'd been both hasty and stupid, arrogant enough to think the Conclave would listen to him, that the Masters wouldn't punish him for breaking protocol. Of all the things Carland had ever done, this had been among the most foolish. He might be trapped, but there was one course of action open to him. Thanks to his Master Ring, he could still scry. He refocused his attention on his apprentices. He might as well twist the dagger in deeper by watching Eldrin die. Via the scrying, he watched as Piri and Eldrin unfroze. Neither noticed the cracks spreading through the wall of force. Each glanced suspiciously at the other, then down at the ring on his finger. No feeble wits they, not like their master. They had figured out what had just happened and what to do about it. With jerky motions fighting the compulsions Carland had built into their rings, both Piri and Eldrin tugged them from their fingers. They shouldn't have been able to do that. In ordinary circumstances, Carland would have wondered what magic was used to counter the ring's hold on their minds. But this was hardly the time to ponder such trivial betrayals. No, Carland silently raged. It's not me you have to be worried about, it's... The scrying ended. Time passed. Had Carlin's heart been beating, he might have measured time by it. Suddenly he was back inside the stone stave's central chamber, facing the conclave once more. He immediately dropped to one knee and turned his head, exposing his throat. My profound apologies, masters. I bow to your... He noticed something, a golden ball hovering in the air just ahead of him. He glanced up and saw all ten masters staring at him. Nine of them had golden balls hovering in the air in front of them. Master Selzar did not. He'd temporarily forfeited his right to a voice on the conclave so Carland might say his piece. The speaker's sphere bore Master Tzbrak's visage. The vampire Drow's voice whispered out of it. Rise, Carland. Finish what you started to say earlier. Carland rose to his feet and nodded his thanks to Selzar. Carland was certain he'd pay for this later, pay dearly, but he was glad to have been given a second chance. 
He turned to face the female he was about to accuse. She stared back at him from her perch on the drift disc, a flat, level stare that held a promise of retribution for whatever he was about to say. Carlin couldn't worry about that now, nor could he let himself be distracted by speculating how much time had passed while he'd been imprisoned and whether one or both of his apprentices were dead. He would keep this short and to the point. He touched the golden ball. Bakeshul is a bardic tradition, it's true, he told the conclave, his eyes still locked on those of the female on the drift disc, returning her challenge. But it is only practiced by members of a particular faith, by those who worship Lolf. Flar didn't flinch, didn't even blink. Someone else in the room must have, though. Carlin heard more than one sharp intake of breath. Goldor was the first to touch his golden ball. How can you make such accusations? You know nothing of Bakeshul magic. My sister was a Bakeshul bard. Goldor was good. His face didn't even flush. You lie. A simple divination will prove that I do not, Carlin said quietly. He waited a moment or two, long enough for any of the masters who had a spell that would detect falsehoods to cast it. My sister, Halistra Malarn, was a Bakeshul bard. She was also a devotee of Loth. You can't be the first without the second, something you were no doubt privy to, Guldor Zavir. The sphere assumed Master Shadrira's face. I withdraw my second. For several moments there was silence in the chamber. Then Master Tzbrak spoke. Talar Mizrintral, leave us. Never once taking her eyes off Carland, Talar moved back. Instead of the anger Carland expected, Talar looked as if she were appraising him, sizing him up. The doors to the chamber opened silently, and the drift disc slid out, whisking her away. Guldor's face was purple with barely suppressed rage, but he rallied quickly. Carland Malarn, he said in a soft voice, do you worship the Spider Queen? Carland answered wearily, aware that whatever divinations the masters might have cast earlier would still be detecting falsehoods. I was raised to follow Loth, as are all drow, but I never formally pledged myself to her. Guldor smiled. Because you worship Ilestre? Colin's eyes narrowed slightly before he could prevent it. He was on dangerous ground here. Ilestray's worship was not forbidden in Shamath, the conclave officially permitted all faiths, but her worship was still a quick way to make enemies among those masters who had secretly taken the Spider Queen as their patron deity. One thing was in his favor, however. Goldor had to be guessing. If not, he would have phrased that last as a statement rather than a question. Only females are welcomed into Ilustre's circle, Carland answered. He arched an eyebrow. Surely you don't mistake me for one. Males can become lay worshippers. Carland waved a hand dismissively, the hand that didn't bear Ilustre's crescent-shaped scar. He turned away from Guldor. He's grasping at spider silk he told the other masters, feigning a light-hearted tone he didn't feel. Appropriate, considering the company he keeps. Someone chuckled. Out of the corner of his eye, Carlin watched Guldor. The master's lips were pressed tightly together. Guldor would have anticipated that his nomination of Tlar Mizrintral might fail, but he hadn't expected to be mocked. Carland had just made a lasting enemy of the master of a very powerful college. The face on the sphere grew fatter, more jowly. 
Now that only one nomination remains to be considered, Master Yurlin said. Why don't you tell us, Carlin, why the School of Ancient Arcana should be named a college? That was better. Things were back on track, and Eldrin couldn't have been dead yet. If he had been, Master Seldzar wouldn't have looked so unperturbed, though gods only knew what was happening down at the cage. The reason is simple, Carlin began. He followed the speech he'd rehearsed with Seldzar earlier, down to the last syllable. Accept my school as Shamath's eleventh college, and your city will reap the rewards. To the city itself, my college can provide powerful magic. Spells that have been forgotten since the time of the descent, spells that have been revealed to me by this. He pointed to his forehead with a flourish and dropped the invisibility that had been hiding the lore stone. A corresponding bulge appeared on the forehead of the face on the speaker's sphere. Only a few of you will have seen its like before, he told the masters. It's a Salu Kira of ancient Myuratar. Eyes widened. The masters must have noted the lore stone's deep color. Carland held up a cautioning finger. Lest any of you think of claiming it, I offer this warning. The Lore Stone will only share its secrets with a descendant of House Mularn, and I am the last surviving member of that noble house. Everyone else, from its matron mother to the lowest boy, lies buried in the rubble of Chednasad. Anyone else who attempts to wear House Mularn's Lore Stone will wind up feeble-minded. Heads nodded slightly at that. All remembered the state Eldrin had been in, when Carland had returned the boy to the city two and a half years ago. The connection was obvious. His speech concluded, Carland fell silent. There was a further incentive for certain masters, but it couldn't be spoken aloud. Master Seldzar had spent the last year carefully tracing the lineage of each of the current masters of Shamath's colleges. Two other masters, besides Seldzar, could trace their lineage back to ancient Myiratar. Like him, each might be able to claim a Kira from Krofenhar's door, so long as he was shown how, something that wouldn't happen until the College of Ancient Arcana became a reality. Neither of the two masters would know for certain whether anyone else had been promised a Salu Kira. Each would do whatever he could to influence the rest of the Conclave in order to claim his reward. A pretty promise, Master Sherdrira said. She tipped her head. But how do we know you will share this magic? Colin smiled. I have already. He watched as that sunk in. As the masters glanced covertly at one another, wondering who had already benefited. Then he added, do you dare run the risk of being the only one without access to my spells? Master Seldzar flicked his fingers. My ball! Carland inclined his head, then nudged the gold ball to Seldzar. The Master of Divination touched it, and the speaker's sphere assumed his likeness. I suggest we end this debate and put the nomination to a vote. Agreed. Yulrin said. Agreed, Sarbrak echoed. One by one, with the exception of Guldor, who remained sullenly silent, the other masters gave their assent. Sabrak spoke. Carland Malarn, leave us. Carland bowed. Even before he'd finished rising, he teleported away. He appeared straddling the femur that was the dividing line, his hands raised and ready to cast a spell. Piri lay on the ground a few paces away, either unconscious or dead, his wand beside him. Eldrin was in even more dire straits. The deep spawn had already squeezed three of its six tentacles through the gap in the wall of force, 
One was wrapped around the boy's chest and held him dangling above the ground. Though Eldrin still held his wand, he was either too frightened or too badly hurt to use it. His eyes widened as he spotted Carland, and his mouth worked, but no words came out. Judging by his purple face, there wasn't any air left in his lungs. Carlin conjured lightning. He aimed for the base of the tentacle that held Eldrin, but the monster was unaccountably fast. It yanked that tentacle and Eldrin with it, back behind what remained of the wall of force. The magical barrier absorbed the eye-searing bolt. Mother's blood, Carlin swore. This monster was a fast one. Suddenly he recalled what his masters at the conservatory had taught him about these creatures so many years ago. Deep Spawn were capable of listening in on thoughts. For someone who could cast spells to shield his mind, this wasn't a problem. But Carland had trained as a battle mage. He had dozens of lethal spells at his fingertips, still more that would shield his body but none that would hide the contents of his mind. The deep spawn retreated fully behind the wall of force. It waved a tentacle at Carland, taunting him. The other two tentacles continued to cling tightly to Eldrin and to something invisible. Piri's Quasit. Even as Carland watched, Eldrin stopped struggling and slumped. His wand fell from his fingers and clattered to the ground. Carland had to think of something, and quickly. If he didn't, the deep spawn would kill Eldrin, assuming it hadn't already done so. And now that the monster had withdrawn behind the walls of its cage, Carlin would only be able to target it through the hole. He edged to the side, trying to get into position to do that. But the deep spawn read his mind and moved away. Come out from behind the wall, coward. He thought at it. Let's see if you can catch a lightning bolt in your tentacles. Carlin moved to the spot where his other apprentice lay, bent down, and touched his fingers to Piri's throat. Blood pulsed beneath the skin. Piri, at least, was still alive. As Carlin straightened, his foot nudged something that scrapped across the ground. Something metal. He looked down, but didn't see anything there. Then he realized what it must be. Piri's ring gate. Carlin hurled himself at the ground. As he did so, the tentacle holding the quasi flicked forward, trying to toss the demon away. This time, Carlin was faster. Before the deep spawn could release the quasi, Carlin landed, chest down on the spot where the ring gate lay. As he made contact with it, he shouted an incantation. The mirror in his shirt pocket shattered, fueling his spell. Energy rushed out of it as fast as light. It erupted out of the second ring gate into the deep spawn. Intense silver light played over the tentacled monster, altering the very substance of its body. When the light vanished, so too did the creature's natural coloration. A heartbeat before, the deep spawn had been a living, breathing thing. Now it was transformed into clear, solid glass. Its body, no longer suspended by magic, crashed to the ground, tentacles shattered. Carlin stood and brushed himself off. Tinkling bits of mirror fell from the ruin of his shirt pocket. Bet you didn't expect that one, he said dryly. Then he hurried forward. He stepped carefully through the rent in the wall of force and felt its powerful energies lift the hair on his arms and scalp. When he was underneath the transformed deep spawn, he reached up and grabbed the tentacle that held Eldrin and wrenched on it. As it snapped, the boy tumbled to the ground. Eldrin groaned low and deep, a sound that was music to Carlin's ears. The boy was still alive. Carlin scooped up Eldrin's wand. It was of a type he didn't recognize. 
solid white with an inscription in Espruar, the script of the surface elves spiraling around it. Carlin didn't have time to solve the puzzle the wand presented, however. In a few moments, his spell would lapse, and the deep spawn would revert back to flesh. Even missing its tentacles, it would be a formidable foe. He touched Eldrin and teleported away. They materialized within the private hospice of the College of Divination. Colin barked out an abbreviated explanation to the startled attendant. Instead of springing to his cabinet of potions, however, the elderly apothecary shifted Eldrin's sleeve, revealing a vial that was tied to the boy's forearm. Why didn't you use this? He yanked out the vial and uncorked it. It's just as potent as anything I have here. It is? I ought to know. It's one of my best. Carlin shook his head at yet another mystery he didn't have time to solve. Eldrin had obviously been given the potion by the apothecary. But how had the boy expected to consume it in the middle of a duel? Is there more of that? Carlin asked. The apothecary nodded at his cabinet as he parted Eldrin's lips and dribbled the potion into the boy's mouth. In there. Why? Get it ready, Carlin said. There's another of my apprentices who might need it once I've finished with him. Then he teleported away. He returned to the cage in time to see a member of the Breeders Guild rushing to the spot where the wall of force had been breached. The fellow skidded to a halt, reached into a pouch at his hip, and held up a pinch of something. Crushed gemstone dusted his dark fingers. He hurled the dust at the breach in the wall and chanted an incantation, but abruptly halted when he noticed the transformed deep spawn its clear glass body all but invisible behind the shimmering wall. Hey, what did you do to our breeding stock? A transmutation, Carland shouted back. I suggest you complete your spell. The transmutation's only temporary. The guild member hesitated, as if wanting to challenge Carland further, but decided against it. He waved his hands and chanted, hurriedly completing his repair. Carland picked up Peary's wand, touched his apprentice, and teleported away. This time, the destination was his private study. He'd have to placate the Breeders' Guild. They'd demand compensation for the damage to their deep spawn. But that could wait. He patted down Peary's pockets, looking for the ring the apprentice had removed earlier. He found it. The compulsion built into the rings was too strong for his apprentices to rid themselves of the rings entirely, and slipped the ring into his own pocket. As he waited for Peary to recover, he examined the apprentice's wand. It was made of ebony, inlaid with chips of red agate, a fire wand. A wise choice for a duel, given Peary's demon skin. If the wand's blast had been deflected back at Peary, the fire would have sloughed off his body like water off a slate roof. Eventually, Peary groaned and rolled onto his back. His eyes opened, then widened as he took in his surroundings, and the fact that Carland was pointing Eldrin's wand at him. Suddenly, they blazed red as four cheated steel. Twin beams of red streaked out of Peary's eyes at Carland, only to bounce off the magical protection Carland already had in place. The heat beams ricocheted off the master's magical shield and scored deep burn marks on the ceiling instead. Carland stared down the length of slim white wood at his apprentice. I don't know what this wand does, he told Peary, but I'm curious to find out. How about you? Peary shook his head. Though his green-tinged face seemed devoid of expression, his wide eyes gave him away. 
He was afraid of the wand in Carlin's hand. Deathly afraid. Carlin dug Peary's ring out of his pocket and held it where the apprentice could see it. Let's have a talk. Mind to mind. I want to know why you and Eldrin were dueling. Let me look into your thoughts, then maybe I won't use this wand on you. No, Peary blurted. But at the same time, his fingers twitched. Do it. Carlin forced the ring onto Peary's finger, then shoved his way into the apprentice's mind. What he found there made him nod. Peary's thoughts weren't the only ones fluttering through the apprentice's brain. Carlin detected a second presence in there, one that spoke in a high, tittering voice. The quasi-demon Peary had bonded with hadn't been content to remain inside the skin the apprentice now wore. It was also whispering around inside Peary's skull. Peary was either listening to it or being controlled by it. Thanks to the ring, Carlin could read its thoughts. The quasi had goaded Peary into seducing Alexa, the only female among Carlin's five apprentices. The demon also ensured that Eldrin, her consort, learned of the tryst. Despite his anger, Eldrin wasn't stupid enough to have challenged Peary. It had been the other way around. In the end, Eldrin had been forced to accept the challenge. To have done anything else would have meant forever being subservient to the other apprentice. The demon's motivation in all this was simple and simple-minded. Power shared between four apprentices was better than power shared between five. It had hoped to eliminate Carlin's apprentices, one by one, and thus claw its way to the top. Even now, Peary was struggling against the demon's influence and failing. He'd rallied enough to agree to wear the ring, but was suffering for it now, as the quasi flayed his mind from within. And why not? The quasi had nothing to lose. Not now. Colin knew by reading its thoughts, which wand Eldrin had selected for the duel. A wand of banishment created by a moon elf cleric. A wand capable of sending the quasi back to the abyss. Eldrin had been clever. Flensed of the demon skin, Peary would suffer greatly perhaps even die. But there was healing magic that would enable him to live, the magic within the vial Eldrin had carried. Eldrin had gambled that he'd be quick enough and lucky enough to preserve Peary's life after killing his real foe in the duel, the demon. From the floor, the apprentice glared up at Carland with demon-red eyes. His lip twitched in a snarl. I'll have my revenge, the quasi said aloud, forcing Peary's voice into a high, brittle twang. I don't think so, Carlin said. He took a deep breath. He didn't want to do this, but he had to, even if it killed Peary. Carlin retreated from Peary's mind and activated the wand. Peary screamed his own voice this time, as the demon skin wrenched itself from his body. Blood seeped from Peary's body as fat, muscles, and ligaments were suddenly exposed. Colin leaned forward to teleport Peary to the apothecary. But before he could touch him, the apprentice's body disappeared. Colin's fingers brushed blood-soaked carpet instead of weeping flesh. Carland was startled. Had the quasi yanked Peary into the abyss after it? He attempted to scry his apprentice, but when he tried to call a vision through the ring, none came. Where was Peary? Even if the apprentice were dead, Carland should have been able to scry him, unless the ring had been removed from Peary's finger. Carland closed his eyes and sent his awareness into the lore stone. 
ancestors?' he asked. "'Is there any other way I might find him?' A chorus of voices answered from within the Kira. None held out any hope. Perhaps he could ask Master Selzar to attempt a scrying, but then he discarded the notion. Even if he teleported to the conclave's chamber this instant and somehow managed to convey what he needed without mentioning the duel and raising Selzar's ire, it would probably already be too late. Piri would most likely, already be dead. Carlin stared at the blood-soaked carpet a moment longer, then sighed. There had been no way to predict what had just happened, he told himself. He'd done everything he could to save his apprentice. The guilt he felt was a sign of weakness, something a master of a college couldn't afford. Not weakness. A female voice whispered from the lore stone. Compassion. Carland gave a mental shove, forcing his ancestor away. Sometimes the lore stone felt a little too close for comfort, especially after what he'd just seen in Peary's mind. He walked to the cabinet, opened a drawer, and placed Eldrin's wand inside it. As he closed the drawer... A voice whispered into his ear. Congratulations, Master Carland. The College of Ancient Arcana is officially recognized. It was Selzar, communicating by magic. The diviner's voice sounded clearly in the room. He was no doubt scrying on Carland and casting the spell through a font. This, despite the study's magical protections... It had to be a deliberate intrusion, designed to remind Carland who the more powerful mage was. My thanks, Carland answered. Sealing himself, he prepared to tell Selzar about the duel. Your son. Yes, the duel, the voice answered. I just learned of it. I'll take my pound of flesh from you later for permitting Eldrin to indulge in such foolishness. But just now, there's work to be done. Yorlrin demands a solution to the problem of the fair's res. He paused. As do I. Carland bowed. You'll have your solution. He promised. It was the truth, or at least true enough to have passed any other divination Selzar might have just cast. The memories of Carlin's ancestors, stored all these centuries within the Kira, did indeed hold the key to severing the bond that high magic had wrought between the drow and Fairsress. His ancestors not only knew what spells had been cast, but how to undo them. The only thing they didn't know was precisely where those spells had to be cast, in order for the bond to be undone. Nor had Selzar's divinations been able to solve the problem. But with luck, and the aid of a shipment that was on its way to Carland, even now from distant Silvery Moon, they would uncover that missing puzzle piece. Carland hoped he was right. If he failed to deliver, Selzar wasn't going to be happy with him. Chapter 5 Cavatina gaped at the strange landscape the portal had transported her to. It was as if she'd stepped into the heart of a huge mound of rubble. All around her, jagged pieces of grey stone crowded close on every side, except that the stone was blurred and indistinct and had no substance. When she swept her sword in front of her, the blade passed right through the stones, and when she took a step forward, she slid through the rubble like a ghost. Was she a ghost? She didn't think so. Whatever this place was, it didn't look a thing like the fugue plane, nor could she hear Ilustre's welcoming song. A curtain of bright silver shimmered behind her. It was about the size of a door and folded in a V, 
that corresponded to the corner of the room she'd just stepped from. She touched it and felt a crackling energy that slowed her fingers until it felt as if they were pressing on solid stone. The same thing occurred when she reached around the edge of the curtain and touched it from the other side. It appeared the portal only worked in one direction, from the promenade to here. She glanced at her feet and saw that she stood inside a chunk of stone. She felt a flat surface under the soles of her boots, one that remained constant even when she lifted a foot and placed it on the edge of a rock. She couldn't feel the sharp edge of the stone, but she could step up onto it. And though she sensed which way down was, she couldn't feel it. When she leaned forward, it felt as if she still stood upright. Leaning backward produced the same result. Before she could stop herself, she was perpendicular to the silver curtain, which now hung above her head. Even so, she still felt a flat, solid surface beneath her feet. Dizzy and disoriented, she scrambled upright again. What was this place? She breathed rapidly due to her exertions. At least she was still alive. Her body felt solid enough. She slapped a hand against her breastplate and heard the thud it made, though the sound came to her ears an instant later than it should have. She could also hear the low hum of her singing sword. Her movements, however, seemed slow to her eyes. Every motion took twice as long as it should have. Yet she felt no impediment. Though she stood entombed in hundreds of chunks of broken stone, it wasn't these that slowed her down. When she stuck her fingers into a gap between the stones and wriggled them, they moved just as slowly as they did within the middle of a block of stone. Short of dying and becoming a ghost, something she was certain hadn't happened, she knew of only one way to move through objects by being rendered ethereal. She was loath to leave the portal, but standing next to it and staring wasn't going to tell her where she was or how to get back to the promenade. Still, it was her only landmark. She decided to keep the portal at her back to move in a straight line away from it. She'd go as far as she could without losing sight of the V-shaped silver curtain, then repeat the process in a different direction if the first search proved fruitless. She walked away cautiously, sword at the ready. It was difficult not to flinch as she moved through what appeared to be a wall of jagged rubble. Each time her head seemed about to strike a rock, she half turned away. Eventually, she adjusted to the odd sensation of passing through objects that only looked solid, objects she couldn't touch or feel. At about the thirty pace mark, the portal behind her all but vanished. All she could see of it was the faintest shimmer of silver amid a gray blur of jumbled stone. About the same distance ahead of her, slightly lower than the spot where she stood, she saw a dark purple shape. She couldn't make it out entirely, like everything else in this place, it looked as though it lay behind a pane of frosted clear stone. But it had the general shape of a broken column. A piece of masonry that might have once been the column's capital lay nearby. She glanced behind her. If she kept going, she might never find her way back to the portal. Then she realized how useless it was to her. She might as well leave it behind. The ruined column, on the other hand, might offer a clue as to where she was. As she moved closer, she saw that the column had been carved from mottled purple stone. Other smashed pieces of column lay nearby, resting on a slab of the same purple rock that must once have been their foundation. This was the ruin of an ancient building one that appeared to have been smashed to pieces by a rockfall. Carefully, she noted the shape and orientation of the broken column. She moved from it to the next, 
closest chunk of the building, and then to the next. She'd expected the smashed building to be rectangular or circular, but the foundation slab had an irregular shape, with bulges around its circumference. The placement of the columns, judging by what remained of their bases, had been equally random. Even the columns looked odd. They weren't smooth cylinders, but tapered and bulged along their length, as if the masons hadn't been able to decide which thickness to make them. She tried to touch one, but her hand passed through it. Some of the columns had inscriptions on them, lines of text chiseled here and there like random graffiti. Cavatina peered closely at these, but couldn't read them. No matter how hard she stared, the writing wouldn't come into focus. It blurred just enough to render it indecipherable. She tried to trace a line of it with her finger, but couldn't feel the outline. She might as well have been touching a wisp of shifting smoke. During her investigation, her body had drifted upward. She was high enough to see that the foundation of the building was carved with an enormous symbol. It took a moment to puzzle it out, as the lines were interrupted where the slab had shattered and partially obscured by the fallen columns. But eventually, she realized it was a triangle with a Y shape superimposed on it. She shivered. That ancient symbol hadn't been used in millennia. It had long since been replaced by the more common eye within double circle. Yet Cavatina, like all of the promenade's priestesses, had been taught to recognize it. The symbol of Ganador. Cavatina knew now where the portal had delivered her, to a spot far below the promenade. This was the temple that had lain in ruins for nearly six centuries ever since Kyle and her childhood companions had defeated the Ancient One's avatar. They'd driven it from the caverns that became the promenade, consigning it to a deep shaft that had then been filled in with rubble and sealed with magic. A shaft that led to the god's domain. By all that dances, she whispered, I'm in the pit. A moment later, a burst of bright purple light pulsed from the Y-shaped symbol, banishing shadows from the cracks in the broken stones covering the slab. With it came a sensation. It was as if something wet and slippery had just fouled Cavatina's skin. Ilustre, protect me, she sang. Shield me from the Ancient One. Alistair's moonlight shone out from Cavatina's pores, evaporating the slime, turning it to flakes of shadow that exploded from her body. The purple light was waning now, but even so, Cavatina backed away. Her sword peeled out a warning as something momentarily blocked the fading glow. Blinking away the spots from her eyes, Cavatina saw a tarry black blob atop the foundation slab. The ooze was faster than Cavatina, but she could withdraw farther. It squeezed upward through cracks in the rubble and brushed against her weapon. She yanked her sword back in what felt like slow motion, and was relieved to see that the blade was still whole. Though the ooze had touched it, the acid had failed to dissolve the metal. Ignoring her, the ooze continued upward through the gaps in the rubble. Realizing it was escaping, Cavatina sang a prayer that called down Ilustre's wrath. Shadow-streaked moonlight punched down in a shaft all around her, throwing the tarry black ooze into sharp relief. The light should have reduced the ooze to a smoldering puddle, but the creature slithered on as before, as though it hadn't even noticed the attack. Cavatina laboriously followed. She readied a second spell, but by the time it was ready, the ooze had flowed beyond the limits of her vision. 
Normally, she would have been able to run twice as fast as an ooze could slither. But with her body rendered ethereal, Cavatina moved with an agonizing lassitude. Her voice was slow and deep, her hymns dirge-like. The heartbeat that pounded in her ears had a lethargic cadence. Alistair's purpose in guiding her to this place was now clear. That burst of purple light had been a planar breach. A temporary one, brief as a flicker, but it had lasted long enough for one of Gonador's minions to squeeze through into the prime material plane. Cavatina could guess now why Wend and I had tricked Kyle into inscribing a symbol that would draw Gonador's drow worshippers to this spot. Through their prayers, the planar breach could be wrenched wide open, something that would allow Gonador's avatar to pass through it. Kyle must have known that a planar breach existed here. On all of Toro, it was the most likely of places for one to occur. What could Wend and I possibly have said to convince her that ushering Gonador's worshippers to this spot would pose no danger? She tried to imagine the arguments he might have posed. Perhaps he'd convinced Kaiole that Gonador's avatar would be no match for her. She'd defeated it once before, after all. Or perhaps he'd told her that the slime god itself would come through the breach, that armed with the crescent blade, she stood a chance of killing Gonador. That argument, of course, was as thin as rotted cloth. The Crescent Blade's blessing specifically enabled it to kill by decapitation, and Gonador was a shapeless mass without a neck or a head. But perhaps Kyle was so deeply in the demon's thrall that she wouldn't think of this. Whatever the demon might be whispering in the high priestess's ear was a puzzle Cavatina couldn't solve just now. What she could do, however, was inspect the seals on the pit to ensure that whatever oozes slipped through the flickering breach weren't a threat to the promenade. Chasing after the black ooze had left Cavatina with no clear sense of which way was up. Fortunately, there was a way to figure this out. She chose a direction at random and moved until the rubble ended. Beyond it was a wall of stone, that had been fused to a glassy sheen by the outpouring of silver fire Kyle had used to drive Gonador's avatar down the pit. Turning her body so that this wall became down, she walked along it. After what seemed an eternity, her head bumped against what felt like a solid surface, the magical barrier that capped the pit. It shone with a bright silver glow, blocking her way. The promenade, she was thankful to see, was still safe from an incursion from below, by material and ethereal creatures alike. She sang the hymn that would allow a priestess to enter the promenade, and felt the barrier above her soften just enough to let her pass. She pushed her way up through it, into the cavern above. Everything looked exactly as it should have. The floor was the usual smooth, raked field of stone chips, and the statue of Ilustre was intact. Made up of tiny chips of stone, it stood on tiptoe with arms extended overhead, forefingers and thumbs touching. It moved, almost imperceptibly, in a dance that kept time with the passage of the moon through the skies of the world above. A protector stood guard at the bottom of the secret staircase that wound down to this cavern. Slowly, Cavatina moved toward her, and the female's face gradually came into focus. It was Indira, one of the priestesses who had accompanied Cavatina on the expedition to the Acropolis of the Death Goddess more than a year ago. Cavatina waved a hand in front of Zindira's face, but the other priestess showed no sign of realizing she was there. Zindira! Cavatina shouted, this time passing her hand back and forth through the protector's body. There's a planar breach at the bottom of the pit. 
Zendira shivered. She drew her sword and glanced around. Yes, Kavatina cried. I'm here. Can you hear me, Zendira? A moment later, Zendira shrugged and resumed her sentry's pose. She did, however, continue to grip her softly humming sword. As Kavatina shouted again, the volume of the hum rose slightly. Zendira glanced at the weapon. Struck by sudden inspiration, Kavatina switched from shouting to singing. The sword hummed in time, harmonizing with her melody. By spacing out her words, she could make the sword's song wax and wane. She sang a battle hymn, a strident call to action. Though the song was drastically slowed and without words, Zendira listened carefully to it. She glanced back up the staircase as if debating whether to leave her post, then seemed to change her mind and sang a quiet evocation. Rila, it's Zendira. Something strange is happening at the mound. My sword is singing a warning. Kavatina breathed a sigh of relief. Her warning had been received, if not completely understood. It was the best she could do for now. Rila hurried down the stairs a few moments later. Kavatina resumed her song. The battle mistress listened to the sword, then nodded. She glanced around, then strode over to the mound and inspected it. Yes, Kavatina breathed. That's exactly what I wanted you to do. When Rila sang a true seeing and stared intently at the statue, Kavatina tried to move to a spot where the battle mistress could see her, but she was too slow. Rila's survey of the room just missed her. I see nothing amiss, the battle mistress told Zindira. Resume your post. Be watchful. After that scare with the dretch, we can't take chances. Zindira saluted the battle mistress and moved back into position at the bottom of the staircase. Rila departed up the stairs. Kavatina clenched her jaw in frustration. Unless she could find a way to render herself material once more, she'd never be able to warn the others about what was happening below. She briefly considered following Rila, trying to make her understand, then decided that she probably wouldn't have much luck. She could, however, find out where that ooze had gone. With her sword balanced on her shoulder, she climbed down through the rubble. This time she scrutinized the walls of the shaft more carefully. The stone was smooth for most of its length. The cracks were in the lowest section of the pit, far below the level of the promenade. Here she found numerous places where an ooze or a slime might escape. She entered the cracked wall and saw a shimmering wall of emerald green light a short distance ahead. At first, she thought it was just a passing ripple of fair's rest. Then she realized it was holding steady. Another portal? With rising excitement, she moved to it, only to bump into a barrier that felt as solid as stone. It appeared to be a magical ward, capable of keeping ethereal creatures at bay. The green glow extended far above and below her, and for some distance on either side. Like the stone, it had numerous cracks, wide enough to admit an ooze, but too narrow for Cavatina to pass through. She forced herself against the barrier, hoping it would give way. But it didn't. She pressed her eye to one of the cracks and peered inside. She saw a natural stone cavern with cracks in its walls, floor and ceiling. The black ooze was inside the cave, slithering toward a score of other creatures. Slugs, oozes, and slimes of varying hues. They sat quivering at the center of the room as if waiting for something. Several tunnels led away from the cavern. Cavatina spotted movement inside one of these. 
a figure walking toward the main cavern with smooth, flowing steps. It turned out to be a naked drow, an exquisitely beautiful male with eyes of a shade Cavatina had never seen before. Pale green, like a newly budded leaf. The odd-looking drow moved without hesitation to the oozes, slimes, and slugs. He halted, his arms raised. As Cavatina watched, horrified, the creature swarmed him, flowing over the drow in layers like quivering blankets. When they parted again, the drow was gone. Not even a smear remained. Self-sacrifice, Cavatina whispered. Had the drow been drugged, compelled by an enchantment to offer himself to the creatures? Or had he been one of Ganador's followers, going willingly into the maws of the slime god's minions? She'd heard the fanatics sometimes did that. She shook her head in disgust. Cavatina decided to see where the drow had come from. She made her way around the edge of the cavern to the tunnel he'd just come through. The magical barrier surrounded that tunnel, too. Like the cavern, the tunnel had numerous cracks in it. Cracks that extended to the magical barrier. She worked her way around the tunnel, looking for a gap large enough to pass through. There wasn't one. She expanded her search. The magical barrier, she learned, enclosed an enormous space, an area that might be almost as large as the promenade itself. By pressing herself against the shimmering green glow here and there, and peering through cracks, Cavatina could see what lay inside the rest of the space. Most of the areas she peered into were natural caverns, like the first, but a few were proper rooms, cut from the native stone. One of these held an enormous iron scorpion that turned restlessly, its stinger tail scraping the ceiling of the too small room. A scalander? Cavatina mused aloud. Was this the one Meryl had babbled about? It had been down here a long time, judging by the accumulated grit on its body and the numerous gouges its stinger had scraped in the ceiling. Cavatina continued to explore the limits of the magical boundary. Tunnels led away from the central caverns, each surrounded by a tube-like extension of the magical barrier. All dead-ended after a short distance except one, a tunnel that led past what looked like a recent lava flow. Just beyond this point, a staircase slanted upward. It was enclosed by the glowing green barrier, too. Cavatina climbed through the stone beside the staircase and found herself in an abandoned mine tunnel with a ceiling level with her chest. That told her she was in one of the oldest sections of Undermountain, far below the promenade. The ancient mithril mine excavated 26 centuries ago by the dwarves of Malerbode. Bluish light rippled through the wall and disappeared. Even this deep, there were traces of fair's rest. The portal that led back to the Hall of Empty Arches lay somewhere within these mine tunnels, though Cavatina doubted it would be much help. Even if she did manage to find it, she doubted it would transport her while she was in ethereal form. The magical barrier extended only as far as the top of the stairs, which ended in a simple open arch, just high enough for a dwarf. Inside the arch, the magical barrier was a different color. Instead of green, it glowed with a golden light that shaded to green at its edges. On the other side of this barrier, at the top of the staircase, sat an enormous gray ooze. It pressed itself up against the barrier that filled the arch, attempting and failing to force its way out. Cautiously, Cavatina touched the golden barrier. It blocked her, just as the green glow had. She glanced up and down the mining tunnel, wondering which way to go next.
She spotted scuffs in the dust on the floor. Someone had crawled away from the staircase and decided to follow them. She walked along in solid stone from the waist down, but with her head and shoulders inside the tunnel, trusting to Ilustrate to guide her steps. A short time later, she spotted a second dwarf-sized arch, this one plugged with stone, just like those in the Hall of Empty Arches. Two drow sat next to it, their backs against the wall. Cavatina moved closer, trying to see who they were. She didn't recognize the male, who turned out to have a horribly scarred face and ruined eyes. But she recognized Liliana at once. The protector was naked from the waist up. Her chainmail tunic and a warped and blackened sword lay on the floor next to her. Another puzzle piece from Merrill's garbled story dropped into place. This was where Liliana had disappeared to. Whatever she'd been doing, she must have hoped to return through that portal to the Hall of Empty Arches, only to find that it wasn't active. Liliana looked strained and exhausted. As Cavatina watched, she made the sign of Ilustre's moon and prayed. Aid me, lady in my dance. I've done battle in your name. The moonlight within me has waned. Turn your face to me and fill me with your light, that I might return safely to my place of sanctuary. Cavatina touched her on the shoulder. Liliana, can you hear me? Liliana paid her no heed. The male, however, turned his head. One hand groped blindly for Liliana and bumped against her arm. His fingers moved swiftly. Lady, I sense something. A creature draws near. Cavatina blinked in surprise. Can you hear me? She asked. If he could, perhaps she could use him to alert the battle mistress to the planar breach. But the male didn't respond to Cavatina's touch on his shoulder. There, he signed, pointing with his other hand. Not at Cavatina, but at something behind her. She turned. What is it? Liliana whispered to the male. I can't see anything. Cavatina could, however. An ooze was flowing out of the wall, not half a dozen paces behind her. It quivered a moment, bulging first this way, then that. Then it moved toward the spot where Liliana and the male sat. Part of its body remained inside the wall. It was moving through solid stone. It was ethereal, just like Cavatina. She'd heard of such creatures able to shift between physical and ethereal form at will. They were deadly opponents. Unless Liliana and her companion moved away from this spot quickly, the ooze would engulf them. It would slither over them, resume its material form, and consume them, unless Cavatina stopped it. She smiled. The ooze might just be her passage out of here. She stepped into its path, sang a hymn that would shield her from its acid, and kneeled, her sword tucked tight against her body. She cringed as the creature touched her shoulder, dribbling acid onto her, but she held fast. The ooze recoiled, then suddenly bulged forward, engulfing her, and squeezed. The pain was excruciating. Pressure drove the air from Cavatina's lungs. Tendrils of ooze forced their way into her ears, pressing against her eardrums until they rang in agony. Still more tendrils slid into her nostrils, plugging them. Ilustre, she silently cried, strengthen me, lend your might to my sword arm. She thrust her weapon away from her, driving it into the ooze. Then she twisted in a kneeling pirouette, wrenching her weapon around with her. The singing sword peeled in muffled joy as its blade bisected the ooze from within. The ooze shrank away in alarm. 
Cavatina followed, staying within its flesh, and felt a sudden lurch as the creature entered the material plane. At the last moment, she remembered to duck. Even so, her head scraped the ceiling of the mine tunnel. She'd done it, passed back into the prime material plane in the belly of the ooze. Now she needed to carve her way out of it before it squeezed the life out of her. Through a gelatinous blanket of flesh, she saw Liliana rise to her knees and grasp her sword, an alarmed look on her face. Another ooze, the protector shouted, her voice muffled to Cavatina's ears. Then Liliana sang. Her hymn smashed into the ooze, sending shudders through it. Yet the creature continued to squeeze Cavatina, undeterred by the magical assault. Cavatina had no air left in her lungs. The ooze forced its way down into her throat. Gagging, she hacked at the thinnest section of its body. The side opposite the spot where Liliana and the male crouched. Cavatina's knees scrabbled on the acid-slick floor. Had it not been for her spell, her clothing and armor would have dissolved by now, and her flesh with them. Behind her, she could hear the male's muffled shouting. The ooze squeezed harder. Spots of bright light crackled in Cavatina's vision. She felt a rib crack. She thrust again with the sword and felt its point break through the outer skin of the ooze, into the air beyond. Suddenly, the ooze was gone, vanished back into the ethereal plane. Cavatina sucked in a shuddering breath, exhaled through her nostrils, and blew out the sludge the ooze had left behind. She sang her thanks to the goddess, but couldn't hear anything. Movement behind her caught her eye. Liliana scrambling to her in utter silence, sword in hand, an astonished look on her face. The protector halted at the edge of the acid slick the ooze had left behind and shouted something, but her words were lost in the magical silence. She switched to silent speech instead. Where did you come from? Where did the ooze go? The second question was the important one. It's ethereal, Cavatina signed back. Be careful, it might materialize again. Behind Leliana, the male touched his fingers to the floor. He waved, hoping to catch their attention, then signed, Keep still. When the spell wears off, it will be able to feel us moving. Cavatina glanced at Liliana. He cast the silence. Liliana nodded. He's a night shadow. Smart, but where's his mask? Later. The night shadow, his ruined eyes staring sightlessly, maintained his vigil, his fingers lightly touching the floor. The three waited long enough for the acid that was everywhere to dry to a crust. Cavatina would have to renew her protection when she eventually washed it off, but that was the least of her worries. What mattered now was whether the ethereal ooze rematerialized. It didn't. Cavatina realized she could hear herself breathing. That was close, Liliana whispered. The night shadow cocked his head, nodded. Too close, he signed. Cavatina was impressed. The male's senses were sharp. I think we're safe now, she said, speaking aloud for his benefit. If the ooze were going to attack again, it would be on us already. Oozes aren't intelligent enough to lie in wait. She crawled to the arch. Liliana followed. Where did you come from, Lady Cavatina? Liliana repeated. Did you find the portal? Cavatina was surprised. You knew about it, too. How did you get into the room? What room? 
Cavatina realized they must be talking about different portals. Why don't you start by telling me how you got here, Liliana, in detail? Liliana told a strange story of following a wizard's construct into a cavern that wept gray ooze. It must have escaped from the pit, she concluded. It... Yes, there's a planar breach. How did you know? I saw it, Cavatina said grimly. Finish your report. Liliana bowed her head in acknowledgement of the order. She continued her report. It seemed that she and the male, whose name was Naxal, had done battle with a molten ooze, the one that had disfigured him. They'd journeyed to the spot along the route Cavatina had explored, past the now solidified lava and up the staircase. How did you get around the barrier at the top of the stairs? Cavatina asked. Liliana held up her hand and nodded at the ring on her finger. The same way I activated the portal. By touching gold to it. On purpose this time. That explained the golden glow. Cavatina took a closer look at the ring. It looked like an ordinary band of gold. Is it magic? Its ensorcelments have nothing to do with it. I think that anything gold will activate the portals. Liliana's smile faded. She slapped her ringed hand against the blocked archway. Except for this one. Cavatina nodded. Her thoughts were on the archway at the top of the stairs, and the ooze pressing against it. Let's just pray that the oozes haven't fed on anyone wearing gold jewelry, she said, thinking of the sacrifice she'd seen earlier. Or the ones that aren't ethereal will escape, too. I hadn't thought of that, Liliana said. Then she shook her head. But oozes are mindless things. They don't have enough intelligence to open the barrier on purpose, and the odds of any gold they carry inside them coming into contact with the barrier by random chance are small. The night shadow flicked a hand. Something's happening. What is it? Cavatina hissed. The ethereal ooze? The night shadow shook his head. He slid his fingers along the intricate carving that formed the frame of the arch. The stone feels warm, he whispered back. I think the portal may be activating. Finally, Liliana exclaimed. Go on through, Naxal. The night shadow started to move toward the arch. Cavatina caught his shoulder. One moment, Naxal. He halted. Lady? Once we're back in the promenade, say nothing of the planar breach until I've had a chance to report it to the battle mistress. We don't want to start a panic. The real reason, of course, was that she didn't want it known she'd seen the planar breach firsthand. If word of that reached Kyole's ears, the high priestess would realize that Heraldin had not only recognized her portal for what it was, but had led Cavatina to it. Naxal bobbed his head. Of course, dark lady. Off you go, then, Cavatina said. Wait for me on the other side, Naxal, Liliana added. I'll guide you to the Hall of Healing. Someone else can take him there, Cavatina said. Battle Mistress Rila will want to hear your observations as well. But it will only take a moment to... Cavatina held up a warning finger. You're coming with me. That's an order, Protector. The night shadow crouched by the arch, waiting. Liliana's cheeks darkened, but she made no further protest. Go on through, Naxal, she said gently. I'll catch up to you once I've made my report. He nodded, crawled forward into seemingly solid stone, and disappeared. 
As soon as he had gone, Liliana wheeled on Cavatina. There's something you're not telling me. What is it? Cavatina sighed. Suddenly she felt utterly exhausted. Rila will explain. What about Lady Kyle? She'll want to hear our report too. Has she been called back to the promenade? Cavatina hid her wince at the use of the high priestess's name. She resisted the urge to glance around. Was Kyle now listening in on their conversation? Was Wendenai? She'll be contacted if Rila deems it necessary. Necessary? Liliana repeated, her voice incredulous. Of course it's necessary that Kyle. Lady Liliana, Cavatina said sternly. This portal may only remain active for a short time, and we don't want to be trapped down here. Step through it, please. Promptly. Visibly fuming, Liliana at last stepped into the portal. As the protector disappeared, Cavatina briefly closed her eyes. If Kyle had been corrupted by a demon, the promenade was in danger from two fronts. From without and within. What was it that Kyle had said when she'd ordered the attack on the Acropolis of the Death Goddess? The memory of that conversation returned like a chilling premonition. Cut off the head and the temple will fall. Ilustrate protect us, Cavatina whispered. Grant that it not be so. She squared her shoulders and walked through the stone that filled the arch. A heartbeat later, she emerged on the other side, within the hall of empty arches. Liliana and Naxal stood there, together with Rila, who must have been called to the hall the moment the portal reactivated. Kyle was just behind them. Cavatina exchanged glances with Rila as they followed Kyle back to the hall of the priestesses. Liliana was with them, but Naxal had been led away to the Hall of Healing. Just as well, that was one less person who might let something slip in Kyle's presence. Cavatina noticed Rila toying with a strand of hair. The battle mistress was keeping her hand close to her holy symbol. Kyle walked at the front of the group, looking imperious in her silver robe. She never once looked back at her priestesses, expecting them to follow her without question or pause, as they always had done. The scabbard at her hip was empty, and Kyle held the crescent blade in her hand. Its blade rested lightly on her shoulder, just below her ear. Cavatina wondered if the sword were whispering to the high priestess even now. Praise Ilistre you've returned, Lady Kyle, Cavatina said. Her fingers moved in a silent question at her side, where only Rila would see them. When? Just now, Rila replied. Cavatina silently groaned. The high priestess must have heard Liliana speak her name and the snatch of conversation that had followed. Out loud, Cavatina continued. We found a portal in one of the tunnels south of the river. It leads to caverns below the level of the old mine. We sighted oozes down there. I'm worried the pit may have developed a breach. Liliana shot Cavatina a quick look, obviously noting Cavatina's use of the words may have. Fortunately, the protector was well behind Kyle, and the high priestess didn't notice. Troubling news. Kyle answered in a flat voice without even breaking her stride. The high priestess's shoulders had tensed, Gavatina noted, at the word portal, then relaxed again at the mention of it being south of the river. A location that was nowhere near the ancient temple. Detection? Gavatina signed to Rila. No evil seen, you try. Liliana had dropped back slightly, forcing Cavatina and Rila to shift awkwardly to hide their silent conversation. 
The protector obviously realized something serious was in the offing, even if she had no idea yet what it was. She watched them out of the corner of her eye. Cavatina was forced to sign with Liliana watching. Report Dretch, she suggested. Rila moved up beside Kyle. Lady Kyle, there was an intrusion you should know about. A dretch was spotted. As Rila sketched out the events that had followed the dretch's discovery, Cavatina dropped back another pace and sang under her breath, softly so Kyle wouldn't hear her. Her prayer took hold, causing the holy symbol that hung against her chest to softly vibrate. She scanned the crescent blade, looking for the bruised purple aura that accompanied evil. To her surprise, the sword was clean. Had she been wrong about Wendanai being inside the crescent blade? Rila glanced back briefly. Cavatina flicked a quick message at her. Nothing. Illusion? Doubtful. Cavatina had never heard of a Baylor capable of conjuring illusions. Banished? Rila signed without looking back. An excellent question, one that Cavatina didn't know the answer to. The oozes concern me more than one lone dretch does, Kyle told her battle mistress. They're the real threat to the promenade. Are the seals on the pit intact? Yes, lady, Rila answered. I checked them myself earlier today. Cavatina, still well back, whispered a second prayer. The silver aura that accompanied holiness sprang into view around the high priestess. But it was fainter than it should have been. A dull gleam, rather than a sheen so bright, it caused the eyes to ache. The silver glow was faintest near the hand that gripped the crescent blade, the hand whose wrist was marked with a small, still visible scar. The crescent blade itself was devoid of an aura. For an item forged from moon metal and consecrated to Isle that was telling indeed. Wendan I must have been inside it, Cavatina decided, even if he wasn't there now. Perhaps... Having done Lolth's bidding by persuading Kyle to open a portal to the pit, he departed. The Spider Queen could very well have restored his corpse to life, allowing him to return to the abyss. All well and good, but it left a gaping hole. With Wend and I departed, there was nothing to prevent Kyle's priestesses from pointing out to the High Priestess what she'd been tricked into doing, and then reversing it. Nolf might be insane, but she was cunning. She wouldn't have overlooked this flaw in her plans. The more likely possibility, vastly more terrifying, was that Wend and I had departed the Crescent Blade for a living host. Kyle. Cavatina shifted her song a second time and saw what she'd missed before. A faint purple glow just above the scar. That was where Wend and I must be hiding. She fought to hide the revulsion she felt. The situation was more grave than she'd dreamed. Was Kyle's mind still her own? Was this a demon Cavatina was talking to? No. Some part of Kyle remained. A significant part, or her aura wouldn't have shown silver at all. Cavatina prayed that Wendanai wasn't listening in on her thoughts. If he'd heard what had just passed through her mind, or was listening to whatever Rila was currently thinking, he'd counter whatever they tried next. She prayed that redemption was an armor he couldn't penetrate. There was still time to arrange an exorcism, as long as nothing happened to tip their hand. No rash moves, she decided. Nothing that would force the demon to react before they were ready. She'd play along, make her report, and slip away as quickly as she could to make the necessary preparations. Cavatina directed a sending at Liliana, 
a carefully worded one that wouldn't send the protector into a panic. This may be an impostor, not Kyle. I need to question her without alerting her. On my signal, sing a truth psalm. Do nothing more. Liliana's lips tightened. She nodded. They approached the high house. Rila reached for the door, but Kyle blocked her. Thank you for your report, Battle Mistress. Please return to the mound and reinspect the seals on the pit. Surely someone else can tend to that lady. Rila nodded in the direction of Cavatina and Liliana. It's important that I hear what these two have to. Do it, Kyle said in a terse voice. Now, a thorough check. This time, or I will hold you personally responsible for whatever follows. As will I, Lestray. Exorcism, Cavatina spelled while the high priestess's back was turned. Prepare. Rila stiffened. Hopefully the high priestess would think this a reaction to the insult she just handed her battle mistress. Rila bowed stiffly and hurried away. Kaole watched her leave, then pulled the door open and motioned for Cavatina and Liliana to enter. Cavatina tensed. Was the demon taking them somewhere out of the public eye? Somewhere it could attack? Kaole directed them to the room at the very heart of the high house, the chamber that housed her private altar, a holy place filled with Ilustre's blessings. Was the demon trying to prove something, that Ilustre's relics were of no consequence? As Liliana paused before the door, she caught Cavatina's eye and lifted one eyebrow slightly. Cavatina decided the time was not yet ripe. She would play this move out and see what followed. After you, protector, she said. Kyle closed the heavy stone door behind them. The circular room, shot through with hair-thin threads of moonlight, had walls painted with a mural of a forest. When the stone door was closed, the illusion was complete. Moss, sustained by magic, carpeted the floor, filling the shrine with a woodland smell. A pedestal plated in gold, its top even with Cavatina's eyes, stood at the center of the room. Perched atop it was a rust-red, deeply pitted rock the size of a loaf of bread, a fragment of the boulder that had parted from the moon and streaked through the sky on the night Ganador's avatar had been defeated. Kyle raised the crescent blade above her head and began to dance around the altar. As the high priestess passed behind the pillar, Cavatina caught Liliana's eye and nodded before beginning her own dance. Liliana lifted her blackened singing sword and joined in, her lips moving in a whispered song. She spun her blade in a tight circle above her head, a gesture that looked as though it was part of her dance, but was actually part of her spell casting. In the same instant that Liliana unleashed her truth-compelling prayer, Kyle quickened her dance and spun behind Cavatina, out of the spell's path. Cavatina felt the tingle of magic and realized, to her horror, that Kyle had maneuvered her into the path of the magic. Kyle wheeled on her. How did you know the pit has a breach? she demanded. I. Cavatina tried to lie but couldn't. Words tumbled out of her mouth. Not the carefully worded report she'd been rehearsing, but the truth about what had transpired. For Alden showing her the portal, Cavatina slipping through it and becoming ethereal, seeing the planar breach, the ooze flowing out of it, the self-sacrifice of the green-eyed drow, Kyle cut her off at the point with a curt. That's enough. Cavatina hid her relief. The high priestess hadn't thought to ask why Her Alden had shown Cavatina the portal. Yet. Liliana had listened, sword in hand. Now she glanced uncertainly back and forth between Cavatina and the High Priestess, 
as though she'd like to silently ask what to do next, but didn't care. Her singing sword let out a low, worried hum. Sheathe that, Kyole ordered. Why would you have me do that, Lady Kyole? Because it's annoying. Liliana shifted the weapon slightly. It no longer fits in its scabbard, Lady Kyole. Then find another way to silence it, Kyole barked. Lay it down. Liliana obediently placed her sword on the floor, ending its song. Cavatina smiled to herself as she realized why Liliana had asked the question. Kyole's blunt answer seemed to indicate the truth spell had taken hold of her as well, despite her attempt to shield herself from it by stepping behind Cavatina. Before Kyole could gather her wits, Cavatina spat out a question of her own. Why did you open a portal to the pit, Lady Kyole? Kyole scowled, an expression as foreign to her face as a look of mercy would have been on the cruel visage of the Spider Queen. Then, as abruptly as it came, the scowl disappeared. Cavatina could see how Heraldin had known there was something wrong with the High Priestess. Everything about Kyole's posture, tone, and expression was subtly wrong. Even Kyole's color was off. Her skin looked clammy, like that of someone who ought to be confined to a sick bed. She even smelled bad, as if it had been some time since she'd bathed. Fortunately for you, Cavatina, my preparations are incomplete. Cavatina's heart fell. Kyole wasn't answering her question. Was the demon capable of resisting Liliana's magical compulsion? Or was the answer simpler, that it was Wend and I who had opened the portal? If so, the demon wouldn't have been compelled to answer a question directed at Kyole. Cavatina's hands dampened with sweat. She resisted the urge to clench her sword tighter. Kyole might spot the slight movement and attack. Cavatina tried another question. What preparations? A symbol. Had you blundered upon that ruined temple once it was visible, that would have been the end of you. You would have wandered the ethereal plain forever, gibbering and broken. I did see a symbol. The mark of the Ancient One. Is that the one you mean? Of course not, Kyole snapped. I'm talking about the symbol I inscribed on top of it. Cavatina cautiously nodded. If there had been another symbol atop Ganador's, she'd failed to detect it. What symbol is that? One that provokes insanity. Kyole smirked, another expression she never used. The idea came from Ganador's own scriptures. She spoke quickly as if she couldn't get the words out fast enough. Maybe Liliana's prayer was affecting her. Millennia ago, the Ancient One rendered mindless the oozes and slimes that were his original worshippers. I'm going to do the same to the drow who worship him. They're incapable of redemption, so we're going to destroy them instead. That's why I opened the portal in the abandoned temple. Our spies will lure his clerics into it with a feint the fanatics can't help but follow. Especially once I open the door for them. You're going to allow Gonador's fanatics to enter the promenade? Capatina gasped. Kyole missed the point. They won't realize we've allowed it. Each group will think it's mounting a sneak attack. They'll never realize that others have preceded them, since the ones who have gone before won't be in any condition to warn them. Once the trap is sprung, they'll all walk into it one by one as meek as Rothé. Cavatina was absolutely certain that this was Wend and I speaking. Kyole would never have slain Drow outright, 
even those who worshipped so vile a god, without first offering a chance at redemption. Nor would she have allowed the promenade's defenses to be compromised. When are these sneak attacks to begin? Kyle smiled. My plan is already in motion. Liliana broke in. But, Lady Kyle, if the symbol is not yet visible... Kyle whirled around. I know what I'm doing. Your opinion is not wanted, protector. Liliana stood. Her mouth open. Her fingers spread slightly and her posture shifted. In another moment, she'd lunge for her singing sword. Behind Kyle, Cavatina frantically shook her head. Not yet! Play along! She signed. Liliana bowed. Lady, my apologies for speaking out of turn. The plan has its merits, Cavatina said, trying to draw the High Priestess's attention back to her. But the protectors will need to be notified. Of course. Kyle said, without turning around. She pointed at Liliana. They just have been, a little sooner than I would have liked. There may be spies among us. Not among the protectors, Liliana assured her. Not among the priestesses, you mean. There are night shadows whose loyalties I'm less certain of. She at last turned to Cavatina. You can see why I've been so short-tempered of late. It's a big gamble I'm taking, but one that, if all goes well, will prove as rewarding as our assault on the Acropolis. Cavatina nodded, trying not to betray the tension she felt. I don't like it, she said. It's too risky. Then she shrugged as if in resignation. But I bow to your greater wisdom, Lady Kyle. As do I, Lady, Liliana echoed. For a moment, no one spoke. Then Kyle nodded. Cavatina relaxed, a little. Hopefully, Wend and I was arrogant enough to think he'd fooled them. A knock sounded on the door. As Kyle crossed the room to answer it, Liliana caught Cavatina's eye. Her hand flicked a word. What? Ask to leave. Lady, Liliana said, may I check on Naxal? Not yet, Kyle said without turning around. There's more we need to discuss. Agreed, Cavatina interrupted. And the battle mistress should hear it. Liliana, go find Rila. Ask her to join us. No. Kyle snapped. Her hand was on the door. Remain where you are, Liliana. I've already sent for the battle mistress. Cavatina's heart sank. She could think of only one reason for Kyle to keep the protector here. Wend and I hadn't been fooled. And it was worse than that. As Kyle turned back to the door, Cavatina caught a glint of something. Silver fire, kindling deep within the High Priestess's eyes. Was Wend and I about to unleash it? Could he? If so, their lives would be measured in heartbeats unless Cavatina did something. And quickly. I'll astray. She silently prayed. Dancing lady, aid me. She caught Liliana's eye and glanced down at the other female's singing sword. One finger flicked. On my signal. Liliana moved her feet slightly, getting ready to dive for her sword. With luck, the protector would survive long enough for Cavatina to take Wend and I down and stop him by killing Kyle, if necessary. Cavatina prayed that it wouldn't be. Kyle opened the door, revealing Meryl. The halfling held up a tray on which stood a single goblet. Or, was it Meryl? 
For all Cavatina knew, this might be another dretch in disguise. Cavatina raised her hand slightly, about to give the signal to attack. Before her fingers could move, a voice sang into her ear. Wait. Ilustre? Cavatina wondered. Or the demon mimicking her voice? Watch, the voice urged. As before, the words sang out in a duet, blending male and female timbres. Ilustre, Cavatina felt certain of it. Meryl glanced into the shrine. At the two priestesses, then yelped and stepped back quickly as Kyole snatched the goblet, spilling part of the clear liquid it held, and shut the door in the halfling's face. Cavatina held her hand still. Leliana would be wondering why she hadn't signaled yet. Logically, now was the time to move, while the impostor's back was still turned. Goblet in hand, Kyle turned. Liliana waited, her body tense. Suddenly, Cavatina understood what the goddess wanted her to do. As Kyle drank from the goblet, Cavatina whispered a hymn of detection. She finished it as Kyle lowered the empty goblet. Cavatina saw the high priestess's aura brighten, returning to its usual gleaming silver. Except for a faint dimple that was the scar on her wrist. She realized that it must have been holy water the high priestess had just drunk, and that it had done its work. Cavatina shifted her whispered song. As she'd suspected, there was a dark purple aura surrounding the crescent blade. When an eye was back inside it. Yet even as Cavatina watched, a thread of purple found its way back to the scar on Kyole's wrist, and taint began to flow back into her. So soon? Surely holy water would have a more lingering effect than that. Unless it had been tainted by a dretch. That hadn't been Meryl. The halfling would have reacted to Cavatina in some way, giving an inappropriate wave or saying hello. This Meryl had simply given Cavatina a flat, unrecognizing stare. Cavatina needed to act, and quickly. This might be her only chance to banish Wendanai while he was still vulnerable, before he fully re-entered the High Priestess. Yet she'd had no time to prepare. Wendanai was a Baylor, the most powerful demon of all. Cavatina would need something more than just her sword or holy symbol, too. Wait a moment. Her eyes fell on the sacred stone atop the pillar. Wendanai had been overly clever in bringing Cavatina and Liliana to the shrine. He placed the perfect tool for an exorcism within Cavatina's reach. Cavatina's fingers flashed. Now! Liliana swept up her sword and lunged, her weapon peeling its attack. A faint Kyole met with a slash of the crescent blade. Their weapons met with a loud crash. Cavatina leaped for the sacred stone. She scooped it from the top of the pillar and hurled it, aiming at the sword in Kyole's hand. Be gone, Wendanai, she sang. Return to... Silver fire filled the air with a flash of heat. Cavatina heard a crack. The sacred stone had struck the wall. A welter of fragments pattered on the floor. Blinded by the after-effects of the bright flash, she leaped forward, trying to locate Kyole by feel. A strident note wailed past her ear once, twice, Liliana's sword blade. Cavatina ducked. Liliana, hold! The sword singing halted. Blinking against the streaks that obscured her vision, Cavatina fumbled for the door. Her hand encountered an utterly smooth surface. Magic-fused stone, hot enough to scorch her fingertips. She yanked her hand back and sang a hymn, one that should have sent her into the corridor beyond.
but Eilis Trey didn't answer. As the room swam into focus, she understood why. The stone door had been fused shut by Kyle's silver fire. On top of that, the entire chamber was glowing. Bright green light sparkled from within the floor, ceiling, and walls. A magical barrier just like the one Cavatina had seen when she'd been ethereal. Kyle had disappeared, and they were trapped. Cavatina turned to Liliana. The demons escaped. That was a demon? A demon took Kyle's form? Worse than that, Cavatina answered grimly. That is Kyle, but only partially. A Baylor is sharing her body. Alistray, save us, Liliana whispered, her face paling to gray. Her singing sword let out a mournful peal. She looked around. Why didn't it kill us? It was a good question, but Cavatina didn't have time to speculate. With an urgent whisper, she tried sending a warning to Rila. No answer came. Cavatina tried contacting Heraldin, the druid knew spells that would soften stone, and would soon have them out of here. But he also failed to answer. Cavatina glanced around the shrine that had become their prison, furious at herself for having become trapped here. The battle mistress needed her. Rila was adept at exorcism and a skillful swordswoman. But she would be facing the crescent blade, backed up by Kyle's silver fire. Cavatina bowed her head and prayed. Alistre surely could still hear her. Grant Rila the strength she needs to do battle in your name, Dark Maiden. Shield her and strengthen her sword arm. By song and sword. Liliana whispered. Cavatina hoped it wasn't already too late for their prayers. Chapter 6 Kara's yanked the reins of his riding lizard to stop it from snapping at the tail of the mounted front. All around him, the twenty-six other priests, who would ride out to the gathering, did the same. Their lizards, cramped together in the portico, were restless and aggressive as they waited for the drawbridge to fall. A novice in oversized purple robes hurried into the portico, carrying a lacquered black tray. On it was a whip-like tentacle rod and the ring that controlled it. With eyes downcast, the boy halted next to Kara's and lifted the tray. Kara's caught the eye of the priest on the mount next to him and feigned a greedy smile. Mine? The priest, a greasy-haired, hollow-cheeked drow named Mulvaeus, smiled, revealing brown-stained teeth. Yours, to replace the one you lost. The brownish-red tentacles of the priest's rod were coiled over one shoulder and around his chest. Their suckers puckered the fabric of his tabard. They sucked and released the purple encircled eye embroidered on the front of the tunic as if nursing from it. His shield bore the same symbol. Kara's could feel the other priests watching him out of the corners of their eyes. This was a test. He reached for the ring, a band of black obsidian set with an equally dark stone. The bitterly cold ring stuck to his sweat-damp fingers. He jammed it onto his left thumb and tore his fingers away. Cold shot through his thumb to the bone, turning the meat of his thumb a dull gray. With a thought, he adjusted its color back to black. He held up his thumb and flexed it, a motion that would draw the other's scrutiny away from his other hand as it surreptitiously brushed against the belt that cinched in his tabard, a belt that was actually his disguised holy symbol. Masked lady, he silently prayed, lend me strength. Feeling returned to his thumb. 
he grabbed the rod's leather-bound hand grip. Finger-thick, rubbery tentacles uncoiled and animated as he lifted the rod from the tray. When he held it at arm's length, the tentacles brushed back and forth against the slate floor, leaving streaks of frost in their wake. He flicked the rod, and a shiver ran through the tentacles. They snapped briefly to attention, then relaxed again and suckered the floor with faint, wet pops. A fine weapon he said. My thanks to House Filium. Gather well, Mulvaeus said. Karas flicked the weapon a second time as he waited, and a third pretending to admire the balance of its long metal shaft and the suppleness of its three black tentacles. At last he had to coil the weapon around his body, lest the others become suspicious. He suppressed his shudder at the touch of its tentacles against his skin. Without warning, thuds sounded as the house boys on either side of the drawbridge slammed sledgehammers to release the pegs that held its counterweights. Chains rattled, and the drawbridge fell with a tremendous boom. In mass, the riding lizards surged forward, their riders urging them onward with hisses. The novice who'd handed Kara's the rod gasped as a lizard knocked him down. He screamed as scrabbling claws shredded his tabard and back into a bloody fringe. The screaming fell behind as Kara's riding lizard surged onto the drawbridge with the rest. The sour smell of green slime rose to Kara's nostrils as his mount crossed the moat. Soon it was replaced by the fetid stench of the manure in house Williams' mushroom fields. The riders poured out of the black spire that was House Filium's keep. Their riding lizards clawed feet, sending up a splattering of mud that fouled the hems of their robes. Startled slaves rose from their mushroom picking to watch the mounts pass. Karas wheeled his lizard past the slave hovels, blinking away smoke from the smudge fires the slaves used to keep midges at bay. Soon the hovels fell behind. The riders emerged onto the wide expanse of silt that covered the floor of the low-ceilinged cavern. As their lizards scuttled forward in a blur of legs and claws, the priests gibbered the name of their god, spittle flying from their lips. Ganador who lurks, Ganador who sees, Ganador who devours. Kara's mouthed the refrain without giving voice to it. The harsh chirps and hisses of the lizards and the wet slap of clawed feet through mud masked his silence. He marveled at the contrast. In other cities, merely speaking the Ancient One's name aloud resulted in immediate retribution. Here in Lurth Drear, it was a different story. Loth's temples had been scoured clean when an avatar of the Ancient One had risen from Lurthagol consumed Loth's faithful and descended again. Over the centuries since, there had been frequent spawnings, eruptions of oozes, slimes, and slugs, ensuring that Loth's clergy didn't return. At the moment, thankfully, the lake was still and quiet. Its scum-covered surface lay undisturbed, apart from the occasional bubble of foul-smelling gas. Karas unwound the tentacles from his body and let them trail behind him as he rode. He wheeled his mount with the others as they turned to the black spire of rock that was House Abilon's keep. Slave hovels fringed the base of it. As the riders drew near the outermost of these shanties, figures scattered like spiders from a torn egg sack. Goblins, kobolds, and orcs. Even a handful of pale-skinned humans flailed through the mud in a panic. Beyond them, House Abilon soldiers poured oil through slits in the keep to prevent the attacker's lizards from scaling its walls. The priests rode the slaves down, lashing out with their whip-like rods. Slaves collapsed as the tentacles struck them, magic turning muscle to jelly or loosing a spray of slime that blinded and maimed. Some of the slaves stood dazed and staring, their wits sucked out by the lashing rods. 
Others leaped, screaming, from tentacles that left bands of fire across their flesh. Karas lashed out with his rod, the unfamiliar weapon awkward in his grip. By mere chance, he struck a kobold with a tentacle. The tiny reptilian squeaked in agony as its bones and cartilage turned as cold as ice, sending it into a stiff-limbed tumble. Moveus chanted a gurgling prayer. Rubbery black tentacles, as tall as saplings, sprang from the mud in a long line that extended back to House Filium's keep. Like slaves picking mushrooms, they plucked the fallen from the mud and passed them back, tentacle to tentacle, toward the keep. The gathering had begun. A gong sounded from the top of the nearby keep. Low and shuddering, it boomed once, twice, thrice. House Abilon's drawbridge crashed down, sending up a spray of mud. Lizard-mounted riders, garbed in identical tabards, but with green robes instead of purple, raced from the keep. Consume them! Moveus cried. Riders slammed spike spurs into their mounts, sending them leaping at the enemy. Spells flew thick and fast between the slave hovels as the rival groups battled. A roiling wave of conjured slime smashed one of the huts flat and broke against the mount of one of House Filium's priests. The lizard convulsed, thrashing its tail in agony. But the priest went down laughing, his arms waving above his head as he sang his god's name. A heartbeat later, a dark purple boil burst up through the slime assumed the vague outline of a drow, and staggered on quivering legs toward the nearest enemy. It wrapped its arms around that rider's mount. As the lizard collapsed, its body dissolving, another of House Filium's priests launched a spell that imploded the rider's head. Kara spurred his mount between two of the slave hovels, seeking refuge. As soon as he reached a point where the others couldn't see him, he reined his mount to a halt. He threw down his tentacle rod and whispered a prayer to the masked lady, healing his frost-burned thumb. A hiss made him look up. He wasn't the only one back there. Mulveus had followed him. The fanatic had heard Kara's prayer. He bared his stained teeth in a furious grimace. Imposter! he howled. His arm jerked up, flicking his tentacle rod back, ready to strike. Kara shot a poison bolt from his wrist bow, but Mulveus whipped up his shield and gurgled a one-word prayer. The metal shield turned into a shimmering disc made of droplets, which caused the bolt to dissolve instantly when it struck. Mulveus smiled and flicked his whip. Masked lady, cloak me! Karas cried as the tentacles flicked toward him. A sphere of darkness leavened with sparkles of moonlight sprang into being around him. The tentacles smacked into it and glanced aside. All but one which brushed Karas' left knee, instantly deadening it. His leg muscles felt as though they'd turned to mush. He'd been leaning in that direction and his left foot slipped out of the stirrup. He toppled sideways to the muddy ground, the weakened leg collapsing beneath him. His right foot still tangled in its stirrup, which had twisted up and over the saddle. The lizard, struck in the tail by a tentacle, twisted around to bite at its weakened, useless tail, dragging Kara's behind it. Moveus flicked the tentacles back, readying for a second strike. Kara's twisted to face his opponent. He spat out foul-tasting mud, pointed and chanted a prayer. It should have immobilized Mulveus, but the Gonadorian priest somehow shrugged it off. His arm whipped forward and the tentacles lashed out a second time. Karas at last yanked his foot out of the stirrup. He tried to roll behind his mount, but wasn't quick enough. Tentacles struck his shoulders and the back of his neck. His arms immediately numbed and fell limp at his sides. 
his head flopped forward on a loose-boned neck. Gasping, desperately trying to blink the mud from his eyes, he mumbled a prayer through numbed lips. Mace Laby, drip him from me. A foot squelched in the mud next to his ear. Karas twisted around and saw Moveas looming over him. The tentacles of his rod were coiled around his waist. The handle hung like a sheath at his side. As he chanted, a green tinge appeared around his hands. Slime trickled down to his wrist, then fell, hissing into the mud next to Kara's ear. In the distance, Kara heard the sounds of battle and the squelch of his mount limping away. See him, Mulveus chanted. Devour him. Destroy him. Kara steeled himself. He was ready. A moment more and he would go to his god and find out at long last if it really was the lady of the dance who wore the mask or if the shadow lord wore her. Mulveus bent down. His slimed fingers splayed. But before he could touch Kara's, a cord appeared around his neck and yanked him backward. A bolt of dark fire erupted out of his chest, burning a smoking hole through the eye embroidered on his tabard. Yet still the priest didn't go down. He clawed at the strangle cord around his neck, choked out a word, and his neck softened to the consistency of jelly. The strangle cord slipped through it and was gone. His neck solid again, Mulveus twisted furiously to meet his opponent. His hands raised to cast a spell. Karas seized his chance. He flailed with his good leg, snapping it against the back of Mulveus's knee. The priest staggered and toppled sideways, forced to check his fall with his hands. They slid into the foul-smelling mud. Snarling, he reached for his rod... But before the tentacles could uncoil from his body, a second bolt of dark fire caught him square in the mouth and exploded out of the back of his head, carrying bits of brain and skull with it. Moveus fell over backward with a strangled cry. The rod's tentacles suckled at his smoking remains for a moment, then fell still. A green-robed drow with distinctive pink eyes, stepped over the corpse and kneeled beside Kara's. His mud-splattered tabard bore Ganador's unblinking eye. But the prayer he whispered as he touched Kara's weakened arms, neck, and leg was to another god entirely. Mast Lord, he intoned, heal him. Sensation and strength returned. With a shudder, Kara sat up. My thanks, Valdar, that was close. Valdar helped Karas to his feet. Not much of a truce between houses, is it? Karas shook his head in agreement. The fanatic's vows don't seem to count for much when it's time for a gathering. Let's just hope it doesn't turn into full-scale war. Have you heard anything yet? Has she been in touch? Soon was what she said the last time we spoke. Kara's wiped mud from his face with a sleeve. I pray she's telling the truth. A ten day plus two is long enough. This is worse than my Euromydra. A kobold burst out of a nearby hovel, skidded to a stop as he spotted the two drow, and tried to duck back through the door. Valdar whirled and threw. His knife buried itself in the slave's throat. A snap of his fingers brought the knife back to his hand, even as the cobalt fell. May the Mass Lord grant that prayer, he said as he wiped the blood from his blade with a white silk handkerchief. He tucked the weapon back into its wrist sheath. I'm certainly ready for her call. My bunch is slurping out of the palm of my hand. Ripe for gathering, you might say. Kara shook his head. Valdar actually seemed to be enjoying this mission. They paused to listen. The shouts and cries of battle continued. Over them came a distant gonging, 
the call for House Filliam's priest to return to their keep. The larders were once again full, and the gathering was at an end. Time for me to go, Kara said. Me too. With a wink, Valdar vanished. One moment he stood next to Kara's, the next he had teleported away, as silently as he'd come. Kara's picked up his tentacle rod. He glanced around. His own lizard had curled against the wall of a hut to chew off what remained of its tail. But Moveus's mount was whole. Kara's ran over to it and sprang into the saddle. He drove his spurs into its flanks and hissed. The lizard scuttled away, climbing up and over the nearest hovel. As it descended the opposite wall, he heard shouts of triumph. The priests of Abilon had discovered Mulvaeus's corpse. Kara's rode away from the hovels onto the field that separated the two keeps. The house Philium priests were just ahead, forming up their mounts. This done, they rode hard for their keep, following the line of bubbling black pools left behind by the tentacles return to the earth. Some of the priests were wounded and clung to their saddles. One sagged, then tumbled backward across his lizard's tail. His body dragged for a moment, but then his foot slipped from the stirrup and he fell away. The other riders ignored him and continued to ride. Kara's rode with them. The priests of House Abilon followed for a time, hurling spells at the retreating group, but soon gave up the chase. Eventually, the priests of House Philium reached their own now empty fields. The slaves, rightfully fearing they might be gathered along with the slaves of House Abilon, would have fled when the line of tentacles sprouted from the earth. Kara's rode past the hovels to the keep and over its drawbridge. When the last of House Philium's priests was inside, Houseboy sprang to the capstans and cranked the drawbridge shut. Kara's dismounted. The surviving priests glanced around, taking stock. They'd lost five of their number, including Mulveus. Where's Mulveus? asked Shedrin. He was their second in command, a stunted drow with a pustule crusted face. Did anyone see him fall? I did, Kara's answered. One of House Abilon's priests killed him. He flicked his rod, sending a shiver through its three black tentacles. I dealt with him in turn. He didn't bother explaining why he was mounted on Mulveus's lizard. Those who followed Gonador's creed took what they needed, scorning those who were too weak to keep it. Shedrin nodded. He touched the eye on his tabard. Ash to ash, mud to mud, he intoned. May the Ancient One consume what remains. The other priests, all but one who had collapsed after dismounting and was being eaten by his lizard, bringing the total loss to six, touched their tabards. Kara's did the same, doing his best to ignore the wet rip of flesh and the gulps of the lizard as it bolted down the dead priest. He wanted desperately to escape to the solitude of the room he'd been assigned after he arrived on House Philium's doorstep, claiming to be from Skullport. He wanted to cleanse his body of mud, shroud himself in magical darkness and silence, block out the shrill screams that echoed constantly down the keep's foul-smelling corridors, and pray. Pray for the strength to continue this blasphemous charade, and see his mission through. In each of the keeps of Lurth Drear, other night shadows were, no doubt, thinking the same. Their counterparts were stationed in distant Arendellen and in Shadowport, and in the surface cities of Waterdeep, Benzenter, Callumport, and Westgate, everywhere Gonador's foul cult festered. Kara's wondered if the night shadows he and Valdar had chosen for this mission still lived. It had been a knife's edge thing, this day for Kara's himself. By the masked lady's grace, Valdar had been there to step in, 
but it would only be a matter of time before one of the night shadows was caught and revealed them all. A boy took the reins of Kara's lizard. He climbed down from it and walked across the portico, edging his way through the crowd to the exit. Before he reached it, a hand fell on his shoulder. You will be rewarded, Shedrin said in a low voice, his eyes gleaming. Then louder to all the priests. Come, we will feed the altar this very cycle in celebration of our gathering. He pointed at the nearest house boy. You, Spawn, tell the boys to prepare the sacrifices. Kara's choked down his apprehension. He could tell by the look in Shedrin's eye that the priest realized he was somehow responsible for Mulvius's death. Now one of two things would follow. Reward for ensuring Shedrin's promotion to Mulvius's former role as the Keep's Eater of Filth, or retribution. Both might very well take the same form, sacrifice on Gonador's altar. Yet Karas could do nothing, not with a score of gleeful priests sweeping him along in their mists. Stinking of blood and sweat, babbling their joy at a successful gathering, they hurried down the corridor to the shrine at the heart of the keep. Had Shedrin not singled Karas out, he might have slipped away, perhaps even feigned collapse and been left behind. But the new eater strode just behind Karas, prodding him forward. They burst through a curtain of damp, rotted black silk into a room with walls, ceiling, and floor polished to the slickness of glass. A dozen columns of the same mottled purple stone, each carved with a rune, ringed an irregularly shaped dais that rose in two tiers. Atop the dais stood a lump of porous black stone, the altar itself. A gong hung above the dais, its bronze deeply pitted by the acid that condensed on it, trickled down its sides, and dripped onto the altar. A purplish mist drifted through the chamber. As he passed through a patch of it, Karas touched his disguised holy symbol and silently prayed for strength. The mist left a stinging film on his skin and clung to him like lingering dread. Just setting foot in the shrine took all of Kara's courage. The air was so foul, he felt as if he were wading through liquid sewage. The closer he got to the altar, the worse it got. He was an intruder here, a person from another faith. At any moment, he'd be exposed, consumed, then they'd be on him, like carrion crawlers on a corpse. He shook his head furiously. If he didn't get a hold of himself, he'd soon collapse in a gibbering heap on the floor. With a shaking hand, he gripped his disguised holy symbol. Masked lady, he silently prayed, swallowing down his bile. See me through this. Help me to do your work. Shadow my doubts and cloak my fears. The priests halted in a loose-knit group before the altar. Shedrin stepped to the front, turned and raised his hands. His fingernails were filthy, the sleeves of his robe soaked with slime and blood. He caught Kara's eye. For one terrible moment, Kara's thought Shedrin might ask him to perform the sacrifice. Then Shedrin closed his eyes. Gonador, your faithful servant calls, Shedrin intoned. In your name I feast. Then he transformed. His fingers melted into his hands, his arms trickled toward his body like melting candle wax, and his head turned into a blackened puddle on his shoulders. Soon all of him, including his robe and tabard, had turned to ooze. The black blob he'd become bulged against the lowest step of the dais and flowed up to the altar. The other priests formed two lines stretching from the doorway to the dais. Karas, by carefully maneuvering, placed himself as far from the altar as he could get, beside the chamber's only exit. 
He pretended to follow along as the priests muttered their devotions and swayed back and forth. He moved his lips in time with the rest, mumbling what he hoped would pass as a prayer. Fortunately, Ganador's faithful had no set liturgy. Like the god they worshipped, their rituals were amorphous and ill-defined. Each priest praised the Ancient One in his own fashion. If any of the others noticed that Karas was uttering nonsense, it wouldn't matter. He just prayed that the Ancient One itself wasn't listening. A few moments later, the first of the sacrifices staggered into the altar room. An orc. Her eyes glazed, a dribble of the drug she'd been forced to drink drooling from her mouth. Even from a distance... Karas could smell its licorice sweet scent. The tempo of the priest's mutterings increased, found a rhythm. Onward, oblivion, onward. With each word, the captured slave took a step forward, stumbling as if shoved by invisible hands between the two rows of priests. Compelled by their magic, the orc made her way, one halting step at a time to the dais. At last, she bumped her shins against it, fell forward, and cracked her head on the stone. She rose, her snout bloody. She levered herself up onto the first layer of the dais, then the second, then onto the altar stone itself. The priests fell silent. With a wet slurping sound, the black ooze that was Shedrin slithered onto the altar. As it engulfed the orc, the glaze fell from her eyes. Her cry of anguish was cut short as her flesh sizzled. The stench of burned hair filled the room. For a heartbeat or two, she struggled, then fell still. A pitted bone poked momentarily out of the black ooze, then got slurped back inside. Now a second slave stumbled into the room, this one a male half-orc. Like the first sacrificial victim, he stank of the drug he'd been forced to consume. The priests began their chant anew, compelling him forward. Sickened, Karas played along. Onward, oblivion, onward. One by one, eleven more captured slaves marched to the dais, climbed to the altar, and were consumed. Feeling faint, Karas wondered if the sacrifices were ever going to end. He vomited in his throat and harshly swallowed the bile down again. As the thirteenth captive was being dissolved, a sound like stone being slammed by a sledge rent the air. Instantly, the priests fell silent. Heads turned. Karas peered down his line and saw that a Y-shaped crack had opened in the altar stone, and the altar had split into three pieces. Judging by the reactions of the priests, it was an auspicious omen. They seemed tense, anticipatory. Karas didn't like the thought of that. A greenish sludge oozed out of the cracks and puddled on the upper level of the dais. It dribbled onto the lower level, then onto the floor. Karas watched it, his every muscle tense. When it reached his boot, he shifted his foot slightly. Its stench made his stomach lurch. But he couldn't very well flee, not with the others watching. He stood his ground, sweating, as the sticky green ooze flowed past his boots. He prayed it wouldn't dissolve the leather, burn through to his feet and reveal him as a spy. It didn't. No more victims staggered through the curtain. The sacrifice seemed to be at an end. Yet the priests continued to sway and chant Ganador's name. Karas glanced at the curtain, wondering if he could slip away without anyone noticing. He decided not to risk it. Meanwhile, the green stuff kept oozing from the altar like blood from a wound. It was obviously a manifestation of Ganador... But what did it mean? A moment later, one of the novices burst into the chamber. He threw himself onto the floor and wormed his way to the altar through the sludge, fouling his robes. 
Masters! He cried, his voice shrill with excitement. The lake is in turmoil. It's turned a bright purple. A spawning has begun. The black blob on the altar flowed upward, assumed the shape of a drow, and morphed back into Shedron. The eater's eyes grew wild with anticipation. It is come, he cried. The great devouring is at hand. They have come, the other priest chanted. His servants have come. As one, they turned and rushed from the room. As the other priests jostled each other in an apparent frenzy to be devoured by whatever was rising out of the lake, Karas hung back. He felt dizzy with fear. Lurthagol was spawning? Why now? Had Ganador sensed an enemy among his fanatics? Karas glanced nervously at the green ooze that fouled his boots, wondering if it was about to consume him. Soon, Karas and the prostrated novice were the only ones left in the shrine. Go! Karas shouted, his voice tight with strain. Make your preparations! The novice heaved himself to his feet and ran from the room. Karas wiped nervous sweat from his brow. Every instinct screamed at him to flee Lurth Drear and never look back. There was an easy exit close at hand. The columns ringing the altar, with their teleportation runes. He reached into his pocket and found the lump of amber that had, at its heart, a crescent-shaped spark of moonlight. Touching the amber to any of the runes would alter its destination, linking it with one of the three columns in the promenade that had, centuries ago, been ensorcelled by Gondor's cultists. He struggled to make his decision. Should he abandon everything he and Valdar had worked so hard to set in place these past few ten days? Or stay here and try to brazen it out? He had, until now, been able to fool the Ganadorian priesthood, even in the heart of the Ancient One's shrine, even during a sacrifice. But during a spawning? The oozes and slimes boiling up out of the lake were mindless creatures that couldn't tell the difference between friend and foe. But that was of little comfort. It only meant that his disguise wouldn't save him, if one of them decided to consume him. Kara swore. Until a few moments ago, it had all been going so well. All he'd needed to do was continue the facade and wait for Kyole's signal. That would be his cue to reveal his discovery. A portal that had, by the grace of Ganador, opened between one of the columns in their shrine and the promenade. In a carefully choreographed dance, each of the other spies would do the same. One by one, at precisely timed intervals, they would usher their fanatic straight into the trap the high priestess had prepared. Kaole, meanwhile would ensure the protectors and other faithful kept well back, out of sight, but ready to deal with the fanatics, should they stray from the designated path. Kyole had explained that the masked lady herself had approved this plan. Valdar, when first told of it, had seen the masked lord's hand in it at once. Inviting Eilistre's most resolute enemies into the heart of the promenade, he told Karas, was something the goddess would never contemplate. Ilistre was a goddess who fought with song and sword, not shadows and subterfuge. This plan was Veron's doing. Karas had been convinced. He'd persuaded the high priestess to let him select the night shadows who would carry out Ilistre's divine will, and ensured that Valdar was among them. When Kyole's call came, the hand-picked few would lead their Gonadorians into the promenade, not in small, easily contained groups, but all at once, away from the trap. The temple would be overwhelmed, and the priestesses swept aside, while the night shadows sat out the battle in safety, downriver in Skullport. Later, when it was all over, 
they would reassume their disguises and steer the fanatics into the trap Kaiole had prepared, cleansing the temple a second time. Once the promenade was theirs, converts would be drawn from across Faroon to a reinvigorated faith, and those of Ilustre's priestesses who managed to survive would reap the bitter fruit of their misplaced trust. The females would be the ones given a choice this time around, to don Veron's mask and worship in silence and shadow, or to die by Veron's sword. That had been the plan within a plan, and it had been a good one, needing only subterfuge and determination to see it through, until oozes and slimes had come boiling up out of the lake. Surely Veron didn't intend to fill the promenade with such filth, it would take an army to scour the temple clean after that. Masked, Lord, Kara silently prayed, the honorific feeling out of place after nearly four years of praying to the masked lady. Your servant seeks counsel. Is it your will we continue? No answer came. Kara stood sweating. The future of his faith hung upon what happened next upon what he decided next. As he hesitated near the doorway, listening to the shouts of excitement echoing through the keep, a voice sang into his mind. Kyole's voice, clear as a tolling bell, the high priestess called to her spies. It is time to begin the dance. Are you ready? The timing of the message couldn't be mere coincidence. The masked lord had to know what was happening down here in Lurth Drear. He obviously had confidence in Kara's, confidence enough to allow Kyole to set everything in motion, spawning or no. Kara squared his shoulders. The masked lord was depending upon him. I stand ready, Lady Kyole. He thought back. Expect the first group in moments. Begin then, and may Ilustre guide your steps. Her voice faded from his mind. Kara's pulled the lump of amber from his pocket and walked to the nearest column, his feet slipping in the green sludge coating the floor. He had to force his body to move in that direction. The closer he got to the altar, the more difficult it became. He could feel the Ancient One's presence, terrible and grim, evil beyond words. Forcing himself against it bent him almost double. He lifted the amber to the column and waited, ready. He heard shouts drawing nearer, Shedrin's voice urging the others back to the altar room. Overlaying them was a sound that sent shivers down his spine, the sound of oozes sliding over stone. Kara's pressed the amber to the column. A hole opened. Quickly, brethren, he cried. Come and see. One of the columns has opened. It will lead us to the pit of Ganador. Kyle strode through the cavern of song, past the faithful who gave voice to Ilustre's eternal hymn. Those in her way took a quick step back as she passed, giving her room to pass by. One faltered in her hymn. Kyle strode on, not bothering to admonish her. Kyle fumed. How had this happened? She'd been so careful, yet somehow Cavatina had figured out that a demon was inside the crescent blade. Not only that, but which one? She should have expected that from the Dark Song night. She'd been foolish to think she could keep Wend and I hidden, especially from the one who had killed him. She wished she could tell her priestesses that her strange behavior was just a charade. But she couldn't. Not without also telling Wend and I, since he could see and hear everything within range of the Crescent Blade, including her otherwise silent mental communications. Fortunately, by Mistra's grace, he wasn't privy to her thoughts. Kyule, Wend and I bellowed. He'd learned early on that calling her name forced her to pay attention to him. The Dark Song Knight knows. 
You should have slain her. I make the decisions, demon, not you. Poor decisions. She'll tell the others, if she hasn't already. No point in killing her, then, is there? They'll banish me. Destroy the crescent blade. Kyole almost wished someone would banish Wendanai. The cut on her wrist burned. The crescent blade felt heavy in her hand. She longed to have someone relieve her of this burden. Yet, she had to see this dance through to the end. The fate of hundreds of thousands of souls hung in the balance. You might as well have killed those two priestesses, the demon continued. Sealed inside the shrine, they'll die of thirst. A slow, lingering death, rather than a quick one. He paused and she could imagine his sly grin. How very Darrow of you, something your ancestors would have appreciated. Kyle made no comment. The two priestesses wouldn't starve. Eilistre would answer their prayers for sustenance. What mattered was to contain the problem before it spread. Heraldin had been easy enough to silence, but Rila would be more difficult. The battle mistress either knew about Wendanai or suspected, judging by the way she'd been acting. It was unlikely she'd told anyone yet. She would have realized this would start a panic. More likely she'd been preparing a banishment spell of her own. If she succeeded, it would ruin everything. Where was Rila? Kyle had to find her. She realized that she should have kept the battle mistress near her instead of sending her away. She should have trusted her instincts. Are you sure you didn't already bear my taint? Wend and I asked mockingly, continuing their previous conversation. You certainly think like an illy theory. Watch your tongue, demon, or I'll banish you myself. And destroy the weapon that will kill Wolf? Without my essence sustaining it, the crescent blade will crumble to dust. Be silent. She grasped her sheath and tried to shove the crescent blade into it, but felt the familiar resistance, like two lodestones pushing each other apart. She struggled against it, but the sword proved stronger. It sprang out of the sheath. Abyss, take me! Kyle swore, an oath she hadn't used since her childhood. The demon chuckled. Perhaps it will. Kyle stalked on through the cavern. She could have sheathed the sword if she'd tried harder, but she needed Wendanai to think he was in control, and that she feared the weapon would fall apart, were he not within it. That wouldn't happen, of course. Alistair's blessings would sustain it, just as they always had. Her statue was just ahead, tucked into an alcove in the Cavern of Song. Carved from black marble, it showed a youthful Kyole with sing sword held high, exulting in the defeat of Ganador's avatar. The statue looked heavy and immovable, a false impression. In fact, it concealed the winding staircase that led down to the sealed pit. Kyole strode up to the halfling protector who guarded it and stared down at her. Is battle mistress Rila below? Brindel shook her head. Has she passed this way recently? No, lady, not since I took up station here. Where is she? Silver fire crackled through Kyole's hair and her irritation flared. Brindel took a step back. Lady Kyle, what's wrong? Is the promenade under attack? What are you talking about? Kyle spat. She'd never realized until just this moment how ridiculous the halfling looked, with her ink-stained face and mop of copper-colored hair. Brindel pointed a pudgy finger at the crescent blade. There's blood on your sword, Lady Kyle. There is? Kyle lifted the weapon. 
A thin line of red trickled down the blade. The cut on her wrist must have been bleeding. The bracer that served as sheath for her silver dagger must have rubbed it open again. It's nothing, just a scratch. She glared down at Brindell. Hold your post. Contact me immediately if you see Rila. Brindell gulped. Yes, lady. Kyle strode away. She realized she'd been sharp with Brindell, but it was all part of the act, and it was drawing Wendanai in. She could feel it. In recent months, she'd stepped up the tempo. Sometimes she forgot, until it was almost too late, to drink the holy water that held Wendanai at bay. This gave the Baylor the illusion he was gradually wearing down her defenses, one cloven hoofed step at a time. Two steps forward, one back. One step forward, two back. All part of the dance that would lead him exactly where she wanted him. A dangerous gamble. One that might cost her the promenade. But a necessary one, if the Darrow were to be led back into the light. The crescent blade would be the key. Ironically, Wend and I had given her the idea. When he'd derided her crusade as futile, for each drow redeemed and brought up into Eilistre's light, he'd gloated, a dozen were born with his taint. For every step Kyle led the drow forward, Wend and I yanked them twelve steps back. The Baylor's taint ran constant and deep in the drow, in every one with even a drop of illy theory blood in their veins. The only way they could be led out of this dark pall was through redemption, and redemption was something that took courage and strength. The very taint they needed to struggle against and overcome was what seduced most drow into choosing a less morally challenging, more rewarding path. They wound up, like flies, caught in Lolf's vast web. Even if they somehow managed to escape or avoid this, more often than not, it was only through seeking out alliances with other, even more loathsome deities like Ganador. Kyole had experienced this taint herself. After her failure to attune the crescent blade and drive the evil from it, the cut on her wrist had allowed the demon to slowly worm its way into her. She had been on the verge of purging his taint, a simple matter of releasing Mistra's silver fire within her body, rather than without. When she'd realized something. If she could somehow draw all of Wendunai's taint into herself, she would, in the process, remove it from every drow on Toral. Then she could burn herself clean in one blinding flash of silver fire. She could set the drow free to choose a better path to be led into Eilistre's dance. Kyle herself would likely be consumed in the process, her very soul reduced to ash by the incineration of so much evil, so much guilt, so much hatred. But the crescent blade would remain. Someone else, Cavatina most likely, would carry on Eilistre's work. Be named High Priestess in Kyle's stead, take up the crescent blade, and kill Loth. Kyole sighed. She had the lancet she needed for the blooding that was to come. The crescent blade. She even knew the one place on all of Toral where it could be done. Alistre had revealed its location to her. But she wasn't quite ready yet to set her plan in motion. There always seemed to be something else that needed doing first. Carland, for example, was on the verge of attempting his casting and would soon require her assistance. And within the promenade itself, there were a dozen other things to tend to. Like finding Rila and silencing her. Perhaps, Kyole decided, she could flush the battle mistress out. An attack by Ganador's cultists should do just that. She sang the word that would make her symbol visible. A second song dispelled the locks she'd placed on the doors of the chamber that held the glyph-inscribed portal. Then she sent out a silent message to her spies. 
It is time to begin the dance. Are you ready? Their answers came like a spatter of rain, the words overlapping each other. Some of the night shadows sounded eager, others tense. Two didn't answer at all. Perhaps they were dead. She prayed their souls had found their way to the masked lady's domain. Kara's assured her he would be able to bring his group through. Kyle smiled. That should bring Rila running. Begin then, she replied, and may Alistre guide your steps. That done, Kyle turned down the corridor that would take her to the river, the corridor that wound past the Moonspring portal. The protector guarding the magical pool saluted as she passed. Have you seen Rila? Kyle asked. No, lady. She's lying. Kyle whirled. Liar, she used the portal, didn't she? The protector's face paled to gray. Her mouth opened, but no words came out. Kyle felt the blood drain from her own face. She hadn't meant to say that aloud. My apologies, priestess. I was answering a sending from someone else. It wasn't much of an excuse, but it seemed to satisfy the protector, who nodded and stiffly resumed her post. Kyle kneeled and sang a scrying, passing her hand over the pool. She smiled as it revealed Rila. Kyle's smile vanished abruptly as she recognized the chamber Rila was standing in. The battle mistress hadn't used the moon spring portal after all. She was still within the promenade, in the last place Kyle had expected to find her. The chamber that contained the trap for Ganador's cultists. Even as Kyle watched, the battle mistress dispelled the symbol Horalden had inscribed. Now she began a prayer one that would seal the portal Kyle had so painstakingly created. No! Kyle cried. She couldn't let that happen. Not now, with the first wave of Ganador's minions about to come through. She sang a hymn that instantly conveyed her to the chamber along a beam of moonlight. Her boots slipped as she landed. The floor was ankle deep in water. Real world! Her prayer interrupted. Kyle, is it you? She sent. It would have been a clever ploy had Wend and I not been able to listen in on Kyle's private conversations. She thinks I'm controlling you. You're not. Not yet. Be silent. Kyle shook her head. Rila. She needed to concentrate on the battle mistress. Of course it's me. What are you doing? Rila hadn't tried to banish Wend and I yet. Perhaps she didn't know. Making sure everything's sealed up tight as you ordered, there's a portal in this room that shouldn't be here. She began her prayer anew. Stop that! Kyle cried. She sang a note into the shout that fused Rila's fingers together, preventing her from completing the gesture that would seal the portal. I created that portal. It leads to a trap, one that's about to be sprung. Go and find Haraldin. I need him to recast his enchantment now. Rila turned. She was terrified. Kyle could smell the other female's fear and her voice quavered. Her Alden's dead. She's lying, trying to confuse you. What? Kyle rubbed her wrist. N no, he's not. I just spoke to him. In fact, she'd just placed a geas on him, one that would compel him not to communicate with anyone, not by speech, nor spell, nor written word until she gave him leave. She'd sealed the geas by drawing a line across his throat. The instant he tried to speak, he'd be racked by a fit of violent coughing. Coughing blood. 
Kyle blinked, startled. Where had that thought come from? You cut his throat, Rila said, decapitated him. She glanced pointedly at the crescent blade. Kyle's eyes were drawn to the sword, to the blood on it. She's trying to trick you. That's your blood. Your cut is leaking again. Kyle lifted her arm. Rila tensed, her fused fingers gripping her holy symbol. Kyle yanked her bracer up. She stared at the cut on her wrist. No, not a cut. A scar. Old and gray. It wasn't her blood on the blade. You had to do it. You had no choice. He would have ruined everything. He would have ruined everything, Kyle whispered. Her head was pounding. She felt a slight pressure against her calves and realized the water in the room was rising. Was the river overflowing? She glanced over her shoulder. No, the door behind her was shut. The water inside the chamber was expanding, and swiftly. As it topped her boots and spilled inside them, she felt sensation return to her feet. She hadn't realized until this moment that they'd been numb, nearly dead. They'd felt heavy, lumpish, hard. The water rose to Kyle's knees. Her legs tingled. Rila moved closer, her feet swishing in the water. The battle mistress's eyes locked on Kyle's. Fight it, she whispered. Pray, drive Wend and I out. She sang out a word that filled the air with moonlight and lunged forward, slamming into Kyle, who toppled backward into the water. She's trying to drown you, Wend and I howled. Kyle nearly laughed at such an obvious lie. The water tasted pure and sweet on her lips. Rila's song, peeling out from above, landed like sparkling drops of rain upon the water's surface. Kyle felt the battle mistress's hands around her wrist and realized Rila was trying to force the crescent blade down into the water, into the healing holy water. No! When Denai shouted, That will destroy it! You'll never kill Wolf! His hand, Kyle's hand, punched up. The sword hilt slammed into Rila's nose, knocking her backward and ripping her hands away from Kyle's wrist. Kyle felt her body leap up and shout a word that instantly burned the water from her skin. A familiar, heavy deadness returned and her thoughts slowed. It felt as if each were forcing its way through thick, stinking mud. From the waist down, however, her body was still within the holy water, and still her own. She threw herself to her knees, and suddenly the water was level with her mouth. She gulped it down, and felt its holiness force the demon out of her, back into the crescent blade. Drink your fill, Wend and I gloated from the sword, which she held just above the surface. I've built up a resistance to it. I'll be back inside you the moment you surface. Another lie? Kyle suspected so, but she couldn't be certain of anything. Not anymore. How long had the demon been warping her perceptions? What other crimes against her faith had he used her to commit? She ducked lower, submerging her head, but holding the crescent blade above the surface. Inside the holy water, she was safe. She tried to decide what to do. One swift tug and the crescent blade would be underwater with her. That would banish Wend and I, but it would also banish her one chance to eradicate his taint from the drow. Yet she could see that this idea had been a seed planted by Wendnai. The irony was that it was possible. 
There was indeed a prayer that Kyle could use to draw all of Wendenai's taint inside her. And once his taint was within her, Mistress Silverfire would indeed destroy it. But the flaw in this plan, the flaw Wendenai had blinded her to until now, was that with so much of his taint inside her, Kyle would lose control. Permanently. The demon would rule her body, as completely as Lolf ruled the demon web pits. Any silver fire she didn't manage to summon would be twisted to an evil purpose. Kyle stared at her battle mistress through the water. Rila floated nearby, face down, blood drooling from her broken nose. No longer breathing. Later, once she'd decided what to do next, Kyle would revive her. For the moment, she was just thankful Wendenai hadn't been able to swing the crescent blade. If it had severed Rila's neck, her soul would have been destroyed. Just as Heraldin's had been. Kyle prayed that the crescent blade hadn't completely severed the druid's neck that his soul had survived to join Rillafane under the Great Oak. Kyle, Wendenai bellowed. I know you can hear me. What will you do now? Banish me and abandon any hope of saving your race? What indeed? Mistra silver fire flickered in and out of Kyle's nostrils. Though her head was submerged in water, her long tresses spreading like seaweed across the surface above, she felt no need to breathe. She had all the time in the world to consider the question, unless, of course, someone opened one of the doors to this chamber, letting the holy water spill out. Her spies, for example, the first group of Ganador's cultists, would be arriving in the promenade any moment and heading this way. She flicked a hand, resetting the locks. She briefly considered telling the Night Shadows to abandon the plan, destroy their ambers, and flee Ganador's temples. Then decided against it. Too much effort had been spent in putting them in place. She considered her options. Had she inscribed an insanity symbol on the ruined temple, or was this another of Wendanai's tricks? She decided that it really didn't matter. If a symbol was in place, and the fanatics could be coerced into entering the portal, they would be turned into raving madmen who wouldn't even remember what a temple to their god looked like, let alone what to do with it. And if the symbol didn't exist, the fanatics would gain no benefit from a visit to the bottom of the pit. If they somehow found their way back from the ethereal plane, they wouldn't have learned anything new about the promenade. The planar breach had existed for centuries, sputtering on like a guttering candle, ever since Ganador had been driven through it. Even if the worst happened, if the fanatics, despite being ethereal, found a way to open the breach enough for an avatar to come through, it wouldn't matter. The seals at the top of the pit would ensure that the Ancient One's avatar didn't escape. As she sat, thinking, the water surrounding her began to vibrate. The result of an alarm, close by. Its clamor shrill enough to pass through stone. The timing was too close to be a coincidence. Kara's must have brought his group through. Confirmation came as three different priestesses shouted Kyle's name at once, urgently reporting they'd spotted fanatics approaching the promenade from the far side of the bridge, that they were going to engage them until reinforcements arrived. Kyle gave a mental command in reply, ordering them to allow the fanatics to cross the bridge and not to engage them, but instead to set up defensive positions at least fifty paces back from the western side of the bridge. She wondered if they would heed her. How many of her priestesses, besides Cavatina, Liliana, and Rila, now knew about Wendanai, and would be suspicious of her commands? Karas, she sent, where are you? 
far side of the bridge. There's bad news. The portal is still in place, but the enchantment glyph has been dispelled. You're going to have to talk your fanatics into entering the trap, but not quite yet. The doors of the room are still sealed. I need a few moments more before I can unlock them. You'll have to stall once you're across the bridge. Can you manage that? I'll try. Kyle nodded. It was all she could ask of anyone. She sent a mental command to the rest of her spies. Night shadows, the plan is postponed. Remain in position and do not bring the cultists through until I contact you. She broke contact, not bothering to wait for their acknowledgments. It was time to do something she should have done long ago. Destroy the crescent blade. She started to draw the sword under the water, ignoring Wendenai's screams of protest, his wild promises, his shouts that he wouldn't die, that he'd have his vengeance, that even if he couldn't personally revenge himself, then Lolf certainly would since her powers were equal to. Kyle abruptly halted. The blade only halfway submerged. There was a way to purge Wendenai's taint from the drow, she realized. She didn't have to be the one who called down silver fire. It could be directed into her body from without. Any of her sisters could provide the lethal blast that would incinerate the demon's taint. Assuming, of course, one of them could be persuaded to do it. Leral, she decided. She'd already guessed something was wrong with the crescent blade and would take less convincing. Kyole steeled herself. Was she really ready to bid farewell to the promenade? Her protectors, her priestesses, everything she had worked for centuries to build. She had to. It would be the salvation of the drow, all of the drow. The dawn of a glorious new day. Out of the darkness and into the light. Kyle, however, wouldn't survive to see it. Tears blended with the water. I Stray, she silently sang. Is this your will? The answer came not in words, but in a sign. A beam of braided moonlight and shadow lanced down into the water, directly in front of Kyle. She had only to touch it to be transported to the place she had just thought of. The place where the deed would be done. Kyle nodded. Very well, then. My Renee, she sang. Use of the true name would ensure that Wend and I wouldn't know whom she was contacting. It would also ensure a prompt reply. Her sister answered at once. Wasting no time, Kyle told Laryl where to meet her and what needed to be done. In carefully couched language that used references only Laryl would understand. All the while, she could feel Wend and I's seething anger as the sword vibrated in her hand. Leral agreed to do as she asked, but with great reluctance. Do you truly wish this, sister? Ilustre wishes it, Kyle replied. For the sake of the drow, it must be done. I will meet you there. Leral's voice faded from her mind. Now there was one last thing that needed to be done. Kyle touched the mind of her dark song night. Kavatina, she sent. Your suspicions were correct. Wend and I corrupted me. I am removing myself from the promenade. I may not return. If I do not, you are to lead the ritual that will choose the next high priestess. You must also assist Carland with the casting he is preparing. May Alistair bless you and guide your steps. Take up her sword and sing. That said, Kyle unlocked the doors to the room with a flick of her hand. Then she reached out of the water to grasp the moonbeam and teleported away. 
Chapter Seven. Talar watched from above as Guldor strode into his private sanctum and closed the door behind him. The wizard pulled a pinch of glittering dust from a pocket and flicked it at the door while muttering a spell. He tested the handle and nodded. Talar perched like a spider on a ceiling beam above, tensed as he began a second incantation. This one directed at the center of the room. She held her dagger by its point. If the wizard lifted his head even slightly, she'd embed it between his eyes. Guldor's second spell, however, had no visible effect, nor did he glance in Tlar's direction. He unfastened his cloak and flung it to the side. The garment halted in mid-air and was neatly folded by an invisible conjured servitor. Guldor, meanwhile, flopped face down into a divan and gestured at his boots. They tugged off, revealing narrow feet. Dimples appeared in the grayish soles as the servitor massaged them. Guldor, however, remained stiff and unrelaxed. It looked as though the tension of the recent conclave meeting had not yet dissipated. As the invisible servitor continued to massage the wizard, Tlar spotted movement within a full-length mirror that was mounted in an ornate gold frame on the wall. The reflection of the room wavered and was replaced. It was as if a door had opened onto another chamber. A figure stepped into view within the mirror, that of Stria Vacheris, Zavir, High Priestess of Loth. Imperious in her spider silk robes and silver web crown, the priestess stared into the wizard's private sanctum. Galdor glanced up at the mirror. He didn't look pleased to see his aunt. The high priestess scowled out of the mirror. I heard what happened today. Bad news travels quickly. How could you have overlooked the fact that his sister was a Bakeshal singer? I thought you were more thorough than that. You were the one who wanted to move quickly. Guldor snapped back. I was the one who advised patience. Patience? The high priestess spat. Don't you lecture me on patience. We've been waiting years to secure a second position on the conclave, only to miss our chance. If we'd moved even a cycle sooner, this newly minted master wouldn't have been there. You were the one who chose this cycle, not me. What's more, you promised a distraction that would prevent him from appearing before the conclave. A promise you failed to keep. My decisions were based on information you provided. You said the other masters would be looking for a way to counter Seldzar's latest alliances. That was your recommendation, boy. You'd do well to remember, priestess, that this boy is one of those who rule this city, Guldor retorted, while you merely sit in the shadows and spin. Pa! The priestess tossed her head causing the tiny obsidian spiders hanging from her crown to tinkle. Your lack of diligence has made our position even worse than it was. This new master is one of Eilistrae's. Perhaps. Galdor made a wry face. Or perhaps not. My accusation was a spear thrust in the dark. We'll have to delve deeper before we can be certain. Perhaps it's time someone a little more certain headed up your college. Guldor's head jerked up. Is that a threat? Flar listened as the pair continued to argue. The politics of the city mattered little to her. She merely carried out the Lady Pentanen's commands. When Stria Valsheris Zavir had invited the Temple of the Black Mother to invest a shrine in Shamath, Talar had expected the Lady Pentanent to reject the offer out of hand. The priestesses of Shamath were weak. They'd been responsible for one of Loth's greatest defeats. The Lady Pentanent, however, had decided to accept. 
till I remembered her words. Where better to spin my web than in the void where Lothes was torn asunder? And so Tlar had been sent north. Stria Valcheris Zavir had promised great things, describing Shamath as an egg sac seething with discontent and ready to burst. She had promised to deliver the entire city into the Lady Pendanin's hands. She'd lied. Tlar could see that. The conclave held this city in an adamantine grip. Instead of fighting the masters, the high priestess hoped to join them. Weakness, the very thing the Lady Pentinent most despised. Stria Valcheris Zavir would have to be eliminated, sooner rather than later. The image in the mirror faded. Galdor at last relaxed. When he closed his eyes, Tlar hummed a melody that shifted her appearance to match what she'd just seen in the mirror, then sprang off the beam. She drew upon her drowsers an instant before she landed, halting her downward momentum and landed soundlessly on the floor behind the wizard. She jabbed stiffened fingers into pressure points on Guldor's back, sending him into a spasm. Guldor gasped in pain. His eyes sprang open, and he saw Tlar's reflection in the mirror. How? Before he could complete the question, she grabbed his hair, yanked his head back, and sliced his throat. Blood soaked the cushions of the divan and ran in streams onto the floor. Tlar caught some of the warm liquid in a cupped hand and raised it to her lips. Strength, she whispered. Then she drank. Behind her, the invisible servitor mindlessly continued the task it had been set, massaging its dead master's feet. Tlar pointed her bloody dagger at the mirror. You're next, she silently vowed. But before she dealt with the high priestess, there was something Tlar wanted to know. Like an itch, her curiosity had to be scratched. She sang the hymn the Lady Pentinent had taught her. She exhaled and felt her body fold inward on itself and become gaseous. With a thought, she sent herself wafting toward the door Guldor had oh so carefully sealed with his magic. She slipped through the crack underneath it and was gone. Carlin sat on a low round pillow, his legs crossed deep in reverie. He felt the heat from the dark fire hearth on his skin, smelled the remnants of his rothe and spore ball stew, and could still taste the last sip of wine he'd taken before settling into his trance. His eyes were open, but his mind was far away. His thoughts wandered back several decades, to his days as a student in Chednasad's conservatory. He thought of Ilmira, one of the females who had made the rare decision to become a mage rather than a priestess. She'd been a fine-looking female, one he'd fantasized about more than once during their time together as novices. He'd imagined himself victoriously battling Chednasad's enemies beside her, then surrendering to a struggle of a very different sort. During their days at the conservatory, one of the first things the novices had been taught was a cantrip that revealed magical auras. Carland had mastered it readily enough. The gesture was a simple flicking of the fingers that mimicked an eye opening, and the trigger was a single word, Fairdall. Yet, Elmira had miscast the spell when a magical item was brought out for her to examine and had failed to identify the item correctly. She'd been strapped as a result, hard enough to fracture a finger. Later that cycle, when her turn came to list the colors of the auras around the items laid out on the table, she'd faltered a second time. Carland had tried to help her by signing the answers. Instead of taking his help, she'd pointed out what he was doing to their instructor, even though this meant admitting her own failure. She'd watched, smiling, as he'd been lashed, 
then submitted to a lashing herself. Later, after Carland had been sent to his room to meditate on the folly and futility of trying to aid another, she'd slipped into his chamber and taken him. Even now, decades later, he vividly remembered her fingers digging painfully into the hot red welts that crisscrossed his shoulders as she mounted him. It had been one of the sweetest experiences of his young life. His forehead warmed, the Kira absorbing the memory. An image formed in his mind, one of the ancestors who'd worn the Lorestone millennia ago. She had white hair, yet her skin was a faded brown rather than black. You tried to help Amira out of compassion. You followed Eilistray's dance even then. Carland laughed out loud. Hardly. I did it because I wanted her to take me. And it worked. Just not the way I'd expected. He lingered in the memory. He wondered if Elmira had survived the fall of the city. Probably not. The Kira cooled slightly, a sign of his ancestor's displeasure. Carland gave a mental shrug. They'd asked him to include memories he thought were instructive. The one he'd just placed in the lore stone was doubly so. It taught the magic detection cantrip, and at the same time served as a reminder that all reward came at a price. He heard a crackling sound, the dark fire flames flickering. A breeze down the chimney must have disturbed them. He was so deep in reverie that he paid the noise no heed at first. He was reliving a night in the world above. When he'd used a spell to spy on Ilustre's priestesses, as they danced with swords in hand around the goddess's sacred stone in the misty forest. It had been windy that night, with snow blowing through the trees. Yet the priestesses had danced naked. He smiled, savoring the memory. He'd watched, half hoping they'd catch him in his transgression. It had been a long time since a female had taken him. The dark fire settled down again as the breeze ended. The flames resumed their steady flickering, not that his body needed warming any more. Remembering the priestess's dance was... All at once, he remembered he was in Shamath. No breezes blew here except magical ones. Luth. Something stung the back of his neck. It felt like needles pressing into his skin at once. Whatever had just pricked him fell to the floor with a thud. As his flesh deadened, he realized whatever had just struck him had been poisoned. His jaw locked. His neck stiffened. He couldn't complete his abjuration. Nor could he turn his head to see his assailant. Then his magical earring drew the venom up his neck, into his left ear and into itself. All that remained was a bitter taste in his mouth, which told him what the poison was. Made from the exertions of a carrion crawler, it was designed to paralyze rather than kill. He sensed movement behind him. His assailant coming closer. Carlin feigned paralysis. He slowly shifted his left thumb to the fur-wrapped needle of glass that pierced his shirt cuff. As his thumb touched the spell component, he whispered a word under his breath. His finger bones tingled as lightning crackled to life inside his hand. A flick of his fingers would release it. His assailant stepped into view. He recognized her at once. Tlar Ms. Rinterl, the Bekeshel bard whose school Galdor had tried to nominate. She moved in utter silence, even when she squatted next to him. Her clothing didn't rustle. She held a dagger with a spider pommel. Ready for use, but not threatening him with it yet. She stared pointedly at his groin. Thinking of me, were you? She laughed. Carlin felt thankful he was already aroused. 
Tlar was disturbingly close, and the menace she exuded was a powerful aphrodisiac. Yet he wasn't foolish enough to give in to it completely. He held the lightning within his hand, trusting to surprise to give him the edge when the time came to cast his spell. For the moment, he wanted to know what she was up to. Had she come to steal something? He kept utterly still, not even moving his eyes. Soon, however, he'd need to give in to the urge to blink. You play a dangerous game, grandson, whispered his ancestors from inside the Kira. Tlar hummed softly. Colin felt magic brush his mind, as light as a cobweb. Her spell proved no more durable. It tore to pieces the instant it met the Kira. She didn't seem to realize this, however. Perhaps, under the impression her spell had succeeded, she leaned in close and asked a question that was clearly designed to stir up his thoughts. It wasn't the one he'd expected. Why was your sister killed? She whispered, her breath hot against his ear. What did she do to anger the Lady Pentinent? His concentration slipped. A spark crackled from his fingertips. Talar leaped away from him. So quickly, Carlin didn't even see her move. One moment she was squatting next to him. The next, she stood halfway across the room, her dagger poised. Her arm whipped forward, and the dagger flashed through the air. Carlin twisted aside and hurled a lightning bolt at her. She dodged faster than his eye could follow. The lightning struck the shelf behind her, exploding it apart and setting several scrolls on fire. Carlin frantically searched for his assailant and felt a sharp pain in his side as he moved. He touched his shirt, and his hand came away bloody. Unlike her, he hadn't dodged quickly enough. He saw a flash of motion out of the corner of his eye. Her kick. Her foot slammed into his face. Spitting blood, he went down. He landed on his back, bent across his cushion like a sacrifice on an altar stone. She hurled herself on top of him, straddling his stomach, hooking her legs around his and twining her fingers in his so he couldn't gesture. Her legs squeezed. He gasped as the wound on his side pulled open and tried to buck her off, but she was too strong. Swift as a striking spider, she transferred both of his hands to one of hers. Her free hand scooped up her dagger, and she jammed the hilt into his mouth like a bit. He tasted metal and sweat-impregnated leather, and the legs of the spider-shaped pommel dug sharply into his cheek. She forced his head back, pushing so hard he thought his neck would snap. Involuntary tears sprung to his eyes. He tried not to gag. I could kill you, she told him, quicker than a blink. The dagger jerked for emphasis. He gurgled from the pain, tasting the blood that slid down his throat from his split lips. But first, I offer you the opportunity to do penance. The arousal he'd felt a moment ago was gone. Fear had replaced it, along with confusion. He tried to talk, but all that came out was, Wah, wah. Your eyeless trace, she hissed. Forswear her and live. Embrace the Lady Pentinent. Embrace Loth. Carlin felt sweat break out on his forehead. Not so long ago, it would have been easy to renounce eyeless tray. That was no longer possible. His ancestors whispered fiercely at him from within the lore stone. Fight her, they urged. Die proudly with Eilistray's song on your lips. Carlin found himself swept up in their strident chorus, unable to speak the words Plar had ordered him to. Nor did he want to, he suddenly realized. He took comfort in the fact that it was Eilistray rather than Loth who would claim his soul after death. He finally understood what Liliana had tried to explain to him. 
back when they'd first met, that to have tried, even if failure was the result, was more worthy than to surrender and survive. He remembered her words still. To Eilestray, struggle is honored equally with success. Of course, to pretend to surrender wouldn't hurt. Will you do penance? Flar asked. She stared at him intently, her lithe body silhouetted by the light of the burning scroll shelf. Carland managed the slightest of nods. She removed her dagger from his mouth and reversed it. The point pricked his neck.